The Thor, Gore the God Butcher, and Mighty Thor of the comic books tell a much different story than that of the movie. And while we have covered all of these stories in the past, I thought it might be easier if we lined them all up in proper order. So today you're going to get a dramatic retelling of Thor the God Butcher, the Mighty Thor storyline, and then the War of the Realms story, which basically will get you all the way caught up to the current Thor storyline, more or less. This is Comic Story. I take some of your favorite trade paperbacks and single issues and I break them down into digestible bites. I read them back to you dramatically, getting to pretend to be a voice actor for a couple of hours a day. And we do this on the regular over here at the channel, so if you like DC, Marvel, and all the other stuff in the world of comic books, make sure you subscribe, hit that like button, and join us. But don't do it yet. Go ahead and watch this video and judge then. So, what we're gonna do is give you the big bulk storylines that Thor was a part of leading up to the current storyline. So that is Thor God Butcher, Mighty Thor's entire storyline, and then War of the Realms. There are some stuff that happened in the middle of all of that, but for the most part, these are the core bits you need to know to go out and buy the current Thor storyline. So I hope you guys enjoy the ultimate Thor full story. Our story begins in 893, just off the coast of Iceland, where a young Thor enjoys the finer pleasures of his life. A frost giant has been terrorizing the people for weeks, and Thor saw to it that his axe Jornbjorn would hack off his head right there. For the next four days, Thor had eaten more goats than the frost giant, and drank enough mead to drown a dozen sailors, and he made love to more than half of the women in the village. Life was good for Thor Odinson, god of thunder, prince of Asgard. But on that fourth night, there was a scream. Everyone runs outside to see what it is. What was it? The young girl runs up stating that someone is in the water, a devil man, and one of the villagers pulls up a floating head from the water, tossing it to the ground, stating that he is not from their village. Thor looks at the dead man's eye and he says that he was a god. The villagers begin to panic and Thor tells them that whatever it was that killed this man, its skull will be no match for Asgardian steel. He picks up the head and the village elder asks Thor if he's ever seen anything like a butchered god before. Thor examines the head and he says that he's seen gods suffer and bleed. A mortal father subject their own sons to torments. But this, I have never seen anything like the horror in this god's eyes. The elder falls to her knees and she begins to chant and Thor asks, To what god are you praying? And she tells him that she is praying to all of them. And the current day on the planet of Indigar, a young alien girl prays for rain on their dry lands, for without it, they shall die. Suddenly there's a strike of thunder as a hammer falls, and with it rain washes over the ground. Thor grabs Mjolnir and he says that he is Thor, warrior of Asgard, avenger of Earth, and he swears on all that is holy, no one will die today. The young girl runs over telling him that she never thought he would actually come, and Thor tells her that he heard her prayer. What kind of god would he be if he did not answer? As for his aid, the aliens offered Thor their best cave slime ale, and he told them stories of his travels and triumphs. As the young girl sleeps, the elder tells Thor that they owe him their lives, and Thor says that what they owe is this girl and her prayer. Why is it that they do not pray to their own gods? And the elder says that that is because Indigar has no gods. However, as a child, his mother would tell him stories of gods from long ago who lived in a jeweled city high in the clouds. Shocked to hear this, Thor takes this guy's to find that jeweled city, and soon he does. He walks through the palace to find no one in sight and nothing disturbed. But there is one thing strange, a storage room with chains locking it tight. With one swing from Mjolnir, Thor breaks the chains, opening the door, and then he smells why no one has been in here. These gods are dead. Hogscar the Harsh, Crawl Skin the Cruel, Lady Vile the Goddess of Atrocities, and the entire pantheon of fearsome immortals, all butchered like animals. While Thor looks around, outside those chains begin to melt and pull together, and Thor realizes what's going on, and he says, Oh hell. He turns back to see a giant black beast lunging at him, and the beast attacks wildly like an animal. No skill, no fury. This is not the killer, this is his guard dog, and a very strong one at that. Thor is knocked into a stone wall, and as he gets back up, he thinks that there is only one person who could have done this. Gore the God Butcher yet lives. And that can only mean one thing, more gods are sure to die. Many millennia from them, in the far-flung future, in the Great Hall of Asgard, King Thor sits upon his throne with no subjects to rule. He shouts for someone to bring him his arm, and then he remembers that he is so damn old, he keeps forgetting that there is no one left but him. He is Thor Odinson, king of a broken Asgard, last of all of the gods, and today he will try yet again to see Valhalla. With sword and hammer in hand, Thor leaps out into battle against the Black Beast, knowing whatever may happen, he will face it like a god. 
Back in the past, young Thor travels with the Vikings across the sea to see more of the gods who were slain and washed up on the shores. They sail for three days until they reach the banks of Neva River, and they find the Slavs. And Thor asks, where are the gods that they pray to? One shouts that their gods will be here soon enough, Norse swine. Piran the Storm Lord and Shirnabog the Black will come on their winged stallions. Soon everyone begins to hear the flapping of wings and when they look up they see Piran's steed bloodied and with no Piran. One of the Vikings says that it would appear the gods hadn't the nerve to face him and Thor takes the steed flying into the skies telling the Vikings to make sure that they save a cask of ale for him. He flies up and he begins to feel the droplets of blood raining down, god blood, from the skies. Seconds later, Chernabog the Black rides by, now with his head cut off dripping blood into the clouds. And behind him is Gore, the God Butcher, readying his black blade. Without even so much as a flash, the winged horse had its own head and legs cut right off, and Thor begins to plummet back to the earth. Gore shouts for him to feel the sense of helplessness. This is how it feels to be mortal. Next, you will learn how it feels to be butchered. As Thor falls, he grabs a hold of Chernabog's steed and he flies back yelling, My name is Thor of Asgard, warrior born, and the last of the gods that you will ever see. Gore asks, Asgardian, I've never killed one of you before, but fret not. Soon the entire pantheon will join you. The two fight in the skies, exchanging blow after blow, and Gore's weapons are unlike anything that Thor has ever seen. They form and they whip about, all striking perfectly, and in one last attempt at victory, Thor slashes into Gore, but he responds by shooting out and knocking Thor off of his horse. Thor tries to fight him off, and Gore takes his black blade, thrusting it into Thor's stomach, and he asks, What are you even the god of? Gore begins to laugh as he brings Thor closer, and Thor tells him quietly, The god of thunder. Suddenly there's a crack -hoom, and the lightning strikes Gore off and the two begin to fall towards Earth. Back in the current time, the present day, the normal middle-aged Thor stands above the defeated beast, thinking that if the strengths of these creatures are a part of Gore that he has grown considerably in the time since they last fought. Molnir then pulls Thor into the air and Thor shouts that they must make haste to the omnipotent city, the gods of all-knowing. For the longer that they tarry, the gods will soon suffer. Upon reaching the city, the Lord Librarian takes Thor to the Hall of the Lost, the room filled with books and scrolls on gods who have been inactive. Thor looks at the giant rows of tomes and asks, isn't anyone alarmed by how many of them that there are? And the Librarian tells him that gods come and go. Such is the way of things. With so many places to start, Thor picks one, the Oaken King and Sequania of the Garden Eternal. No one has seen them for 2,000 years, and when Thor arrives, he sees exactly why. These gods were nailed to their trees, and just like before, a black beast appears. World after world, planet after planet, all of them the same. The bodies of the gods butchered by a black beast keeping watch. As Thor gazes off the massive body of what was once Falagar the Behemoth, he swiftly kills the Black Beast. He then rips the head off and he screams to Gore to come and kill him. Come and kill Thor if you so dare. Back in the past, young Thor wakes seven days after his encounter with Gore. As he leans up, he asks, did I kill him? And a Viking tells him that they are unsure. They just found him lying in the snow. Thor gets up telling the man to bring him meat, mead, and then his axe. Hours later, after regaining some of his strength, Thor sets out into the wilderness to look for Gore, but instead finds another god. The god calls out that he is, or was, Hinkon, Siberian god of the hunt. The Black Butcher told him to relay a message, and that was to come to his cave along the lake. Just follow the screams. Thor holds out his axe, telling him that there is no honor in the way that the God Butcher fights. Now be at peace, Hinkon. The hunt has ended. In the current times, with our present day Thor along the shores of Lake Ladoga, Thor takes Iron Man with him to scan the area for the cave he once found so long ago. Tony tells him that he knows that he can call the Avengers, right? But Thor tells him, no. And Tony says, that's right, God business. That's okay, we got plenty of mortal problems to deal with right now anyway. So Thor looks at the cave that he was once in 1,000 years ago, hoping to never see again. There have been plenty of things that he has forgotten over the years. The face of the first maiden that he kissed, the first troll that he felled, or even the first dragon that he tamed. But this cave, this cave is something that he will remember to the end of time. This is where the God Butcher taught him fear. As he steps in, he calls to Queen Freya that she needs to have every Asgardian called back home. Their gates locked behind them. Anyone of immortal blood is under threat. Freya asks what happened, under threat by whom, and then there's a snap of a twig. Thor grips his hammer and he charges forward at the being fleeing. He grabs a hold of him and the creature shouts, don't hurt him, I am not Gore! And Thor demands to know why he is here. The creature tells him that he is hiding from him. After what happened, Gore would never set foot here. Everything that is happening now is all because of what happened here. It's all because of Thor, that the gods are dying right now. Thor stares at the creature asking, who are you? 
and he says that his name is Sadruk. He is the type of god that you don't meet every day. One who looked upon the face of Gore and lived. He's not sure why he was kept alive, why he was made to witness as his whole pantheon was slaughtered by the Black Berserker. Every day he begged to be killed, to stop it all, but Gore just cut off his eyelids and said that he had no choice but to watch. Gore also said that he would never come to this cave and that he was saving Thor for last. Thor asks where he can find the God Butcher and Shadrach tells him that there is no need to look, he will appear soon enough. But perhaps, Kronux. Thor then tells Shadrach to come with so together they may finally end this thing once and for all. And later at the omnipotent city, Thor and Shadrach head to the Halls of All-Knowing to find more information on Kronux when Thor finds the Librarian beaten. Shadrach begins to panic, stating that he knew he shouldn't have come. If only he could close his eyes! And back in the past, the young Thor wakes to find himself bound and chained, hanging in front of Gore. Gore tells him that he is now awake and he will tell him where to find Asgard, so that he can watch how he kills everyone there. Thor shouts that you can wrap me in as many chains as you want, but I will never say. Gore tells him, you know, I'm not exactly a novice in the ways of torture. I once tortured the god of torture. After an evening with him, he gave up where his children were hiding. Thor struggles to free himself and Gore tells him, I have so rarely taken my time anymore. Hopefully, you can prove to be of some excitement. Back in the current times, in the present day, Thor begins to fight back the Berserkers when the Librarian bashes one with the books. Thor shouts that these beasts are up to something, trying to hide something from Kronux. Who is the god called Kronux? And the Librarian tells him that Kronux isn't a god, you imbecile. It's a world, a hidden one at that, and only the book can tell you where to find it. It's over there burning. Thor reaches down and he opens the scroll to read its contents and soon it begins to burn to ash. And Thor tells him, It may have burned, but I read what I needed. I fly to Kronix, the palace of infinity. Meanwhile, on Kronix, the berserkers slaughter all of the gods there, draining their blood into a large pool. Gore looks at the last god and he asks, Is this enough? And the time god tells him, It will have to be. There's none left. Gore tells him, just keep in mind, if I don't return, the Berserkers will tear you apart. The god says that he can't promise that he wouldn't be killed once he gets to where he's going. You're going extremely far back, do you even know what's waiting there? And Gore says, I know more about gods and their history than you do, last god of Kronix. As Gore begins to step into the pool, the god says that there will always be peaceful beings, caretakers of time. And Gore tells him, there are two kinds of gods, those who do harm and those who do nothing at all. And I had yet to decide which is more worthy of my wrath. Soon enough though, you will all be dead. As Gore is sinking into the pool, the worlds begin to change as he teleports back 14 billion years ago into the void. He looks upon the Elder Gods, seeing how he made awkward creations, all minutes old and already begging for death. Life will still find a way to thrive, though. However, they will not be worshipping this god, at least, for he is Gore, son of the Nameless Father, and he still believes the dream of a godless age. Soon the blood begins to bubble, and Gore reaches up, pulling himself out, and the god says, Impossible. Gore tells him, sorry to disappoint, but Gore yet lives and I have claimed my prize, the still warm heart of an elder god. Now all I need is a moon or two, some centuries to myself and some space to build, to slave. I need so many slaves. But before he can leave, lightning strikes Gore and Thor shouts, it is time that you know the wrath of Thor. Back in the past, with the younger Thor, Gore asks Thor, should he stop now? It's been 17 days and you've endured far longer than even the sturdiest of the immortals. Gore stands up telling him, Come on, is there anyone in your family that you hate? A sibling, perhaps a parent, just tell me. However, there comes a shout from outside and the Vikings rush in stating that they shall redden their spears. Rather than a thousand deaths for one retreat, this night they will feast in Valhalla and die for Thor. Gore tells the men that they need to stop this. He has come to liberate them from the yoke of the divine servitude. And the men don't listen and they continue to fight. So Gore says, fine, you shall die for your god. See if he even takes notice. One by one, the men are killed and slaughtered, and Thor uses all of his strength to free himself. As Gore grabs the last of the men, he asks, where are the gods now? Do you see the truth yet? Where is your savior, Thor? However, without a word, Thor grabs his axe and he swings it upward, cutting off Gore's arm. In the current times, the present day, the Berserkers overwhelm Thor, and they hold him down as Gore tells him, I thought you were dead that day, but instead, they saved you. I've saved you from a life of failure, which is why I must repay my debt by letting you die last. Gore looks at the last of the time gods and he asks if it's done, and the god says that he's programmed it just as he asked. One of Gore's tendrils whip out and stab into the god's neck, and then the berserkers hang him over to drain his blood into the pool. Gore shouts that all the gods will die from the first to the last. He must go now and build an army and explore the new horizons of deicide. 
As Gore sinks into the pool, he tells Thor to make sure that he stays alive for a very long time. I would be terribly disappointed if we do not to meet again. And Thor shouts for him not to go, and he bursts out of the pile of berserkers. He shouts, the universe is not big enough to hide, and he rockets after Gore into the pool. The world shifts and we see the broken ruins of Asgard, and Thor asks, where is the Butcher of the Gods? And a voice tells him, well, look at that. I wasn't expecting you. King Thor steps out and Thor asks, what happened to the Asgardian father? King Thor tells him, I am not your father, you beardless whelp. Now get ready with that hammer and show me you're all that I remember you to be. Together, the two Thors fight and they destroy the berserkers. And as they go, King Thor notices that they are dissolving. Bless his eye, they're being pulled back. Thor asks, where is the God Butcher? He was just behind me. And King Thor says, right behind you? You're even dumber than I remember. He goes on explaining, that he did appear at the same exact spot that he did, but he's late. The God Butcher has been here for 900 years, and he's been busy. Elsewhere, Gora returns his berserkers into himself, stating that it would seem that we have another Thor. Splendid! We could never have too many of those! I once said that I would save him for last, and that day is imminent. And soon, the first day of a new age of freedom will begin. Three thousand years in the past, on a planet that had no name, the young Gore sat with his mother, as they slowly starved on their barren planet. With the last of their cave apple, they offered it to the gods to watch over them and help them through this hardship. The young Gore asked why would they pray to the gods to watch over them, when they allowed his father to die from the sun fevers. His mother told him that his father lived a long life, and they will soon see him again when the night comes. He will be there with the rest of the blessed ancients that shine upon them. Gore then asks, but why? Why can't he see his father? Why can't he ever see the gods? His mother patted him on the shoulder, telling him, You must always honor the gods, and they will shower you with blessings. But then there was a booming roar from the distance, and Gore's mother grabbed her spear, telling her son to run and never look back, and may the gods watch upon him. As Gore did that, leaving his mother behind, he never did see her again. The days turned the months, and the months turned the years, and Gore found a small bit of happiness with his wife. One day, his wife, who was expecting their second child, fell victim to an earthquake that took her life. All the while, Gore begged and pleaded with the gods to please save him and his family. And as many months went by, Gore and his son traveled in search of something to eat. His son asked if there was really a waterfall over the hills, and Gore told him, yes, there's a waterfall. Trees thick with fruit, so much that we will never be hungry again. Later, Gore buried his son and could not even cry, for there was no water left inside of him. He told his son that he was sorry, sorry for bringing him into this wretched world. And the tribe leader, Rugak, told Gore that he can't do this. Burying his son's body is forbidden. The dead must hang from the trees so that the gods may take him into the sky. By leaving him in the ground, he only damns his soul to sacrilege. But the only words that Gore could find is that they are already damned! The tribe leader asked, what did you say? And Gore lashed out, telling him to open his eyes! We move from one dried up cave to the next, eating slime off the bottom of rocks, leaving only a trail of our dead behind! The tribe leader shouts that he must be careful with his blasphemies, for the gods hear every word. Gore then says, There is only us! The sooner that you accept that, the sooner that we can! But before he can finish, someone from the tribe throws a rock, hitting him in the head. The rest of the tribe joins in, stoning Gore until he falls. And the tribe leader says that he is now an outcast. May the gods have mercy on his soul, though he expects the sun will not. Gore is left to die alone, and he manages to crawl through the deserts, waiting for the moment that he can finally just die. However, before that moment can come, there's a fire in the sky that crashes down onto the planet's surface. He runs over asking, why can't I ever die in peace? And what he finds are two gods struggling for power. The god in gold lifts his bloody hand, asking for help from the dying life form. And Gore asks him, help? Help you? Where were you? Where were you when my children were starving? When my wife was screaming for your help? When my mother was butchered like an animal? Where were you when we needed the gods? From the god in black, a strange black liquid shoots into Gore's hand, and he took that power and he killed the two gods. He had just killed his first gods, and there was only one question that he had left. Were there more gods to kill? Many centuries went by, and Gore goes on telling the story of how he came to be to a slave god. He then asks if it answers his question, and the god tells him no. I asked what the weapon that you use is, the one that you stole from a god. And Gore whips the god, telling him, You speak like someone who would rather die than be whipped. What is your name? The god shouts in pain, telling him that he is Volstag. He is, or he was, Volstag the Valiant Lion of Asgard. Gore goes on whipping and Volstag tells him, Not even the Allfather can save you now. But in the end, there will still be the mighty Thor.
Rage takes over and Gore stabs a stake into Volstag's hand and after a moment, he tells his son that he can come out now. His son asks, when will it be over? When will all of the bad gods be gone, father? And Gore walks his son out as Volstag is bound to a cross telling him, soon, very soon. Back in the past, the young Thor wakes from a nightmare where he sees Gore's face telling him that he is not finished. Thor wakes up stating, he isn't dead. And the woman with him asks him, who? Thor tells her, do not worry your pretty little head. And the woman gets up telling him that he should know that she makes war like she makes love. Naked and in a berserker rage. Thor then says that he's coming at the shadows. It's been eight days since I killed the god butcher and I wished to not dream any more of this night. She drops her blanket and sword stating that she can do for the glory of Asgard. Meanwhile, in the ruined Asgard, Thor asks, what happened here? Is that the arm of the destroyer? King Thor asks if he simply is going to gawk at him like some half-witted Hercules, or may we see to our business? The two walk, and as Thor looks around, he notices the high seat of Odin, though no one but the Allfather is allowed here. King Thor tells him, that's right. Well, I am the Allfather, and you are, what again? An Avenger? Guardian of the galaxy? Have you moved to the sun to become a cosmic cop yet? Thor asks him, what? No. And King Thor says, just forget everything I just said then. King Thor looks through the terminal and says, by my beard. They're gone. Gore had called the Black Berserkers home for the first time in 900 years. We still have a chance. King Thor walks on telling his younger self to make himself ready for war. This is no mere Ragnarok that comes. This is an apocalypse unparalleled. But before leaving, King Thor says that there is a chamber in the East Wing, one that only all fathers are allowed in, and on the eve of their extinction, go there and make ready so that they can leave. Thor walks telling himself, this can't be right. Perhaps this is one of those alternate futures that the X-Men are always on about. And what could you possibly need me to make ready for myself? I am ready to pound the Butcher of Gods into the dirt once and for all. A massive door swings open, revealing the Allfather's room is full of... Ale. And then Thor responds with, Well, I suppose that one drink wouldn't hurt. Back in present day, Thor's night of lust is interrupted by two of the Black Berserkers grabbing and pulling him outside. He cleaves one, asking, Where is the one-armed coward? The second Berserker then takes out a magic crystal and throws it at Thor. The ground begins to change and Thor sinks through it into a pink glow surrounding him. As he is lifted up, the future Gore looks down, telling him, Ah, my favorite Thor. Welcome to the place where the gods go to die. Over in the future, Thor, in his king version, get ready to depart on... Skithblathnir. And the king mentions that for the first time in a long time, he can feel it. The Thor Force. The younger version asks, wait, don't you mean the Odin Force? We wield the awesome power of the Odin Force. And King says, we call it the Thor Force now. And we have been for 10,000 years. I've even held it longer than the old man ever did. But let us leave for honor in the realm eternal, for vengeance divine. The last charge of the armies of Asgard. The last ride of the gods of thunder. Currently, in the present day at Omnipotent City, the great librarian tries to save what documents he can, but the one with the location of Kronux was lost. The librarian turns to Shadrox, asking, Who are you again? What are you a god of? And Shadrox tells him, It's better this way. You wouldn't have helped. This way is better. And the librarian asks, How? How can I help him? If I have to dig through these records to find out who you are, I will beat you senseless with the tome. Shadrach begins to cry, stating, He came to me, asking how to build it. To make him stop killing my people, I agreed. I am Shadrach, the god of bombs. While the current and future Thors ride to Gore's unholy world, the youngest of the Thors is put to work collecting materials for the massive god bomb. But after one last crack of the whip, he throws the stone onto a berserker, shouting for them to come. This god is no man's slave. Someone grabs him by the hair and a voice asks, What the hell does he think he's doing? Thor asks who dares lays a hand on him, but before he can finish, a woman kicks him to the ground stating, She dares! Now get back to work or it'll be both your arms broken so that you can clean the boots with your tongue. Thor whips the blood from his mouth stating that he will never submit to the will of Gore. And to see such cowardice among his fellow gods fills him with the shame for all of divinity. The woman asks, did this boy god really just call us cowards? And the red-headed sister says that she wouldn't mind if he reached through his stubborn, beardless face to rip out his stone. Maybe he'll be less annoying. The orange-haired sister says, but he's so handsome. Seems like a shame to waste it, not to mention the stones. The blonde one tells Thor, you best be back in line. And she won't tell him again. He's going to get some poor god killed with his immature pride. As the girls walk off, Thor has no idea that these girls are Atli, Ilisfa, and Frigg. Goddess is a thunder and his own future grandchildren. As Thor has worked as a slave, moving rocks and materials from one place to the next, as he sets a stone down, he quietly asks, what the hell is that thing anyway? 
Gore's son happily tells him it's a bomb. And it's going to kill all the gods. After 900 years of labor, it's almost finished. Thor asks, do you think it's really a good thing killing all of the gods? And the son says that it will be a better world without them. No more fear of eternal damnation or lust for eternal reward. No more hatred between believers of rival faiths. Thor leans down stating, you should flee this world. Your father's going to die for what he has done by his own hands. Fates be willing. The son then holds out a finger and using the darkness to pierce into Thor's throat, he tells him, never speak ill of my father again. You are but a jealous god. Now get back to work before I have you crucified. As the night comes, the god slaves gather to discuss their plans. Plans that must be acted upon now before it is too late. Some of the gods say that they should do it tonight, and Frigg says that it's not a matter of when, but rather who. Who among them can they trust to lead the way and carry the burden, knowing that even if they succeed, they will still die? A voice tells her that if she is talking about destroying that bomb and killing that bastard Gore, then look no further for he is their god. Thor jumps down and Frigg tells him, No offense, friend, but we don't even know who you are. Thor announces, I am the favorite son of Odin, the Omnipotent, heir to the throne of the Eternal Asgard, the Lord of Storm and God of Thunder. You may call me Thor. Elisvith gasps, Oh my heavens, I've been having impure thoughts about my grandfather. Frigg says, Gore is known to pull gods out of the time stream, so if you really are who you say you are, then you should have no trouble summoning a thunderstorm to cover our attack. Thor looks away, stating that, he has tried. This world is too barren. There are no storms that answer Thor's call. Frigg tells him, Fear not, even the rain god could not make do anymore. But our plan is simple. Destroy the bomb before it is finished. Thor asks, How? It is the size of the moon. Do you really expect me to destroy it with a few ragged slaves with clubs and sharp stones? As two gods set a glowing stone down, Frigg tells him that for the last 900 years, we ragged slaves have mined the cores of dead stars and broken planets for Gore's god bomb. This scrap of unstable matter is all that we need to steal and hide. We have a bomb of our own. Frigg looks away, stating, The only issue is getting close enough to set it off. There are different ways, but each would lead to death. She then asks everyone by a show of hands who is willing to volunteer to, and Frigg stops, looking at the place where the bomb used to be. And she says, Oh, you stupid, stupid Thor. Outside, Thor runs through with the makeshift bomb, asking for one last storm. That's all I ask! If today the god of thunder must die screaming, then let the sky scream with him. Just then, the low rumbles of thunder can be heard, and it begins to fire off from the clouds. The sisters watch, and Frigg says, She'll be damned. He is Thor. And Eli's fib shouts, Go, Granddad, go! With all of his strength, Thor throws the bomb into the side of the giant god bomb, and the explosion goes off! Up in the skies, the Thors feel the tremors from the explosion, and the king tells the younger, You'd best get your hammer. Something is close. On the side of the longboat, a hand reaches up, gripping its side, and then the beast climbs aboard, screaming, hitting Thor with a space shark. The king blasts through it, and Thor asks, What just happened? Was I really struck in the face by a shark? What manner of foul beast has Gore conjured up this time? King stares at the beast, stating, The foulest, I'm afraid. Seems we found another one. The youngest then asks, Are you really my father? And King says, By boar's bones. Are we certain there isn't any ale left? With a brief exchange of words, we now have the older King Thor, the middle-aged present-day Thor, and the youngest Thor, readying themselves for battle. King, Thor, and youngest. And the youngest explains that the bomb that they attempted to use on the god bomb left it untouched, not even a scratch. King Thor tells him, I hope that you are a better slayer of god butchers than dismantler of bombs. And the youngest shouts, calling out to Gore. But Thor tells him, nay. The time for words is past. Now let the hammers talk! As the ship begins to descend downward, the Thors see a black creature appear before them, and Gore tells them that they really should have brought more Thors. The youngest jumps off shouting, and the king follows, stating, These idiot children have yet to learn what it means to be the king. For the glory of Asgard! The Thors fight valiantly, and Gore's weapons make their efforts for naught. King gathers his strength, stating, I've waited 900 years to feel the thunder in my blood again. Let's see if it's still there. He holds out his arm, releasing the Thor Force, blasting Gore light years away into a far off planet. With the awesome might of the All Father unleashed, the God Butcher had felt something that he hasn't felt in a millennia fear. Gore begins to hurl chunks of the planet back towards the Thors, shouting, I need more blood! Massacre all of the gods! Down on the unholy planet, the Black Berserkers slay groups of gods, all throwing them into a pile, allowing the darkness to take them. With that darkness, it reaches up into space to aid Gore with the power in the form of a giant serpent. As the serpent begins to swallow two of the Thors, Gore says that he can feel them drowning. No Thor shall survive this day! 
The youngest's voice calls out, and no gore will either. Faster, you stupid shark. And with one mighty swing of the two-handed hammer, Thor launches Gore back into the planet, telling him, I know that you pray to no god, but if you'd like, you can pray to me now. Back with the serpent, King musters his strength to open up the beast's jaws, telling the younger to hurry and go. Let the Lord of Asgard deal with the worm. The mighty Thor races down to the planet, swinging into Gore so hard that he could feel his fingers crack and his muscles tear. And yet he swung again, even harder than before, and again, and again! With each and every cut, Thor could feel Gore's weapon creep inside of him, burrowing deeper into his flesh. Thor ignored the pain, focusing on the bludgeoning, ignoring everything else. And as the struggle continued, it took the cracking of a planet to snap his mind back to reality. The planet surfaced because the crack had exploded, and there to mend it is Thor. And soon the fissures are settled. As Thor returns to the battle, Gore tells him, I understand you now. The old you is fueled by regret. The young one uses his arrogance and rage to mass his crippling shame. And as for you, you try so desperately to seem noble, all because you see just how petty and useless your kind really are. At that moment, the king, the youngest, and the Thor came together to fight side by side to take down the universe's greatest foe. King blasts Gore one more time towards the sun, and the mighty Thor shouts to follow. The group flies faster and faster towards the sun until there is no sight of anyone. And just then, for the first time in the galaxy, people could look up and see the sun turn black. Down on the unholy planet, it began to rain, and it rained blood. God blood. Next, it rained hammers, and then Thor's, and despair. Gore stands atop the three bodies, shouting, Make ready the bomb. The thunder fell silent, and as King Thor was nailed to a comet and sent roaring through the space, Thor the Avenger was cast into the ground that opened into a great black maw. Molnir's lay encased in a cage of god flesh, unable to fly to the master's hands. And the youngest found himself too spent to even muster a curse as the countdown began. Gore drags the youngest through the lands when his wife runs up asking if he is unharmed. Please tell her that her love is unharmed. And Gore tells her, go back inside, it'll all be over soon. His wife praises him, stating how she waited for this day for so many years. He has suffered so much, endured horrors beyond imagining, and he is the only being that she has ever known worthy of worship. He is the brightest star in all of the heavens. He is Gore, her lover, her savior, and her god. Gore releases his grip on the youngest, and then he turns back asking, What did you just say? She explains that what she said was that he is. But before she could finish, Gore uses a tendril and stabs inside of her mouth, telling her, I am no one's god. Moments later, Gore's son runs up asking if it's true. Is it time to trigger the bomb? Gore tells him, indeed it is, and if you could, go to the tower and look for your mother. I have many gods to kill. The boy smiles, yes, and of course, make sure to kill them all. But before leaving, he turns to see his mother's hand sticking out of the sand. As Gore walks to the entrance of the bomb, he says, It took us 900 years to make this, and now it will explode throughout time, killing every god who has ever lived and ever will. He then takes Thor's hand and he slams it into the door, stating, Amen. And a path opens. Gore drags the youngest, stating, Only a few more drops in the pool of forevers. Now bleed, God of Thunder. Bleed for my blessed bomb. Down on the crack of the planet, the mighty Thor struggles to maintain his holds. And then he hears a voice talking to him. Gore's son tells him, You will never make it. Gore's triggering the bomb as we speak. And Thor tells him, you must run away. This is no place for the likes of you. The boy says that he cannot. He is what his father created. But the question now is, what is his father? He was a good man once, a family man, a loving man who suffers unfairly. But what would his younger self say of his older self now? Thor tells him, you must leave now. Take whatever family you. And the boy says, my mother is dead. She always dreamed of a life after the bomb, but there is never going to be a life after it. Gore is dead, and in his place is something that I have been raised to despise. Thor loses his grip, and he falls back, and the boy catches him, stating, I know not how to pray, but I will pray for you, God of Thunder. Pray that you will kill my father. At that moment, there's a rumble in the ground, and the cage of god flesh pops, freeing the hammers. Back inside of the god bomb, the youngest screams in pain, asking Gore, If you want my heart so badly, I will gladly trade you for an eye. The youngest leaps up, sinking his teeth into Gore's eye socket, and then he's thrown out of the bomb. Gore steps out, shouting, You are too late. You are all too damned late. Thor spits into the eye, stating, That's one down. Now just to take the other. And then a battle cry from Attili can be heard, and Thor asks if she's holding Jornbjorn. He takes the axe from her, and Attili shouts to get his own. But he says he's sorry. This axe and him have unfinished business. 
With two hammers returning to the rightful owners, the two missing Thors come crashing down to the planet. With everyone distracted, a berserker kills the last god needed, and he pulls his heart out to finally begin the Era of Man. The youngest Thor fights outside while the older two fly into the god bomb's core to try to stop it. But once they get in, Gore tells them, You are but too late! Behold your doom! The king rockets down to pin Gore, and Thor asks, What do we do? The bomb's triggered. King shouts, You're a Thor! You hit it with a hammer! And with the power of two hammers, Thor does just that! However, as he swings at the core, he thinks, Just for a bit, what if Gore was right? What if a godless age is what man deserves? What if Gore isn't a madman at all? God helped him. What if he is? The bomb goes off and its effects can be felt across all of time, killing each and every god in existence. And as the mighty Thor grips the two hammers, the darkness begins to go into him. Gore asks, what are you doing? And the king tells him that he is dying, like a god. All across time, the dying gods can see one thing, a vision, a vision of a god with a mighty hammer in each hand, fighting at the heart of a bomb to save them. It was at that moment that every god in all of the universe closed his eyes, and he prayed for Thor. The king holds Gore back as Gore shouts, he's absorbing it. He's taking the blast into himself, that is not possible. And the king laughs, ha 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 Then we shall watch the impossible together! In only a few moments, the blast soon begins to fade, and all that's left is Thor, covered in darkness, holding two hammers! Thor tells Gore that this is no longer his weapon. It laughs at him! The name of it is the All Black, the Necrosword, the Slicer of Worlds, the Annihila Blade, and it is meant to be wielded by a god. But you are right about one thing, it was meant to kill them. He takes the power of his two hammers and he releases their full devastating force into Gore. And as the smoke clears, Gore is left with nothing, nothing but his son. He calls out to him and his son tells him that he can't blame the gods anymore. It wasn't a god who betrayed him, it was only ever yourself. The son begins to drip into a black puddle and Gore tells him, Please, don't leave me alone. The mighty Thor asks, How? The boy, he helped me defeat you, Gore. And the king tells him no, it was a lonely little man who helped him defeat the god butcher. Gore screams out and the youngest swings his axe, cutting off his head, stating, enough of that. Shall we drink mead and think of ways to defile his ashes? However, that day was the day that Thor died. For the ninth time, that could be remembered. And three days later, he rose again. He woke up screaming, saying that it was so strange, there were three of him. And the king tells him, it appears dying hasn't made you any smarter, has it? Thor asks, what of the Necrosword? The king says, we left it, dared not to touch it again. The youngest says, I would have, if his majesty here hadn't thrown the whole damn planet into a black hole and then brought you back from the dead. King says, that's right, burned out the last of Gore's sickness. But I figured that it was in my best interest. So would you like to see what you died for? The Thors walk outside and King Thor says, Asgard lives again. And with the gods from all of the cosmos, so with the universe saved, the old king uses his all-father's magic to send his younger selves back into their time stream. Soon, things return to normal. The youngest set out to become the Viking god once again, and the mighty Thor went back to being an Avenger, and the old king sought to make memories with his granddaughters. However, due to the nature of time travel, they knew that their memories of their adventures would fade, and no one would remember this time. Back on the planet of Indigar, Thor returned to see the young girl who prayed but never received an answer. He told her that she prayed to him because she had no gods, and he can assure her now that she never needs to pray to him again. And the world without gods became one with many gods, all thanks to a little girl's prayer at a madman's murder spree. Now, out in the deep reaches of space, Thor looks upon those that were easy enough to find. The dead worlds. Worlds that were once teeming with life but are now either burned or frozen, flooded or dry as a grave. Battles between the armies is something that Thor understands, but who do you fight when it's the world itself killing its people? The Earth is dying, and the God of Thunder knows not who to smite in order to save it. Over in the Southern Ocean, Agent Rosalind Solomon investigates a recent disturbance with a herd of blue whales who seem to be running away from something. As she dives into the water, she finds the cause, the Yashida Industries underwater whaling fleet. Rosalind radios over one of the subs telling them that their presence in these waters are a violation of international law, so surface and prepare to be boarded. The sub doesn't respond by radio and instead fires two torpedoes at Rosalind's car. 
next to Harpoon is shot into the car's windshield, and Rosalind quickly ejects before she can be trapped inside. Agent Coulson radios in telling her that backup will arrive in three minutes, but now get to personnel. She may want to call her boyfriend. Rosalind asks, Boyfriend? Thor? He just came with me to the Shield Cadets Ball. We're not dating! And at that moment, Molnir shoots down into the water, destroying the two whaling subs. Rosalind says that she only sees a hammer. Where's the rest of him? And Coulson tells her, 30 miles up in closing. Suddenly, there's a giant splash, and Thor grabs the hammer, bashing it into another sub, shouting, How about thee, foul Leviathan? Coulson then radios back, stating that once they're finished down there, there's something that he'd like her to take a look at when she's topside. Later in the Glacier Bay National Park of Alaska, CEO Roxanne Dario Anker holds a conference telling the new individuals that they are here today to show them something that can make the world a better place. Global warming has become an issue, and the glaciers are all over the planet and melting away at an alarming rate. As Dario goes on, a helicopter flies over, lowering a large chunk of ice, and once it's set on the stand, Dario tells them that this is what they've been gathered here today to see. This big, blue, beautiful chunk of ice is the end of their problems. It was chiseled out of one of Jupiter's moons, and there is plenty more where that came from. As Dario goes to make a toast, Rosalind walks up telling him congratulations. He managed to make even a simple glass of water, ostentatious. Dario tells the crowd to pardon him for a few moments, but please enjoy the water. He turns to Rosalind and he tells her that he's going to assume that she's Agent Rosalind Solomon from S.H.I.E.L.D., correct? Rosalind explains that they know about his ozone depletion project and the greenhouse gas satellites and the mobile factories that even Latvarian government is calling toxic. Now he's trying to profit off the effects of global warming by having a fancy space ice. Dario laughs, stating that all they're trying to do is give the people of today what they need to survive tomorrow. Roxxon is the world's wealthiest and most powerful super corporation. If they don't know what's best for the people of this planet, dare he ask, who does? Just then, the people begin to hear a low, rumbling thunder, and Thor appears with a giant ice boulder, stating, I heard the people of Midgard needed frozen water. Will this suffice? The reporters in the crowd run over, and they surround Thor, asking where he got the ice from, and he tells them just to consider it a generous donation from his old friends, who happen to be frost giants. Then Thor turns to Rosalind, asking, I brought you the largest mountain in all of Jotunheim. Might that finally be enough to win your company for the evening? Rosalind tells him that now is probably not the time, and Dario steps down, stating, What an unexpected pleasure! My name is Dario Agger, CEO of Roxxon Energy. It's so rare that someone in my line of work would get to shake hands with a relative equal. Thor turns to Rosalind and asks, Is this the villain that you spoke of? The one who seeks to poison Midgard for financial gain? Rosalind tells him, yeah, one of the biggest. Think of him as Dr. Doom of corporate scumbags. His nickname back in business school was The Minotaur. Dario says, let it be known. My company has never been convicted of any wrongdoing by any court in the world. Thor looks at Dario and says, You, man of Roxxon, mark well my words. Anyone who threatens Midgard will come to know my hammer in ways that they will find most uncomfortable. A few moments later, back at Dario's floating factory, his advisor says that it costs them $478 billion. The ice pipeline project will have to be put on hold. And as a few of the other advisors begin to project losses, Dario shouts at them to get out. If they value their lives, get out! As he says this, his eyes begin to turn red and something in him begins to change and back on the ground. Rosal says that there is one thing that Dario is right about, and that's that they can't touch him. His record is squeaky clean. If Roxxon gets caught breaking the law, they'll just pay to change the law. Thor tells her, there's one thing that you have, that's me. And gods are not bound by laws of man. I have a few ideas, perhaps you would like to come to Asgard and discuss it over mead. Rosalind says that she has some forms and stuff to do. So how about they just get coffee tomorrow? Thor shouts, splendid! On the morrow it is, we shall drink coffee and decide what is best to save the world. But many millennia from now, King Thor sits on the once blue planet, thinking how it used to have such pretty shade. King Thor's granddaughter, Atli, says that it is certainly not very blue anymore, more like crap, actually. And Elisfa says that Atli can be quiet, and says that she is sure that Midgard was quite lovely in its day. Frigg then tells him that Elisva is right. It's been gone for a very long time. Perhaps coming back here wasn't such a good idea. But King Thor stands up stating that he didn't come back here to feel sorry for himself. Some things are still worth fighting for. Frigg says that with all due respect, the earth is gone. Its age has passed. Its fate was in a large part its own doing. Then there's a rumble, and as King Thor looks up, he says, It would seem that I'm not the only old fool looking down at this planet. Galactus appears before the Thor of them and tells them one thing. I... HUNGER! 
Everyone looks up and Frigg says that Galactus has killed more worlds than anything in the history of the cosmos. She does hope that her grandfather knows what this means, and Atli says, yeah, he should have brought his arm. So Thor says, that blasted thing weighs a ton, hurts my back. Frigg shouts, no, it means that it's time to let go of Midgard. There's nothing left of this world that you once loved. You cannot risk battling against a being as powerful as Galactus. King Thor whispers to his hammer, telling it, take my granddaughters back to Asgard and fetch me my arm. Frigg says, please don't do this, and King Thor tells her, it is already done. The thunder has spoken. King Thor thrills Mjolnir with all of his strength, creating a portal and sucking the girls up, and Frigg yells, you can't possibly hope to. The King Thor asks, whoever said that I was going to fight him? You can't fight Galactus with one arm and a hammer, but you can die. And I, that I could still do. King Thor makes his way down, calling out to Galactus that the king of Asgard would like to have words with thee. Back in the current times, Thor and Rosalind finish up their meeting at dinner, and Thor asks, so companies like Roxxon are harming the Earth as we speak? And Rosalind tells him that she's working on it, but this is the first time the S.H.I.E.L.D. has ever had an environmental task force. And against Roxxon, they're outmatched. Thor smiles, and Rosalind says that that's the smile of someone who's about to get her in trouble. And he asks, how would you like to see how it feels to stand inside of a thundercloud? Later in the skies above South Africa, Thor asks if she's absolutely certain that there's no one inside. Rosalind tells him that she scanned in, scanned it again. The whole place is automated. It's too toxic for anyone to set foot in. So he holds the hammer in the air and the lightning strikes down on the Roxxon facility. A short while later over on the Roxxon Island, Dario asks, what do they mean by no longer there? His advisors explain that there was some sort of anomaly, a localized superstorm. And what's more, the insurance is refusing to pay. They're stating that it was an act of God. Dario then leads his men into the lab, telling them that this means war. Our enemy has drawn the first blood, and it's time for us to discuss retaliation strategies. There are many projects here, like these bears, for example. Their jaws and stomachs have been augmented, genetically engineered to gorge themselves to the point of obesity. They won't stop eating until they are fat and dead. The plan is to drop them into the rivers in Canada to begin cultailing the salmon population. Soon, if anyone is to want salmon, they're going to have to buy it from the Roxxon Hatchery. Also, there's this button. The hatch opens and fish pour onto the men, spelling certain doom for them. And Dario then opens up the cages for the bears, the ones that will eat those fish until they are engorged. And he shouts, all right, let's get brainstorming. Back in the future, King Thor climbs up a rock stating, damn my beard, I should have flown up here before sending that blasted hammer away. Once he gets up though, he shouts to Galactus telling him, I know that you can hear me, stop being rude. Galactus tells him, you have climbed all this way for nothing. That is, unless you have come to watch your Earth die. King Thor tells him, I did not come here to fight. As you can see, I am unarmed. I have come to talk. Galactus turns his attention towards King Thor and he asks, Why do you wish to defend this planet? And King Thor says, It's because it has saved me more times than I can count. And I haven't saved it nearly enough. Galactus goes back to his drill, stating, This planet has defined me more times than I can count. This wretched Earth, it imagined itself so precious, so supremely important. Look at it now. Look what man hath made of the meagerness he was given. All worlds must die. This they all know. And thus, Earth's time is up. Galactus continues digging into the Earth, and King Thor shouts, This is my last warning. Step away, and we will find another world for you to dine on. I wish to do you no harm. Galactus tells him, Your mind has gone soft. I am done showing you courtesy. You should have left me to eat in peace. Just then, Galactus holds out his hand, and a devastating blast shoots from his palm, knocking King Thor to the ground. King Thor pulls himself back up, stating, And you should have killed me when you had the chance. Up in the sky, the arm of the Destroyer and Molnir return to King Thor, and once they are set, King Thor shouts, For Midgard! But back in the current times, Dario punches out the last bear, after eating the other advisors, telling the remaining advisors that, I like that idea. The advisor says that this place is called Broxton, and the next morning, Roxxon trucks begin to make their way into the city. But once again in the future, during the final hours of the planet Earth, King Thor and Galactus battle. As Galactus has King Thor in his grasp, the king swings Mjolnir, breaking one of Galactus' massive hands. King Thor laughs, stating, Ha! Even the bones of giants can be broken. And I would know, I've felled an entire race of them. Galactus then takes his other fist, slamming it down at King Thor with a force that literally punches him through the planet and into the moon. The moon cracks and it explodes, and King Thor says, The bastard just punched me through the earth and broke the moon! I quite liked the moon! Back in the present day, over in Oklahoma, three weeks have passed since Thor returned to Midgard. He missed Broxton, and as he arrived, he begins to cough. 
When he looks around, he sees something that he wish he didn't see. Roxon has taken over the once quiet city. Thor flies down to see the old buildings are gone, replaced with new Roxon-owned businesses. And as he takes it all in, Rosalind shouts to him, stating that she's been trying to reach him for weeks. He really needs to get a cell phone. But before he goes and does something, just stop and listen for a second. Still not believing what he is seeing, Rosalind tells Thor that it started a few weeks ago when Roxon got approval from the state senate to move their flying factories in. Thor begins to say, this is because of me. And Rosalind says, look, I need to be the one to handle this. I'm going to shut these factories down. We just have to do it the legal way. Some of the townspeople begin to walk up to Thor through the smog, all stating their problems. Homes being taken away, nursing homes closed, their water is now polluted. And they ask Thor, why is this happening? Thor grits his teeth and he rockets into the air. Up on Roxon Island, the sounds of thunder can be heard. And the advisor asks if this was really a good idea. They have over a trillion dollars of equipment here. Dario tells him that he carries a hammer. I have a good idea of how he's going to react. And just as Dario thought, Thor comes crashing and destroying everything directly in front of him. As the armies begin to fire on him, he easily takes out the weapons and Rosalind flies up shouting for him to stop. Thor doesn't respond and Rosalind pulls out her gun, telling him that if he does not put the tank down, he'll be fighting her. Thor tosses the tank and tells Dario, Be a fool or a madman. You will end your assault on Broxton at once. Dario asks, What do you mean assault? I simply made a significant financial investment into Broxton. In fact, in a matter of weeks, I've reinvigorated what was once a small town on the brink of collapse. This is all done as a gesture of goodwill towards you after the awkwardness of our previous encounter. Thor tells him, if it's money you want, I'll buy Broxton from you. There is enough gold in the vaults of Asgard to satisfy even your greed. Dario whispers, I don't want your money. At least not until you're on your knees begging me to take it. Thor holds out his hammer, telling him, I will pay. Whether it be in gold of Uru, the choice is yours. Dario then looks back at the men behind him, stating, We're done here, wouldn't you say? One man steps forward, telling him, Yes, we've seen quite enough. And the man walks to Thor, telling him, Thor Odinson of Asgard, you've been served. Thor looks at the paper, asking, what is this? And Rosalind sighs, stating, oh hell, that means they're suing you. The lawyer goes on stating that, you've never been sued before, so I'm going to explain. Roxon is not only seeking compensation for the damages that occurred here today, but also the recent destruction of the various facilities. Also, a restraining order has been filed that will prohibit you from coming within 300 yards of any Roxon facility on the face of Earth, and that includes the town of Roxton. Thor's jaw drops. This cannot be! And Dario tells him, you could go back to fighting goblins and rescuing unicorns, whatever it is you do. But back in the future, the battle between King Thor rages throughout the galaxies. The more that they rage, the more the ground beneath their feet turns to dust. No matter who claims victory in the King Thor versus the Galactus battle, it would appear that the Earth is doomed. As Galactus's giant body falls to the ground, King Thor hurries over telling him, Yield! Yieldor! But King Thor's words trail off as he begins to see the skeletal remains of those that once lived on this lovely planet. Galactus tells him, you have failed the Earth before, as you can see. Failed to save those wretched humans from themselves. So tell me, tell me how it feels to see this. Tell me if it stings. Galactus then holds out his hand, releasing a blast so powerful that it could kill even the All-Father. And back in the present, Thor stands in the outskirts of Broxon with a sign that once said, Neighbor to the gods, now reads, Where gods fear to tread. As Thor tries to figure out a plan, Dario is continuing his own plans that involve Ulic, the king of the trolls. Though in the future, the destroyed planet would seem to have finally succumbed to Galactus's hunger. The skies crack with lightning and Galactus asks if he's back for more already. Now that I have beasted you, you will find that there is not a man alive who may stand before my might. The three granddaughters fly down and Ellie Siv says that it's a good thing that they aren't men. And Frigg shouts, Girls of Thunder, take him down! The three waste no time in beating into Galactus, asking where is it that he sent their grandfather. He must also speak quickly before his tongue becomes a bed for their goats. Galactus asks, Is that all you seek? Well, very well, little one. I will see to it that you will join Thor, wherever it is that he is dying. Back in the past, a few more days go by and Rosalind is no closer to finding a solution to stopping Roxxon than she was in the beginning. However, tonight she is investigating recent sinkhole appearances that appear to be mysteriously popping up all over Broxton. She flies down into one and a boulder breaks and it crashes down onto the flying car. Rosalind crawls out stating, there goes another car, Coulson's going to kill me. And a voice tells her, not likely, not unless he hurries. Rosalind looks up and says, you are, you actually, what the hell are you? Ulick tells her, we are trolls. What are you? Rosalind pulls out her gun, telling them that she is Agent Rosalind from S.H.I.E.L.D., and they're all under arrest. And Ulick laughs, stating, Yes, I'm sure we are. Now eat her quickly. Just save me a thigh. 
With that, Rosalind loads a magazine into her gun and begins to let off into the trolls. Back in the future, the goddesses of thunder also continue their fight. Ali Siv is wielding the weapons of her great uncles, Fandel and Hogan. Frigg, feeling the power coursing through her body, swings the hammer Stormbreaker, and Atli uses the great axe Jarnbjorn. They are a match made in Valhalla, or hell. If there is one thing to note, though, it is that Galactus is not the least bit amused by their actions. He shouts at them, You are nothing but insects before the might of the World Eater. Fly back to Asgard, little gob bugs. Frigg pulls back her arm, telling Galactus, Be careful, for even the tiniest bug can cause a giant to choke. The hammer is thrown down Galactus's throat, and Frigg holds out her arm, and the hammer returns, ripping and blowing off Galactus's jaw. Atlee shouts that that is enough. Let them kill this bastard already. And Galactus calls to them, Many have tried, including your fool of a grandfather. Your withered bones will litter these cosmos from one end to the other. All while Galactus still burns like a billion suns. But as Galactus begins to release his power many light years away, the Allfather begins to wake up asking, Where am I? Once Molnir appears before him, King Thor remembers what he is doing. He's saving Earth from Galactus. However, as he takes the strap of the hammer, King Thor flies in the opposite direction of where Earth is. In the present, Dario walks through Broxton, enjoying the recent progress that his company has made when he hears the roars of thunder. Dario walks over to Thor, stating, You're making this almost too easy. You should have at least brought Daredevil with you as legal counsel. Thor tells him, you may have lawyers, but I have a hammer. However, if it will end these people's suffering, then I, Thor, will beg this day. How much begging will it take for you to feel like a man? Dario takes out a device and presses a button, telling him, I wouldn't know. It's been a very long time since I felt like anything quite so simple as a man. Just then, the floor begins to shake and the ground begins to fall into the sinkhole. Hands reach out and they begin to grab onto Thor and he shouts, asking, what devilry is this? Dario begins to walk up in his minotaur form, telling him, Ah, oh, never mind. But please continue. I believe the begging was just about to start. Back in the future, King Thor finds what he was looking for. A black hole. At least, back then it was a mere black hole. Now it is something more. Dark. King Thor takes his hammer, and after spinning it, he goes through the darkness and begins to carve a path into it. He flies into the small opening to claim what was once thrown away, never to be touched again. All Black, the Necro Sword, the blade that slew a billion gods, the Black Blade of Gore the Butcher, and the last hope for planet Earth. Back on Earth, the three sisters stand after another attack by Galactus, and Frigg shouts that they're about to die here on this chunk of rock once known as Midgard, and they will die for the Allfather. Ali Siv says, I, for their grandfather Thor, and Atli yells, to hell with it, for blood and guts and glory, and also for Thor. Galactus stomps on the ground, asking, Did I just hear that you're ready to die? But before Galactus can land the finishing blow, lightning begins to strike, and Galactus asks, How many times do I have to kill these Asgardians? Ali Siv says, He's back! Isn't he? And Frigg quietly asks, What has their grandfather done? The girls look up into the sky to see the All Black, the All Father, the God of Butchers, the Necrothor, the Eater of World Eaters! As he comes racing down, he blasts straight into Galactus's torso. Meanwhile, Back in the present day, one of the trolls holds Thor still as Ulick punches into his stomach. Thor manages to curse him, telling him, You will rot in Nastron for this, if I allow you to survive the day. Ulick tells him, A troll's home is wherever we can carve it, such as it always has been. And then he punches again. Dario calls out to Ulick, That's enough. It's time to get down to business. Once he readies himself, he charges into Thor, knocking him into cars and anything else in his path. And from the smoke and debris, Dario walks out, dragging Thor, telling the trolls, Earn your pay! Pillage and destroy! Murder at will! Burn everything to the ground! Ulick shouts to the others in other words, Brothers, go be trolls! Thor struggles to pull himself up, telling Dario, You're just another monster. Hired trolls to kill men, transformed into a beast with the strength of the Hulk? So that means... Dario leans down, asking, Yes. What does that mean, oh mighty god of thunder? And seconds later, the sound of a thunderous punch can be heard from all across as a body is shot into the air and onto Roxxon Island. Through the smoking body, Dario crashes back to the ground and Thor tells him, That means that I can finally do that. Now the final battle for the two Thors can finally begin as they both begin fighting for their very lives in order to protect the Earth. One in the present day, one in the future. The mighty Thor battling against all the odds to hold the trolls with Dario back. And the King Thor using the dark power that is the Necroblade to unleash a power never once seen. But as true as there is a King Thor in the future, the mighty Thor does prevail. And Dario is stopped for now. As Thor looks up to see his work, he weeps. Knowing where his tears fall, nothing will ever grow again until the end of time. The king, too, sits back to examine his work, finding it surprising that Thor, the king of Asgard, still draws breath and bleeds. But where those drops of god blood fell, the dead rock drinks it deep, and the earth has blood of its own again. The last day of Midgard, it would seem, will have to wait 
until another tomorrow. In the wake of the destruction that once was the city of Broxen, a man tells the people how the sickness came and his name was Asgard. Dario tells the news reporters that if they look around, they can see what happens if they allow the gods to walk the earth. It was their fault that the trolls came and it's their fault that these attacks happened in the first place. But perhaps it may be partly their faults as well. Trolls and ogres are a normal part of their lives, but it shouldn't be of theirs. So it is time for everyone to gather together to tell these Asgardians to go back to wherever it is that they came from. Days pass since Dario's speech and She-Hulk Jennifer Walters walks out of the courtroom telling Rosalind that the injunctions for Thor have been lifted, but that's not their biggest problem. What Dario has been feeding the people is working. Congress wants to revoke Asgard's embassy status. Rosalind tells her, thanks for letting her know, she's gonna try and speak to Thor now. As she tries to get out of her third car, she asks if it's all right if she parks here. Heimdall tells her that her flying chariot will be safe in Asgard. She has his solemn vow. Rosalind says, okay, cool. Not sure if I should be tipping or something. And then she looks for Thor. Heimdall says that she must follow her ears. The rumbling will direct her where to go. Inside of the halls, more thunder can be heard and the All-Mother begins to ask if the indoor thunder is really necessary. Thor sits up asking if they voted already, if there's still a chance for the fools to listen to reason. And she tells him that there's a growing unrest in the Nine Realms, as he can already see. Meliketh and his Dark Elves continue to scheme from their swamps. Every day there are more worrisome rumblings coming from the land of the Frost Giants, and even some claim to see war bonfires burning once again. Whatever is coming for them, they must face it out there, out where they belong. It is decided. Asgard is leading, and as for the All-Mother, she is commanding him to do his princely duty, or she'll find someone else to carry that hammer. And as his mother, she understands his pain. If there is one thing that she can part on him, it is that sometimes they must let go of the things that they love most. Later, as Rosalind finds Thor, he looks out into the world, stating that Roxxon is one. Dario is a murderous monster who consorts with trolls, and yet he walks free. The Congress of Worlds bent to his will, and it's been decided that Asgard must go. Rosalind says, wait, you're leaving Earth? What about Broxton? And Thor tells her that the first time he came to lay eyes upon Midgard, people there still lived in caves and fought one another with sticks and stone. In those days, he only came to make war and revelry, to be worshipped and feared, and above all else, to destroy. His world and his people have changed so much since then, but has he? Down below, the people of Broxton try to clean up their broken town, and a little girl picks up her half-destroyed teddy bear. A glorious light then shines down. Thor, along with some of Asgard's finest, kneel before the people, telling them that they all know that it is a time of hardship. But they humbly ask the favor, may they please be of assistance. As Thor and the others clean, Jane tells them that they are here to bury buildings, not people today, remember that. Thor says that these are more than just buildings. When he brought Asgard to this land, there was life, and now Asgard leaves and there is nothing. He did this, and he is not worthy of this world. Jane asks, you're not planning on leaving, right? And he tells her, no, no, I would never do that. I was hoping that you could. It is more important than ever that someone speak for Midgard in the Congress of Worlds, and I know a not a finer candidate. She says it is quite an honor, but she's really not sure that she's qualified to. There's still the cancer treatments. Thor tells her that they have a rainbow bridge that can take her anywhere in the cosmos. And after some thought, she decides that maybe, maybe she should go. Meanwhile, across the way, Dario gets ready to leave. Before he gets into his car, Rosalind calls out to him, punching him in the face. The people hold her back, and she shouts that she just wanted him to know that this wasn't over. She will approve what he did here and nail his bullheaded butt to the wall for it. Dario's eyes glow red and he tells her that she has his word, that he will sue her into oblivion for this assault. She storms off telling him it's a great idea. Too bad he's murdered all of the lawyers. See you around. And so the time for the gods to leave Midgard comes and Freya tells everyone with their heavy hearts they must leave. However, they must all know this. Lords and ladies of Broxton shall always have gods in their service. So swears Freya, the All-Mother. But rather than leave them with mere promises, please accept these gifts as a token of their eternal gratitude. Gold from the treasures of Asgard, enchanted fruit trees that will bloom for a thousand years, and a fountain that will never run dry. May the light of the Bifrost shine forever in their skies. As the gods all walk back to Asgard, a little girl from before asks if they're really leaving. They didn't fix the town. Where will they go? That was their home. A voice then calls out, stating, Aye, and may it always be. Thor flies down, placing a giant piece of stone down, and he tells everyone that he will not give back what they've lost. But this may serve as a small token of debt that was owed by Thor and the gods. The little girl looks up at the giant castle, and the little girl asks, She gets to live in that? And Thor tells her, If you so wish, yes. Rosalind asks Freya, Did Thor just rip out a chunk of Asgard and give it away? Can he even do that? She smiles, stating that it is Bill Skirner, greatest of all the halls in Asgard. Rosalind says, Okay, right, so whose castle was that? And Freya says that, Who do you think it belonged to? It was Thor's. And so the gods of Asgard return once more to the heavens, though far less alone than when they arrived. Just as Earth itself will never be alone, so long as there is thunder in the sky. And back in the future, a new river has been forged, and Frigg asks, what shall they name this one? King Thor tells her, Roz. And Atli says, Roz, Jane, Steve. What kind of names are those for rivers? King Thor says that they are the unforgettable kind. Now come, children. We have much work to do. We have an entire world to regrow. 
Elsewhere, though, on a planet once known as Mars, Galactus readies himself to feast on another dead world, one that King Thor has allowed him to have. As he digs into the planet's core, he says that if it wasn't for that damned black weapon, but at least now the weapon is destroyed. However, there is something beneath the planet's surface, something dark. And as the darkness overcomes Galactus, he laughs, laughs as hard as his hollow face can. For what has just been born was the Butcher of Worlds. And so begins a story for another day. There has been a question on everyone's tongue since the day a new character was introduced. Thor. But not the Thor that you know. You see, at the end of the original Sin event, and in our video for it, Thor was deemed unworthy of his Mjolnir because of something that Nick Fury said to him. And he lost control of the hammer. It landed on the moon and nobody has been able to lift it. Well, almost no one. The All-Father Odin and the All-Mother Freya both tried to no avail. All of Thor's friends even tried to no avail. And Thor himself tried for weeks to no avail. One person was able to though, a new Thor, a female Thor. But she doesn't go by the name female Thor, or even Thor Rita as Spider-Man tried to call her. She just goes by Thor, and no one knows her identity because it's one of her closely guarded secrets. The original Thor now goes by the name of Odin's son, and he wields a mighty axe. At first, he demanded to know who took his hammer, but when he saw that she was only fighting for justice, he understood why Molnir chose her and did not allow him to lift the hammer again. He does accept that she is worthy and that he isn't, but he's not done trying to fix his own worthiness and he believes that step one is to find out who this person that can wield his hammer is. If she won't tell him her identity, then he will cut through the ten realms until someone tells him. Many nights he heads back to the spot on the moon where he dropped the hammer, just to look at where it once was. Why is she worthy? Why? Odin's son's friend Volstag comes over to see if he's okay. Because thou art yelling to thyself on the moon, as he puts it. But Odin's son just turns to him. Unless you were here to tell me the name of the woman beneath Thor's helmet, I care not what you have to say, Senator Volstag. But if Volstag isn't here to discuss the new Thor, he's here to let Odin's son know Jane Foster has collapsed. You see, Jane Foster was diagnosed with breast cancer and she's been residing on Asgard under their care ever since. She is refusing any magical treatments and insisting on doing this the way that they handle it on Midgard. She is human and she will suffer as humans do because magic comes with a price. And she doesn't trust it. No matter how much Odin's son begs, she just continues to refuse. So they embrace and she asks him, are you really calling yourself Odin's son? You are so much more than your father's son. When you are well, you can call me whatever you'd like, he says as he holds her closer. I'm going to remember that, Lord Thunderbritches. As Odin's son walks away, he takes out a list, and he crosses off the name Jane Foster. This is his list of everyone who could possibly be the new Thor. And Jane is just too ill to possibly take up that role. So his next stop is Agent Coulson to demand the answer, WHO IS THOR? But Coulson doesn't know either. As a matter of fact, he was hoping that Odin's son could fill him in. And in response, Odin's son smashes his axe into Coulson's computer. Though if you need time to think about it, that's cool too, Coulson says. Where is Agent Solomon? Odin's son demands to know. Agent Solomon? She's been on leave for at least a few weeks. Wait, you don't think that she's the new Thor, do you? And Odin's son just glares at him. We could probably call her. You want to call her? Let's call her. Agent Solomon, this is Shield Command. Come in, please. Oddly enough, no one has seen Agent Solomon in about five days, ever since she went to the moon to find her hero, Thor. So what of this new Thor? What is she doing? Well, her first battles have been against Minotaur and Meliketh, and they appear to be making an alliance, so she's here to stop it. Meanwhile, the All-Mother approaches the All-Father. This is madness. Tell me that the hushed whispers of your guards are untrue. Tell me you did not put your murderous, deranged brother in control of the most dangerous weapon known to the gods. But Odin is unfazed by this accusation. Cull serves my will of late. I dare say he has shown more fealty than you have, Freya. And in response, she slaps him, but he barely flinches. 
You should not have done that. I will see that hammer return to Asgard, no matter the cost. Back with Thor, just as she's preparing to lay waste to Minotaur and Meliketh, the Destroyer lands on top of her, knocking her over. But this is Thor, do not be mistaken, and she leaps into the air prepared for battle, only to be knocked aside by the Destroyer once again. Not to be trifled with, Thor leaves back into battle and the two of them fall from the Minotaur's floating kingdom. Alas, as Thor hits the ground, she drops Mjolnir. But she looks up to see the Destroyer still pressing forward, now with Mjolnir in his hands. But need I remind you that this is Thor, and she jumps up headbutting the Destroyer. As the battle carries on elsewhere, Odin's son receives a call from his mother as he rides the skies of Midgard. She uses the magics of the Bifrost to teleport to Odin's son and inform him that his father is attempting to kill Thor. She needs his assistance and any others that he can think of. And he replies with, My axe is yours, mother, and I already hold a list of those that may fight alongside us. And Thor. Back with Thor, she's getting beat by her own hammer, but bloodied and beaten, she gets back up. That will be the last time that you ever strike me with mine own hammer. And she gets up and begins to call back Molnir. The Destroyer is not worthy, and he's only able to hold it because it's technically a machine. So Thor uses her control over Molnir to launch the Destroyer throughout the entire battlefield, bouncing him off every wall and surface there. Then, as the Goddess of Thunder, she summons the power of lightning down to throw everything at the Destroyer. The explosion is massive, and then the hammer returns to Thor, where she gives it a kiss. Good hammer. Problem is, this is the Destroyer. One of Thor's greatest enemies, and an unstoppable machine. It continues to walk forward, and Thor thinks to herself, It can't end this way. I will not be a footnote in the history of Thor. I will not be Thor for five days, and then have died. When suddenly the Bifrost opens, and out steps Odin's son, and everyone that he had on his list of potential new Thors. You will not stand alone this day, Thor. So swears Prince Odinson of Asgard. And his mother. The entire group of women that he brought with him leap into the fray, and they begin to beat down the Destroyer. And there's a lot of them. Too many for the Destroyer. All the while, Thor insists that she had this, and does not require the help. Eventually, Freya the All-Mother leaps onto the Destroyer and stabs it right in the face. Cole turns to Odin in the throne room. Uh, your wife just stabbed me in the face, if you were unaware. But the Destroyer then takes Freya by the throat and shoots another blast into the air. Odin's son and Thor both leap in to protect Lady Freya, and she looks at the Destroyer in the eyes. Do you see what you have wrought, Lord Husband? Look upon thy mighty works, the legacy of Odin. So Odin turns his head from his viewing orb. Let it go, Kull. What? Let her go and leave the battlefield. Damn you, woman, for making me the villain. With that, the Destroyer takes off and leaves everyone there. Thor thanks everyone for what they've done this day, while they begin to clean up the battlefield. Sif then turns to Thor before she leaves. You want my advice? Lose the hammer and the sidekick. Sidekick? Odinson shouts out questioningly. Both are bound to bring you naught but trouble. And Sif leaves with everyone else, leaving just Odinson and Thor. Odin's son turns to Thor. Just so that we are clear, I am not thy sidekick. No more secrets, Thor. I know who you are. You are Agent Rosalind Solomon, and if you just admit to me that you are that person, I will tell you what Nicholas Fury said to me that left me unworthy. Please, tell me the truth. Thor stumbles to find her words. I, I, when out of the blue, Agent Solomon arrives. She drops down with Odinson and Thor and starts shouting at Thor. You nearly got me killed, lady. I was on that island when you started this fight. Odinson just stands there in shock. So Thor isn't Agent Solomon? He just gawks at her, repeating, Agent Solomon? Thor sees this as her chance, and she takes off for the heavens once again, leaving Odinson standing there to talk things out with Rosalind. Thor then returns to an undisclosed location on Asgard, where she turns and throws Mjolnir off into space to await her call again. As she begins to change back into her true self, she thinks to herself that this is how it needs to be. If Odin's son and everyone really knew who she was, they would never allow her to remain as Thor. But the world needs a Thor, and that's what matters. They need a god who understands what it means to be humbled, to be mortal, 
And as the last of the magic from Molnir leaves Thor, she falls to the ground weak. And we see that Thor is in fact Jane Foster. She sits in the hospital receiving her normal chemotherapy, began as a lump in her breast, and then it spread to her lymph nodes and possibly her liver. She comes back over and over to get treatment as the doctors can't understand why the treatment isn't working. But there is a reason, just one that she can't tell them. A nurse comes in to check on Jane to make sure that she has someone to help her home and she tells them, yeah, a coworker. Jane looks up to see the weather. Roxon built a storm tracking space station, but up in the space station, the reporters began telling the weather when they are thrown down to the floor. Looking up, the reporters see that the station was hit by something, and that something is a body. Across the body is written, so begins the War of the Realms. Before anyone can figure out what that could mean, more bodies begin to fly into the space station, tearing it apart. The news cuts the feed, stating that there are minor technical difficulties, but Jane knows better, and she whispers, Molnir. The mystical hammer begins to fly towards Earth, faster than the falling space station. She goes outside to grab the hammer, thinking to herself, who knew dying could be so much fun? Iron Man watches as the satellite begins to come crashing down, and he asks Doctor Strange, how do we stop this? And Doctor Strange tells him, we don't, she does. Thor manages to stop the satellite from causing too much damage, and she helps the workers out. Iron Man then asks if she knows what could have caused it, and she responds with, I. And she flies back off. Okay then, nice chat. Thor goes into space to see all of the bodies floating around and realizes that they are elf bodies. There is one person who could possibly be behind this, Meliketh the Accursed. Thor returns to the hospital to wake up Volstagg as it's time to go back to Heidel. Jane and Volstagg are both a part of the Congress of Worlds, and Jane represents Midgard. The Light Elves begin accusing the Dark Elves of the bodies floating around in space. Jane agrees with them, but she has to tell them that she didn't see it firsthand. Thor told her about them because she's still trying to keep her identity secret. As the Congress begins pointing fingers, Jane and Volstagg can do nothing but watch as everyone tries to focus on other threats. Back in the holding cells of Asgard, Jane goes to meet Lady Freya. Freya the All-Mother was thrown in prison for acts of treason against Odin, the All-Father. Jane tells her how Meliketh has begun a war with the Light Elves, and the Congress does not know what to do because they fear what Odin may do. Before leaving, though, Freya tells her to tell Thor that her duty lies with Elfheim and the Light Elves. Thor travels to the Bifrost Bridge, but is stopped by Heimdall. He tells her that he only serves the will of the All-Father, but he is not here to stop her. They are. Thor looks back to see Cole Bronson, Odin's brother and the Minister of Justice. But while this is starting, over in the Yawning Void, the Dark Council begins to gather to discuss their next move. They know Thor will be coming for them, but they have someone who wishes to join and help them with that. That's when we see Loki step up. I say, it does feel good to be bad again. Back at the Bifrost Bridge, the battle between Thor and the Thunderguard continues, but Thor is starting to get outmatched. In a desperate move, Thor asks if the Thunderguard can do this, and she throws her hammer, and it starts bouncing and hitting all of the guards, but Cole Bronson himself deflects the attack. At that moment, all of the guards begin to throw their hammers at her, but as Cole comes in to give the final blow, he is stopped by Heimdall. Heimdall tells him, not on my bridge, and he throws Thor through the portal. Cole tells him that this is treason, and he is now under arrest. But Heimdall figured that he would just get one of the good cells before they were all taken. Thor finds herself in Alfheim, land of the Light Elves. The war between the Dark and the Light Elves continues as Meliketh watches from atop a hill. As he watches though, a crack of lightning comes down and he knows Thor has come. As they begin to figure out their plan, Amora tells them that this is a job for the Enchantress. Over in the land of the Ice Giants, Lofi, Loki's real father, stands there, looking down at his warriors, as Loki comes running up, asking, Can we finally hug it out? Like, come on! And with that, Loki convinces him to go to Alfheim. It did take a little bit of convincing, though. Just as this is going on, Thor begins to join the Light and Dark Elf fight when Loki appears before her. Loki is just here for a chat, though. The whole, Loki plays tricks and Thor hits Loki with the hammer repeatedly thing is getting a bit old. And there's some bigger problems. Odin. While not trusting, after a little back and forth, Thor tells him that they can now talk, and Loki tells her that he was sent here to see them both die. Looking up, Thor can see Bat Riders coming in carrying bombs, so she takes off and begins to call in a great storm. As the clouds begin to form, lightning begins to flow, and with a blink of an eye, VOOM! Loki looks up and he hopes that he didn't just watch the last action of Miss Thunder. Jane begins falling from the sky, reaching for Molnir. Just a little more, just a little more. And as the two of them begin to reach the ground, Thor stands tall, calling out to Melikath. This war is at an end, Queen Elsa calls out. Fetch your master, Dark Elf Dogs. Melikath begins to materialize in front of Thor and the Queen, asking how he may be of service. The Queen insists that this all needs to end, so they must talk about peace alone. Melikath agrees, but only if Thor stays out of it. As the Queen and Melikath walk off, a giant foot comes crashing down, and Thor looks up. Loki continues. Allow me to make a formal introduction. Hi, Daddy. 
Within the Queen's chambers, Elsa asks Melikith what it is that he wants for this war to come to an end. He states that he wants the land of the elves to be united, no more light and no more dark. Elsa knows that the two races could never join willingly, and the only way that this could happen would be marriage. But she's heard enough. It's time for Melikith to leave. And as she calls out for her mages, they begin to fade away. That is when Amora can be seen as one of the Queen's mages, telling them how it's going to be a lovely wedding. Outside of the castle, everyone waits to see what's happening inside, and Elsa calls out that the time for war has ended. It is now a time for peace, and to do so, herself and Melikep shall wed. Thor comes flying in, telling her that this can't happen. What spell did he cast on her? There is probably something else that you should be worried about. There's a big trial about to happen. Odin sits on his throne, and Freya is awaiting her trial, and he demands that she confess. Freya tells him that she will confess. She will confess that she has become an enabler for her husband, allowing him to become a stubborn and narrow-minded fool of a god. She continues that since he returned from the void with his brother Kull, the realm has moved on without him, and now he's become a tyrant rather than an all-father. Odin slams down, cracking the floor. I am Asgard woman, from now until the end of time. She tells him to do his worst in silencing her, but for the rest of them, he'll need many more hammers. Just outside the chambers, the Asgardians gather, holding them back as Kull and the Thunder Guards and the Destroyer, but Sif launches an attack on them. Back inside, Odin begins to sentence Freya when suddenly, a k k k k k oom Lightning begins tearing down the door, and there stands Loki and Thor. Hi, other daddy! Odin walks over to Thor, telling her to kneel, but that's kinda not what she had in mind. Odin tells her, it's about time that we put an end to all of this, which Thor agrees to. And with a powerful swing, she bashes Odin right in the face. Now the final battle can begin, the battle between Thor and Odin. The epic fight begins to make its way to the moons of Saturn, and Odin lands face first onto one of their surfaces. He then looks up at Molnir. This is all your damn fault! That's when Thor comes back with a giant piece of the moon and slams it down on Odin, telling him to yield. Take your place in the dust, in the shadows, like a relic. Odin bursts through the rocks. Yield? Did Odin yield for Ymir? Did he yield for Satur? You can ask them at hell! Back in Asgard, Sif makes her way in freeing Freya from her chains, and asks if Freya is sure on freeing Loki. Freya tells everyone that they don't have to trust Loki. He was a spy sent to the Dark Council, but trust in her. She decided this. As everyone readies themselves, Cole comes in with the Thunderguard and the Destroyer to put an end to all of this. Over on Alfheim, the marriage between Elsa and Malekith continues with them stating, I do. But after Elsa says it, she thinks to herself, does she? She begins to think back. What is she doing? Oh, gods. The priest tells Malekith that he may kiss the bride, and he responds with, there won't be any need for that. And he calls over to the guards to take her away to her cell. Malekith then toasts with everyone of the Dark Council, which realm is next? Thor and Odin continue their battle in space, with Odin finally knocking Thor into Jupiter. But before Odin can land his final attack, Thor throws her hammer into Odin. Odin, and then flies in to punch him. Down on Asgard, the Destroyer begins to corner Freya, Sif, and Loki. Freya tells Loki to find whoever's controlling the Destroyer so he can put an end to this. Loki tells Freya that she was right about Meliketh and his plans for wars across the realms, but she wasn't right about something else. Loki then takes out his dagger, and he stabs Freya in the back. Just then, Odin stops, thinking to himself, something's happened. As Loki moves through the wall, Kull waits there for him with a sword to his throat. He tells him that the queen still lives, but his blade was poisoned. So in the art of poisoning, Loki is either really bad or really good at it. Kull continues to tell him that he can go back to Melikath and tell Melikath that he can do whatever he wants. But Asgard remains off limits as long as the Borson brothers live. Loki walks off. For now, the fighting has stomped in Asgard. Odin took Freya away to his innermost sanctum, the chamber of the Odin sleep. Cole watches over the throne and Jane begins to leave, though she thinks back that no one won this civil war in Asgard, and another war lies elsewhere. There are ten realms across the world tree, all with their own wonders and terrors, but there is only one guardian who will soar above them all, and her name is Thor. Before we leave, though, we see two grunts about to tend to a prisoner who is screaming, Ah! He isn't trying to escape, but it is like he suddenly realized something horrible has happened, and that he started to scream for his mother. His mother? I guess they don't make Thors like they used to. They state this as we look past the hammer from the former Ultimate Universe, from another Thor. And that's when we see Odin's son, Thor of the Marvel Prime, bound and screaming to break free. Ah! Jane Foster secretly took up the hammer, becoming the new Thor. She entered into a fight against Odin, who refused to allow a new Thor to take the mantle. But after proving herself to everyone, except Odin, she entered into a battle to prevent a war from happening between the realms. Then, as her identity was about to be revealed, the hammer used magic that no one knew that it had, and took the form of Jane herself, allowing there to be Jane and Thor in one location. Mysteries didn't end there, though, as the hammer told Jane that it wanted to show her its origin and it took her off into the realms. In the distant reaches of space, there's a crack 
as the hammer pulls Thor through. At rocketing speeds, it slams into a building, tearing down a wall and showing Thor a library. The man that can only be assumed to be the librarian floats down towards them, demanding to know why Thor would come crashing through his wall before answering his own question. A Thor is too arrogant to use the door. Thor inquires as to where they are currently located as she looks at all of the books in all, and the librarian informs her, we are in the heaven of heavens, in the center of infinity, home of the parliament of pantheons, and the high holy court. Built four billion years ago by the first of the elder gods as a place of divine fellowship and governance. Looking around, continuing her awestruck look, Thor can't believe the amount of gods that are here. And the librarian asks her, Tell me, girl, why are you here? Maintaining his stern gaze, the librarian looks at the hammer as Thor tells him that she believes it to be alive. Much to the surprise of Thor, the librarian snickers and tells her to follow him. He pulls out a book from the deepest and darkest reaches of the library, a place only a single candle is keeping lit. Thor looks at the book's title as the librarian reads it to her, The Storm. He then reads her the story of bloodshed and war that began eons ago. A time when a young warrior named Ulick united the clans of rock trolls and invaded the realm of the dwarves. It would have been a short-lived battle if not for Odin, the Allfather leading the armies of Asgard to the fight. He didn't do it to save the dwarves, but instead he saved their mines and their forges. He, of course, won with great ease. To pay him back, the dwarves presented him with a gift, a token of their appreciation, a nugget of raw Uru, the rarest of all of the mystical metals in the realms. It was so strong, in fact, that it was unsmeltable, and even the dwarves' forges could not craft it into a weapon. Odin looked upon his rock and felt that it was fitting. Whenever he would look upon this utterly useless thing, he would be reminded of the dwarves. The rumor is that Uru is a relic from the creation of the universe, a piece of the rock of creation itself. But it is not the only thing that survived all of this time. No, there was also the storm. And it also went by the name the God of Tempest or the Mother of Thunder. When the space sharks fled an area, you knew that it was coming. But if you waited for that, it was far too late. This is a sentient superstorm in space. And one day that storm's judgment was to come to Asgard. The Asgardians knew not what to do. While they had won many a battle, they had never faced a storm itself. Luckily, Odin was the Allfather and the battle raged for many days. In the end, it was the Odin force that won out. And the Allfather had trapped the entire storm within a worthless piece of rock gifted to him by the dwarves. He returned the gift to the dwarves with one demand, that they forge it into a mighty weapon, the mightiest! And thus the hammer of Thor was created, the thunder weapon. Except the storm raged inside of the hammer, and it refused to allow the one who had trapped it to tame it. While he had won in the end, he had lost, because he could not wield the hammer without massive amounts of destruction. And so Odin locked it away inside of his vault until the day that it would find another. One that the storm itself deemed worthy. The librarian closed his book as Thor asked him if the hammer was actually alive. But sadly, he told her, Perhaps it was once, but not even the mightiest of storms could have survived that long trapped in that hammer. Thor reached out for it, telling him that it spoke to her, and then, as she grasped its handle, it rocketed her off into space again to bring her to parts unknown. A war is brewing, and she is needed to be in it. The librarian knew that it was coming, along with death and destruction. The journey of Thor is only truly beginning. What happened to Odin's son, the name that he goes by now? The original, Thor. He went off on a drinking binge, which eventually ended with him being lost in space. No one has seen him, and in the unknown vastness of space, aboard a ship bound for who knows where, somebody is not having a good day. Odin's son thinks back on the days long past in his life, days that were spent racing comets from one end of the cosmos to another, with thunder and hammers as his only comrades. He is no longer that god, however, now. He is unworthy. Now his days are spent fighting, with fist and foot and teeth if that's required. Every day he fights and he fails and he fights again. Aliens of different shapes and sizes tackle him and he fights back with all of his considerable strength. More of the aliens arrive and their weapons crackle with energy. Odin's son is brought down as they shock him over and over again. And as he struggles to stand, Odin's son remembers a time when he would have tossed these men aside with a swing of his hammer. And he vows that that time will come again. He swears it by the gods. He stretches out his hand, reaching for a hammer. Three months earlier on the moon, cold and desolate, Odin's son stands upon it, overlooking a crater, pouring a drinking horn of mead down his throat. Strange reports of vandalized and half-eaten satellites have brought him here. Should anything but I rise from this crater, eat it. 
Odinson commands his mighty Asgardian goat, Tooth Nasher, and then he leaps into it. He lands with a crash and he's met by a horde of trolls. Let us skip the banter and start with a smiting. Odinson states as he pulls free Jarnbjorn from his back and he leaps into battle. But before he can strike the troll, he is struck down by Ulik, the king of trolls. Ulik taunts him. A Thor without a hammer is like a snake without fangs. A little more than a worm. I am without a hammer, but not without fangs, Odinson replies as Tooth Nasher rams Ulik from behind, throwing the mighty troll away, allowing Odinson to hack and slash his way through the group of trolls. Tooth Nasher is thrown past Odinson, who promises Ulik that he will pay for laying hands on his goat. With a laugh, Ulik brings the walls of the crater down upon Odinson, burying him and allowing the trolls a chance to escape. I may not be the god that I once was, yet I am still the son of Odin, thinks Odinson as he lifts the stones with his bare hands. I can handle one paltry moon. The trolls begin to escape, sailing away into space, and Odinson throws his axe with his considerable strength. It sails through the air, and it misses, spinning off into the unknown vastness of deep space. The trolls laugh, and they sail away. Odinson stands defeated, his shoulders slumping down as he slides to the ground, and he remembers that this is where it happened. This is where he fell. This is where he became unworthy. There is another. The stranger in a black cloak, wrapped in chains, tells Odinson, Who are you? Once there was a watcher, now there is only me. I am the unseen. I see all. The stranger speaks in riddles, telling Odinson about past events, and he tells him once again, There is another. Another hammer. The hammer of a dead world and a dead Thor. The stranger tells Odinson where his hammer can be found, and without hesitation, Odinson mounts Tooth Nasher and rides through the heavens of old Asgard, where the gods once dwelt. Odinson pulls up short of Asgard, where it once was, and he discovers that there is nothing but asteroids floating in its empty space. He stares in disbelief until he's disturbed by a crack of thunder and lightning, and before him stands his old friend, Beta Ray Bill. I know where it was taken. I know who stole it. Before Odinson can ask any more questions, Beta Ray kneels before him. Odinson has lost his hammer, so Beta Ray begs him to take his, the mighty Stormbringer. Stormbringer, forged by Odin himself with the power to rival even that of Molnir, forged and gifted to the mighty warrior Beta Ray Bill. Take my hammer, please, Thor. It would be my honor, begs a kneeling Beta Ray. Rise, my friend. No longer am I Thor, and Stormbringer belongs to you. Odinson believes himself to not even be worthy of Beta Ray's friendship. Beta Ray knows who has stolen old Asgard, yet before he can speak the name of the thief, he is attacked by enemy ships from space. By them? By them. Let us have words with these thieves. And with all of his considerable strength, Odinson throws his mighty axe at one of the enemy ships, destroying it to one blow. The two mighty warriors leap into battle, and Beta Ray calls upon the power of Stormbringer, smashing the ships with lightning. As their battle rages on, Beta Ray points to the starship in the distance, indicating that that is where old Asgard has been taken, and without hesitation, Odinson rides towards the ship on Tooth Nasher, while Beta Ray yells for him to wait. On board the ship, they shout that they approach, and in the distance, a meek speck in the vast room that houses a giant spear is the master of the vessel. Reaching out his hand, he turns on a switch on the massive sphere. Open the bay doors, he orders, and the sphere floats into space and is calm. A massive explosion erupts from the sphere, throwing Odinson off of Tooth Nasher. Odinson dreams. He dreams of hammers that are crushing him beneath the weight of his unworthiness. He dreams of whispers. He dreams of a figure shrouded in a living darkness. He awakens to find himself chained in a massive room, surrounded by strange creatures locked away in small cages. And before him sits his captor, the Collector. You have tried to put me in a cage before, Collector. But the Collector tells him that he is not putting him in a cage, he is taking him home. He drops Odinson into the once mighty realm of old Asgard. Why still Asgard? questions Odinson. Not Asgard, but what resides in it? Odinson is stunned at what he sees, and he finds a massive hammer laying in a crater with a familiar inscription on the side. By Odin's beard, there is another. The Collector looks at him and he tells him, Tell me how to pick it up. And Odinson refuses. A child then walks out of the prison and the Collector tells him, Tell me how to lift the hammer or watch him die. Then begins to count. Five. You fool, you must be worthy, Odinson exclaims as the count continues. Four. Odinson, please. Three. Then he threatens. Two. I will kill you for this, Collector. One. With a crack of thunder, lightning explodes from the hammer, destroying the man threatening the prisoner. 
Energy crackles around Odinson as he walks towards it, showing him images of another Thor from another realm. An ultimate Thor that fought with the same fury and thunder in his veins. Odinson reaches out his hand and he is shot from behind by the Collector. The hammer will be mine, Odinson. Every day, Odinson battles the men of the Collector, striving for the hammer of the ultimate Thor. He reaches out his hand and he is struck down, for there are far too many. They stand over him victorious, dragging him back to his cell. As he finds himself once more in his cage, he hears a voice. Hey, Boybeard, let me eat some of your fingers. Calls a voice from the cell next to him. All you can do is lose at fighting. Don't need fingers for that. The voice belongs to a rather angry hellhound known across the Ten Realms as Death Ripper, the Devil Dog, whose actual name is Thori. You're bad at escaping, Thori notes, and there's no way off of this ship. Odinson pulls at his chains. I do not have to make it off of the ship. I just need to reach my hammer. He breaks the chains of these, and he throws himself at the energy bars of the cell. Here we go again, the guards note, but before they can react, the lightning courses through them, and Beta Ray Bill stands amiss to the crackling lightning. Odinson, my brother, are you ready to summon the thunder? Beta Ray had also been imprisoned, but he managed to escape and find the mighty Stormbringer. With a powerful swing, he destroys the bars that impede Odin's son. Let Thori out! I'll murder for you! Lots and lots of murder! Beta Ray has seen old Asgard and the hammer, and he offers to lead Odin's son to it. But with a mention of the hammer, Odin's son gets a murderous look at his eyes, and he leaves at Beta Ray! The hammer is mine! Beta Ray tries to defend himself while pleading with Odin son, who is overcome by warrior madness. Odin son knows that he has overcome with the Berserker Rage, yet he can't stop himself from throwing Beta Ray across the bill, causing him to drop the Stormbringer. In his rage, Odin son reaches out for it. Long Longing to be whole again, longing to be Thor! But before he can, Proxima Midnight knocks him away. And Black Swan attacks Beta Ray, and the two warriors gather themselves, and Beta Ray calls his mighty hammer to him. Are you ready, Odin's son? A growl is Odin's son's reply. Before the battle can continue, the mysterious cloaked figure teleports the disciples of Thanos away, leaving the two warriors alone. However, in the ship, the collector stands with his men staring at the mighty hammer. Each day, the storm surrounding the hammer grows more powerful, and soon it will destroy the entire ship. And the Collector does not care. Suddenly, Thanos' disciples attack the Collector, claiming the hammer for Thanos himself. And while they fight, the mysterious cloaked individual slips quietly towards it, reaching for the hammer. Thunder crashes and lightning strikes, cutting everyone off from the power. Odin's son grabs his axe and he strides through the ship with his goat, Tooth Nasher, the Hellhound Thori, and Beta Ray Bill at his side. I do not need a hammer to raise hell. This day, I claim one nonetheless. So swears the unworthy Thor. Black Swan walks through the raging storm that surrounds the hammer from the Ultimate Universe. However, before she can reach it, a bolt of lightning throws her away. Those who wish to wield the hammer stand around it, unable to reach it, when from the storm steps Odin's son. I have come to claim what is mine. Stand aside or be ready to bleed. He is just as unworthy as the rest of us. Kill him, declares the mysterious cloaked figure, and the battle rages on. Thor swings his mighty axe and uses his Uru-made arm as a shield against the attacks of Proxima Midnight. Beta Ray Bill throws Stormbringer at Black Swan, promising her a jail cell next to Thanos, and the Collector runs as Tooth Nasher chases him through the air. Thori stands ready to face the mysterious cloaked stranger, and he calls out, What are you doing here? Stand down, Doc, I command you. And with an eruption of flames from his mouth, he shouts, You command nothing! After a final blow knocks Proxima Midnight to the ground, Odinson strides away through the storm to stand before the mighty hammer at last. Will it feel it? Will it whisper? Chains wrap around his neck before he can even grasp the handle. It's mine, Odinson! You all are! The Collector shouts as he lifts Odinson away, and Odinson swings his axe, slicing through the chains, dropping back down to the ground. He frees Tooth Nasher, and he continues to fight, and the Collector continues to rant. Everyone is my property! He looks just in time to see Odinson knock him through the air, and they both tumble to the ground. Long ago, Thor was brought low by a whisper to rise again to be worthy. He needs to be stronger than whispers, and finally he reaches out, because he also needs a hammer. That, which began with a whisper, now ends with thunder! Energy crackles as he grasps the hammer. I feel it, even if it comes from a universe that I'll never know. The hammer still knows me. Do it, Odin's son! Beta Ray calls out. For he is Thor, the god of thunder, and he hears the thunder in his ears, and this is not my hammer. And he releases it. The disciples of Thanos stand over, looking at Odin's son. We're taking the hammer to Thanos. This is not my hammer, but it is a hammer of a Thor, and it won't be going anywhere with the likes of you. The energy crackles around Odinson as he bellows, raising his fist into the air, and he brings it down with the power of lightning, throwing his enemies far and away, riding the lightning out of the Collector's ship. 
The hammer belongs to me, and you're going back to your cage, Asgardian. The collector yells out as he pulls himself from the rubble that is his ship. He is shocked to see Thori leading the other prisoners away from their now empty cages. I am not taking the hammer, but I am taking back my home. Odin's son says as he lifts the collector and throws him off of the ledge. How will we return to Asgard? Questions Beta Ray. Yet there is no need. Energy once again ripples from the mighty hammer, and the old Asgard disappears. Old Asgard is once again where it should be, and Odin's son and Beta Ray Bill stand together. Odin's son knows that this is not his hammer to lift. The hammer will call to its owner, as his call to the new Thor. Do you believe in your worthiness again? Questions Bill. No god is worthy. That was the meaning of the whisper that brought Thor down. Gods are vain and vengeful. They are unworthy of the worship that humans bestow upon them. Odin's son no longer carries his hammer because he truly believes this. So the two warriors rest for the day and they drink. No hammers were lifted, yet the battle was won and the sagas ended. Yet, it is not at an end. Days pass and the hammer sits, and from the darkness someone comes. They have heard the whispers of the hammer as lightning strikes when they reach out and take hold. For it is now time for War Thor! The gods of Asgard have many enemies, as gods often do. But even the boldest of them know better than to attack the Golden City, for those walls are guarded by the all-seeing eye of Heimdall. It is said that he could see a single maggot in a field of freshly fallen snow a thousand worlds away. Even though he can see things galaxies away, he must blink. And if one were simply fast enough to cross that vast space in a blink of an eye, well, as Heimdall would say, no. Suddenly, a powerful force shoots across the skies into Heimdall, and a voice tells him to stand down. His fight is not with him. As Heimdall stands back up, he tells the being that he knows him. He's observed his exploits from across the spaceways. It was thought that he was supposed to be one of honor. And Gladiator floats back down, telling him that he has been called many things, but today, he is the Magister of the Shi'ar, and currently on a mission from its gods. While Heimdall battles with the Gladiator, there is another pounding sound, but coming from Jane Foster's door in the residential halls of Asgardia. Jane opens the door to see Cole, and as she thinks that this should be good, she asks him what she can do for him today. Cole says that even though she is supposed to be representing her beloved little mud ball, she has been absent from the Congress of Worlds nine days this month. He has come here to inform her that as of now, she currently has two options regarding her stay here. Either rid herself of this pesky cancer or forfeit her seat in the Congress. If she is to fail to do either of these, or if she finally has the decency to spare them of her pathetic suffering and die, a replacement will come to take her place. As Cole leaves, Jane shouts that this isn't over. The Congress won't stand for! But before she can finish, she cuts her off telling her that she overestimates the number of friends that she has there. At that moment, a guard runs up to Cole, telling him that they just received word that there has been a disturbance at the Bifrost, as Guardia is under attack. Jane goes back to her room looking at Molnir, stating that she knows that it's killing her. But she's glad to see it, because she suddenly feels like hitting something really, really hard. Back at the front gates, Cole runs in shouting for Heimdall to report what has just happened. What sort of enemy would dare to try and face the immovable Heimdall? Heimdall pushes a rock that was on top of him, stating, The unstoppable kind. Everyone looks up to see Gladiator standing there, and just as they spot him, he radios back to go ahead and open up the Stargate. Pink lights begin to shine as beings start to appear, and Cole calls out to all of the Thunder Guards to ready themselves. They are being invaded! Gladiator tells them, no, you are being conquered. Within only a few moments, Gladiator's forces begin to swarm around Asgardia, laying waste to everything in sight. The warriors of Asgard fight, but their combined strength is no match for the Gladiator's invasion. Cole manages to land a blow on Gladiator's son, Kubark, resulting in Gladiator turning his entire focus on him. But before Gladiator can save his son, a giant bolt of lightning strikes and Jane floats there telling them, Whatever this is, it is just now ended. Gladiator looks at her, telling her that she is correct, and then radios back to ready the neuro cell. As Kubark is taken away, Gladiator then turns his attacks to Jane Foster Thor, easily knocking her through the buildings. Thor tries to fight back, but just like the others, her strength is nowhere close to the Gladiator's. He picks her up from the rubble, radioing back to the power of the teleporters to engage now, and the same pink light surrounds the two of them, and they vanish. In a short while later, Jane begins to open up her eyes, asking where are they? Before her is Gladiator kneeling, telling her that this place is Mukron Palace. Now kneel. Kneel before the gods of the Shi'ar and pray for mercy. She looks right at the two glowing white gods and says that if they were looking for someone to kneel, they have abducted the wrong god. The husband, Kathari, says no. They do believe that they have the right god. And his wife, Shara, tells Jane that her arrogance and discootness confirms it. 
Catharis then says that they are Shara and Cathari, the Star Mother and the Father of Light, creators of all space and time, supreme deities for the one true cosmic chosen people. They breathe nebula to lie, weep comets, and speak with the voice of a quadrillion supernovas. And today, they will teach her what it truly means to be a god. Jane walks up the steps asking what do they wish to teach her. Just three days ago, she was holding a mortal woman as she died of cancer that ravaged her brain. And all she could do was pray. There are so many gods spread across the cosmos, ones who boast about their own majesty and almightiness. Yet, where is that woman now? What heaven? does she reside in? She resides in none of them because no god bothered to listen or care. Now the only thing that she wishes to know now is why is she even here? She has done nothing to the Shi'ar yet. Shara begins to say that they wish to challenge her to A, but before she can finish, Jane walks off telling them, my answer is no. Now if you'll excuse me, and even if you don't, Gladiator says that she may want to listen. Currently they have three Shi'ar super destroyers aimed at the Earth's orbit, heavily cloaked and fully armed. If she does not answer this challenge, they have orders to obliterate the entire planet. He is sorry to say, but he is honor bound to. And in a flash, Cathari rushes forward, grabbing Gladiator by the throat, slamming him to the ground, asking, you care to apologize to her? As the two deities begin to beat on the Gladiator, Jane begins to conjure up her lightning, telling them, this ends now or I will end you. The lightning bends around them and Shara walks up, punching through it and into Jane. And as Jane starts to get back up, an alien walks up, stating that he is afraid that he is going to have to insist that they follow proper protocol here. The alien then introduces himself as Shadrach and says that the trial of combat isn't scheduled until round 17. He is here from the omnipotent city to officiate this challenge of the gods. So shall they go ahead and get started? Later, high above the Shi'ar throne world of Shandalar, the first challenge is set to begin. Kathari says that on this world, they are revered and worshipped by 18 billion souls who call this planet home. Here, they will show the true power that a god can wield. Shara shouts that that is enough talk. Now they battle as gods do, with the challenge of natural disasters. Jane takes a moment to think about it, and as she starts to understand, she watches a giant tidal wave form on the planet's coast. The citizens below all begin to run and scream, asking for Shara and Kathari to save them. And Jane asks, why would you do this? Kathari tells her that because even after thousands, maybe millions, die for no discernible reason whatsoever, they will still flock to their shrines to worship us. But as the two gods continue to praise themselves, Jane takes it upon herself to try and save everyone. Before the wave can come crashing down, she creates a whirlwind, sucking the water up and placing it into a seat. Shara shouts, that is not how you play this game! And Kathari says that she has forfeited. They have won! They have proven that they are the superior gods! Shatrax says, actually, I wouldn't be so sure about that. The people below are all praising Thor now. Meanwhile, at the edge of the Shi'ar-controlled space, the patrol ships begin to pick up something. Their ships are suddenly attacked and the commander asks what hit them. Are they being attacked by weapons that can pierce shields? And the operator says, actually, it would appear it's something called arrows. And Cole shouts for the archers to ready another volley. For the rest, prepare to board their ships. Back with the trials though, Shara and Kathari continue to display their power, showing how even if they destroy their own followers, they will still be loved. And each time they attempt to kill the civilians, Jane is there to stop them, shouting that she doesn't care if she has to forfeit the wrong, just end this madness. After one last trial, one where Jane couldn't save the people, she flies up, begging that they stop the plagues, the floods, the brimstone, all of it. Let them finish this with a trial of combat. And Shara laughs, telling her that she truly wishes the honor of facing them, that she must first survive the challenge of ultimate judgment. Jane shouts that if that means that she can end this farce, then I, she... Shadrach then stops her whispering that she doesn't understand. They cannot unleash the ultimate judgment she wouldn't survive. None of them would. A being then appears before Shara and Cathari. As Jane begins to wonder how she came into this position, we see a few days ago, we see how this thing happened. A being appeared before Shara and Cathari, telling them, Not a single god respects you or fears you. Dare I say, most of them don't even know you exist. But there is one who is prey to. And Loki smiles as he tells them, Thor, everywhere they pray to Thor. Trust me, for Loki knows. As Loki turns to leave, he tells Melikath that he knows that he's listening. This was easier than they imagined, so go ahead and open up the Black Bifrost and bring him to Jutenheim. Back in the current times, as Shara and Cathari watch as Thor tries to protect everyone, they laugh, telling her that her score will never catch up to theirs. When suddenly Molnir shoots into the chamber, cracking them both in the head, and Jane walks up telling them that there will be no more challenges. With a hammer in hand, she slams it to the ground, splitting it, telling them that she knows not why they hate her, and at this point she no longer cares. They want to challenge, then fine, she challenges them to stop her from beating them senselessly. 
But before Jane can make her way up the broken stairs, Kathari blasts her away, stating that it is over. They have won. Shara then turns to Shadrach, telling them to do it. Unleash the ultimate judgment. Shadrach clutches his pendant quietly, asking why couldn't Gore have killed them instead of his friends. And the pendant responds that this is Omnipotent City. Priority request received. Jane gets back up shouting that she is done with mercy and now she only speaks with thunder. Shara tells her that her thunder will not be enough and as Jane bashes Shara in the face, she tells her that it is a good thing that she brought Ura then. At the same moment, Gladiator and Kabark are knocked through the walls into the hall and Kabark says that he can't feel anything, especially his face. Seconds later, Cole crashes in on a longboat shouting to Shara and Kathari, prepare to make peace with your fears. Jane looks up asking why is he here and Cole tells her saving her life by the looks of it. She then asks why and Cole says, because no one but me can pry that hammer from your cold dead hands. Lightning begins to swirl around the hammer and Jane says that there is no one who is going to be prying it from her just yet. At least not until she has rammed it down the Shiar's throat a few hundred times. Cole laughs, telling her that now she is finally talking like an Asgardian. And Kathari tells them, look, you've brought friends. Maybe now this challenge of the gods will actually be challenging. Meanwhile, on a nameless world, somewhere in the darkest corners of the cosmos, a raging fire burns and from its pits, a hand reaches up, clawing its way out. Down on Earth, a young boy sits on a small island, stating how it may come as a shock, but the people of this planet are unmitigated idiots. The island begins to rumble, and Quinton, the Omega-level telepath, tells the sentient island Krakoa that he knows what he is thinking, literally. This place is just boring. Suddenly, a magical portal opens up and Jane and Kubark step out. Kubark tells Quentin that the universe needs his help, and yes, he's just as surprised by that as he is. Quentin hardly acknowledges them, telling them, Right, sounds fun. Now get off my island. Jane asks, This is the savior that you spoke of? We're wasting our time here. Quentin gets up telling the group that he would love to help them with whatever, but he doesn't. So if they could leave, he'll talk to himself in peace. Jane says they can no longer carry on. They should be back stopping the Phoenix from destroying the... But before she could finish, Quentin says, Wait, 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 wait. Did you say the Phoenix? Just hours before that, the battle between the Asgardians and the Shi'ar had begun. As they fought, Shadrach stopped everyone, stating that they must not fight. A challenge has been made, and that challenge has a victor. The winner is Thor. Everyone in the room stops, and both Shara and Kathari ask how this is even possible. Thor has forfeited most of the challenges. Shadrach then says yes. Thor did fail miserably in those challenges. She was awarded extra points in the end, though, something that the record keepers of Omnipotent City have never recorded before. Thor inspired other gods to fight in her defense. They crossed the cosmos to wage war in her name. Cole begins to state that that is not the case. We came here because we were humiliated. But Sif tells him to shut it or he shall eat her sword. In a fit of rage, Kathari shouts to Gladiator, telling him to alert the battle cruisers that they are in Earth's orbit and have them fire at once. Gladiator tells them, actually, after all I've seen today, I don't think I can do that. Before Kathari could unleash his holy wrath, Shara stops them, stating that none of them deserve to live in their universe. Now kiss her, kiss her, and end all creation. As the fires of their love burn, Shara and Kathari call upon the great force in the Shi'ar pantheon, the sister of sorts to the gods. Though once she is summoned, only death and destruction follow. She is called Falcon, the world destroyer, the Phoenix. Jane can feel it just as the hammer does, the feeling that the cosmos itself is burning and she must stop it. As Jane flies out to face the phoenix, she is knocked back into the palace, and Shara and Kathari laugh at her attempts to save everyone. Just as the laughing gets louder, Gladiator punches Kathari, and Shara turns to him, and just before she can do anything, Kubark flies in, punching her! Both of the two gods are now defeated, and everyone wonders what they do now. There is no way of stopping the phoenix, and Kubark tells everyone that he wouldn't say that. He knows a guy. Now, back in the current time, everyone rides on Cole's longboat, as Jane asks Quentin, if he has any experience with the Phoenix Force. Quentin says, yeah, sort of. Well, in the future I will. I'm kind of destined to wield the power of the Phoenix someday, assuming that that future actually comes to fruition. Cull says, never mind the pink-haired will. The Destroyer will deal with this tiny fire pigeon. And a second later, the Destroyer is defeated. Quentin tells Cull, as metal as the Destroyer sounds, nothing can destroy the Phoenix because the Phoenix is destruction. Jane grips her hammer, telling them that they shall die trying. And Quentin says, most likely, but hey, at least I'm not bored now. Everyone jumps on the longboat in an effort to try and hurt the phoenix, but one does not simply hurt something like that. Jane shouts that her hammer blows have no effect. How do they even fight a creature of living fire? Quentin fires his psychic shotgun, telling her, you don't. Even I can't get through to it. The only way we can stop it is to commune with it directly. At that moment, Jane sees the world turning white and her without her hammer. As Jane asks, where is she? The phoenix tells her, that is a foolish question. 
But then again, you are one of the most foolish creatures that I have ever encountered. The phoenix goes on. I have brought you here in your dying little form to have a conversation and make you an offer. One to ease you of your many heavy burdens. Well, of one very particularly heavy burden. Jane thinks about it and asks her hammer. The phoenix wants the hammer. The phoenix tells her, if you wish to save the other gods from my flames, then all you must do is hand over Mjolnir. Just holding it is killing you, is it not? Allow that burden to be lifted. Jane says, wait. She wants to eat the hammer, doesn't she? Consume the power of the god Tempest, because she is afraid of it. Then it would seem that the phoenix is wrong about her being a fool. Phoenix punches Jane, shouting that she was trying to help her. She offered her a chance to die with dignity. There shall be not another chance, only suffering. At that moment, the hammer appears in her hand, and Jane swings it, asking if you want to eat it, you can take a bite. And back outside, the phoenix screams in pain as Quentin asks how she did it. Then says, you know what? Never mind. Just do whatever that was again. Jane gathers all of Mjolnir's strength, stating that she will not die in her bed. She will die like a god. And while Jane releases the powers of the space hurricane, Quentin's vision changes and he enters the white world. The phoenix looks at him asking, what do you think you're doing here? It is not time for you yet. You are not ready to be my avatar. Quentin tells her, no, definitely not. Which is why what I'm about to do is going to really piss off a whole bunch of people. And that's just one reason you're going to want to say yes. Outside, Jane continues to struggle with the flames, telling the hammer to hold strong. The phoenix fears them. The voice then tells her, nay, it is not about the hammer or the axe. It is about Thor. Thor Odinson rides his goat down, telling them, that just one Thor was a pain in her fiery hindquarters. Good luck dealing with two! Thor releases a storm, and between the two of them, they begin to tear the phoenix apart. As the storm begins to take over, Thor notices that there is something else here. Another voice telling him, yeah, you might say that. Quentin appears before them, imbued with the power of the phoenix, and as the cosmos was saved from total destruction, the Asgardian gods have returned to what they do best, celebrating their victory. However, the celebration was short-lived, as the time for the Congress of Worlds to meet comes. Call tells Jane that her time is up. He has given her until the end of the week to get rid of her cancer or resign. Volstagg tries to tell Jane that it's okay, but Jane says, actually, Cole's right. Her health has begun to affect her job performance, and her condition is not improving. Though she is resigning, a replacement has already been found, and they will find that she is well prepared for the job. She would like to introduce the Congress of Worlds to Rosalind Solomon, agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. Rosalind flies down telling them, sure, she'll be one of their space senators. And as Jane leaves the Congress, she finds Thor Odin's son beating on the doors of his mother's chambers. Jane tells him that Odin hasn't allowed anyone inside for weeks, and Odin's son shouts that he was not asking for permission! Is she even still alive in there? Jane says that his mother was alive when they last saw her, though it was in a comatose state. Thor then asks, was it truly Loki who stabbed her? But before even allowing Jane to answer, he turns back beating on the door. She stops him, telling him to look. She's got a story of her own that she needs to tell him. Something that she should have told him before. He might want to sit down for this one. And just as the threat of the phoenix has subsided for now, there is still something else coming. The Mangog. The ultimate judgment. They say once awoken, nothing that lives, nothing that breathes, can hope to stay its wrath. And they are right! While one threat has been stopped, another arises within the Ten Realms. War is coming, and it has been slowly affecting each of the World Tree's branches. Alfheim is one of the realms recently hit, forcing the Light Elves to take refuge in Nidalvair, the land of the dwarves. Among the Skolheim Mountains, the portal opens up as the senators of Solomon, Milkmane, and Volstag step out. A voice calls to them, telling them that their king, Etri, regrets that he could not make it as he is busy working in the forges. The dwarf before them is Stonefoot, the son of Leadbeard, son of Wartknuckle. He will be their guide in these troubling times. As Stonefoot begins to lead the group to camp, Volstagg says that he thought that there would be a welcoming feast, and Stonefoot tells him that dwarves do not bother with such nonsense. After a few more minutes of walking, Stonefoot says that they are here. For the first time in many worm returns, the war has come to Nidalvaya. War in the form of the Light Elf refugees. Everyone looks around to see the shabby tents filling the entire chasm, all with wounded elves of all ages. Stonefoot begins walking down, stating that the dwarves honor ancient treaties and take in the Light Elves, but they are struggling to feed them all. Nidalvair is not a land of the plenty. Unless they are referring to the ore, there is plenty of ore. For years, the dwarves traded with Elfheim for food, but Meliketh burned all of the fields, leaving them little to eat. Milkmane shouts that the other realms must know of what is happening to his people. Meliketh must answer for his war crimes. Rosalind adds that the Congress of Worlds will do all that they can to help these elves as soon as possible. If they won't, shield will. 
That she can promise. But while Rosalind and Milkmane talk with Stonefoot, some of the children run up to Volstag asking if he's going to eat the entire sack full of food. Volstag says, well, I did have a rather large breakfast now that I think about it, so how about you help yourselves to what I have left over? The kids all begin to eat and Volstag tells them, consider this an appetizer. I'll have my wife Grunron make some goose egg omelets for all of you and your families. At that moment, everyone hears a horn blaring and a sudden blast of fire hits the campsite. Milkmane screams that his people are defenseless. What are they going to? But Roslyn stops him calling out to Heimdall to activate the Bifrost and get them all out of here. Another blast hits the ground, knocking everyone away, and Volstag gets up as he sees the tents on fire. The children run up with tears in their eyes, telling him, They are sorry. They lost all the food. Please don't be mad at them. Volstag tells them, Do not worry. And then he calls for Heimdall to get them out of there. With no answer, the children ask, who are you talking to? And Volstag says, I have a friend in the sky. I fear that the smoke is blocking his vision is all. Meanwhile, at old Asgard, Jane steps up to the Bifrost, stating that she knows that he's there. And he's angry. Please allow her to explain. Odinson asks, what is there to explain, Senator Foster? Or should I call you Mighty Thor? Jane says that she wanted to tell him how he deserved to know and hear it from her while she's still alive. And Odinson tells her, I've heard it. Now you can go. Before leaving, Jane looks at the ultimate Thor's Mjolnir stating that she's heard about what he went through to keep it safe from Thanos and the Collector. Why didn't he try lifting it? If you're curious about that story, it's the unworthy Thor storyline. And as she says that, she says that she's afraid of not lifting the hammer, but afraid of the next time that she does, she won't be able to put it down. The cancer is spreading with no signs of slowing down. Being a part of the Congress of Worlds has given her some purpose as Jane Foster, and now that she doesn't have a seat anymore, Jane Foster will be forgotten. If she picks up the hammer, she would stay the Goddess of Thunder forever. She's afraid of losing her, but before she could finish, there's a loud explosion and Mjolnir slams down into the ground. Jane looks at the hammer, stating that if it's here, there must be trouble in Nidavire. She turns to run to the hammer, but as she does, her frail body collapses and her vision begins to fade. Back at the land of the doors, Volstead carries the children, telling them that they have nothing to fear. Soon they will be in his hold in Asgardiel for omelets and a nice long nap. But as Volstead continues on, there's another explosion, and that's when he sees the Firefly Rider loaded with maggot bombs. The rider shouts out, All hail the Queen of Cinders! and activates the bomb, and the blast washes over the area, burning everything in its path even Godflesh. The only thing there to protect from the Muselvalheim fire is the blood of the fire goblins. As Rosalind runs up to check on Volstagg, she finds him covered head to toe in fire goblin blood and no children. Later at old Asgard, Volstagg walks out of the Bifrost, a shell of the former man that he was. The things that he has seen, he has not slept, nor has he closed his eyes or even eaten a bite. He hasn't heard the voice of his wife or his friends or his children. He watches their lips move, but no sounds come out, for all he can hear is the roar of the fire and something calling to him. A hammer. And as Volstagg puts his hand on the ultimate Thor's hammer, he knows no storm will put out this blaze. Only blood. Behold, War Thor! Back in the land of the dwarves, Cinder's riders continue to lay waste upon the realm when they suddenly see a storm brewing. And the riders shout, All hell, the Queen of Cinders, all hell! But then a loud booming sound of thunder can be heard, and the crack of lightning shoots down! The riders look up to see War Thor standing before them, lightning striking all around him! The clouds begin to twist, and the destructive force of lightning hits the riders, striking them all to the ground in seconds. A giant firebug roars, and Volstagg asks, You wanted war. I will be your war. Volstagg throws the hammer, and it shoots through the air and into the giant bug. As the hammer returns to War Thor's hands, he jumps into a group of riders, stating that it will be the last war that you have ever fought. Volstagg was known as the god whose hunger was legendary. His hunger could never be sated, no matter how much he consumed. The War Thor hungers as well, and the more that he feasts on blood and the wails of his enemies, the hungrier he grows. As Volstagg continues on his rampage, he is hit in the back with a green blast, and a voice asks, what do we have here? And the Enchantress states, another Thor? Ulrich says that at least this one has a beard. We should just kill him anyway. The Enchantress releases another blast, but Volstagg deflects it. He gets back up throwing his hammer at the Enchantress, and Ulrich charges in, asking, How well can you block Fiss? As Ulrich punches into Volstagg's head, there's a loud crack, and Ulrich pulls back, asking, How did you crack my knuckle duster? What in the hell of that beard made of? Volstagg then punches him again, telling him, It is made of rage! Volstagg picks Ulrich up, and he begins to beat on him, stating, I have made of war, little troll, all because of monsters like you. Through the blood in his mouth, Ulrich says, The one you want is Cinder. And Volstagg tells him, I know, her time will come. 
But right now, King Ulrich, it is your time. Ulrich manages to free himself, shouting that his legions of trolls will tear that blasted beard off. And Volstagg tells him, Very well. My fists will have their fill of your wretched blood. Now the hammer will feed. Volstagg lifts the hammer above his head, and as he brings it down, Enchantress calls out to the Black Bifrost to warp both her and Ulrich out of here. As the sounds of smoldering bodies begin to fill the air, Volstagg says that they felled an entire army today. But I, Mulnir, this is only the beginning. They must. And at that moment, Volstagg realizes what he's done. And he says, this isn't who I am. Who am I? I am. Lightning begins to strike the ground, and Volstagg shouts, I am the Thorb War, the god of the Bloodstorm. Over in Asgardia, Odin's son rushes Jane to the Hall of Medicine to get help, but Jane tells him no magic. Odin's son says that she is dying. He can feel her life draining as they speak. He doesn't care what it takes to save her. They will. And then Odin notices the hammer floating behind them. She says to give her the hammer, and Odin's son shouts for the hammer to stay away. It is they who are the cause for Jane's suffering. Jane reaches for the hammer, and Odin's son tells her not to. Her fingers will not touch the hammer. And in a flash of light, Jane transforms. There is trouble on the realms, the hammer whispers to her, and Jane answers without a second thought. That is why she is worthy to be Thor, the goddess of thunder, and why she will soon be dead. Meanwhile, down in the depths of Mesfelheim, a storm begins to brew over the fiery land. The fire goblins look to the skies to see some strange liquid falling upon them. And one goblin says that he thinks he's heard of this before. He believes that they call it rain. Moments later, giant waves of water come crashing down through their city. And it is then marked as the first time in living memory that rain came to the Firelands. So much rain that the goblin nests were flooded, and with the rain came thunder, and with the thunder came Thor! Except, this time, it wasn't the Thor that you've come to know and love, it was the War Thor. A Thor that holds a hammer not known in this land. A Thor who is here to kill everyone. To bring back the vengeance of everyone that has been lost in war. Volstag is the War Thor, and Volstag walks out over the once burning lava, calling out to Cinder that there is a storm coming that will end all fire forever. Suddenly the ground shifts and as the rocks begin to part, Cinder appears before Volstag, telling him that she thinks not. The flames of Mesfelheim are the fires of creation and of death for him and his kind. Cinder charges at Volstag, the War Thor, forcing him to block, but the force from her knocks him away. Cinder lunges in, slamming her sword down on Volstag's hammer, stating that to be the Queen of Cinders, she had to learn to paint with fire. He will be her masterpiece. As Cinder opens up her mouth, a scorching wave of fire blasts into Volstag, knocking him to the ground, and his hammer into the lava. Volstag reaches for his weapon, and as he looks into the lava, all he can see are the faces of the children that he is here to protect. Before Volstagg can grab the hammer, Cinder picks him up with her tail and holds him under the lava, shouting that he will have his lungs filled with lava. Volstagg holds out his hand, and as he does, the ultimate Mjolnir shoots by into Cinder's back. Volstagg pulls himself up, gasping for air, and then the fire-breathing sharks swim by, biting away at the god's body. The fire goblins run up, asking if they should fetch the invader's charred body. And Cinder laughs, telling him, No, we will let the sharks have their fun. But just before Cinder could continue talking, Volstagg leaps from the lava, bashing Cinder with one of her own sharks. The goblins rush in to swarm over Volstagg, and once he's held in place, Cinder swings her sword, ripping through both the goblins and Volstagg. She picks Volstagg up, stating that she will spread her fire oh so slowly over his body, roasting his tender flesh. His screams will turn to ash in his charred mouth. What does the little Thor say to that? The voice then calls out to Cinder telling her that that isn't Thor. And some would say neither is she, now let him go. Jane floats down, holding the proper hammer of this universe. And Cinder tells her that she may call herself whatever she wants. All they are to her are unwelcomed guests in her realm. Jane then tells her, if that's so, let them both leave here and... But Volstagg struggles, shouting that he isn't leaving until she pays for what she did. And Cinder says to Jane, see, he doesn't wish to leave. Jane throws her hammer down, bouncing it off the nearby goblins, and then punches Cinder to the ground, asking if what he says is not true. She attacked Nidalvaya and murdered children. Cinder gets back up, stating that no one has dared lay a hand on her since her father, and she will never lay hands on anything again once those hands are removed. 
Jane calls back to her hammer, telling her that she will find that rather difficult when she is filled with Ura. But before Jane can swing, Volstagg stands up telling her, It is not your hammer that Cinder should fear! The fury of the dead universe rages within this hammer, and with it I will smite this entire realm into oblivion. To end this war, I must first end all of them. Death to the fire realm! The rock pillars begin to shake and crumble, and on one of them, a fire goblin child cries for its mother. As the young goblin is flung into the air, Jane catches him, telling him to be calm. This will all be over soon, hopefully. She then spins her hammer and opens up a portal, and in a blink of an eye, Volstagg and her are teleported into nothingness. Volstagg looks around asking, what did you just do? And Jane tells him that her hammer transported them to the awning void, where he can do no more harm. Volstagg then asks, You protect the demons of the Fire Realm? What sort of Thor are you? Rather than answer, Jane asks, What kind of Thor are you? You've terrorized innocent children in order to strike against their queen? That is not the way of Thor. Now stand aside. Volstagg shouts, That is why I am here. You are filled with nothing but words, and words will not end wars. Now stand aside, woman, or the war Thor will end you as well. As the two gods begin to clash, their thunderous blows can be heard ringing throughout the realms. Over the skies of Vanaheim, all the way over in Niflheim. And just as Volstagg gets ready to deliver the final blow to Jane, her hammer flies by hitting Volstagg in the back, loosening his grip on his hammer. From her defensive bubble, Jane reaches out to the otherworldly hammer, the ultimate universe hammer, stating that his storms are paltry, just like her grasp on sanity. She grips onto Volstagg's hammer and then calls back hers. Volstagg's eyes widen as he looks at Jane. Her eyes sparked with lightning and her body filled with rage. The very air around her, trembling. But before Jane can swing, she looks at the other Mjolnir, stating this should not be here. Volstagg then asks why she lifted it, and does she have the guts to truly bring the storm? The war will not be won with thunder, but with blood. Only the blood puts out the fire, and if she wishes to stop him, she must become the raging blood storm. Do you hear? The hammer swings, cracking Volstagg in the face, and Jane shouts, asking, Do you think that she does not understand a war? You should try battling cancer. With both hammers in hand, Jane slams the two together, and the realms see another streak of light. The force from the hit knocks Volstagg across the realms, all the way down to the dark fairy realm. Volstagg then begins to get up looking around, stating that this is the birthplace of Melikath. This was no mere accident. She flies down and Volstagg tells her that the hammer brought them here on purpose. His hammer knows that these dark elves must be punished, just like Cinder and her demons. They could do it together. They could end this war in a day. Jane begins to feel the power of the second hammer, stating that this hammer is angry, so untethered. All it wants her to do is rage. Volstagg shouts, then do it. Let the rage out. As Jane looks at the scared elf, she says no. She's seen his rage in all of its ugliness. They have enough wars, and with that, enough Mjolnirs. She throws the hammer into the sky, but Volstagg calls it back, stating, No, without rage, you would never truly be worthy of it. Lightning strikes down on Volstagg, and he yells to let him show her how a real Thor makes war! And say fare thee well to the Dark Fairy Realm. The ground begins to shake and rip, sucking the elves into their cracks. And Jane shouts that they have to do better than this. Jane tries to hit Volstagg, but as he catches the hammer with his, he headbutts her, pushing her back. She yells, Damn it all to hell! Who are you, you mad bastard? Why are you doing this? And Volstagg shouts that he is the god of the Bloodstorm. He is the War Thor, and this is... And just then, a ram charges into Volstagg, and Odin's son looks down, stating, You are a great blundering fool and also a friend. Volstagg, lay down your hammer and end this madness. Jane looks at him. Volstagg? And Rosalind runs up stating that it is true. Volstagg is the War Thor. As Odin's son and Volstagg begin to exchange blows, Jane says that it can't be possible. Volstagg is one of the kindest souls she's ever met. Rosalind goes on stating that Volstagg's eyes were open to the horrors of war. She's afraid that that's all he can see now. And Jane tells her no. He has forgotten himself. She knows how to win the War of Thors. And then a thunk can be heard as Jane's hammer hits the ground. She calls out to Volstagg in her human form, Jane Foster, telling him that she understands his anger and pain, but this is not the answer. Remember who you are. You are such a loving and merciful god. Volstagg tells her, I am War Thor, and if you come any closer, I will smash you just as I did Odin's son. She continues walking, stating that he is a devoted husband, loving father, esteemed senator of the Congress of Worlds, a friend! It's time for us to go home! 
Roslyn looks at Volstag's hammer, asking what they should do with this. And Odinson yells out, telling them to return it to old Asgard. No one wants you here. Roslyn says that she's pretty sure it's a hammer and not a dog. This really isn't going to. But just then, the hammer flies into the sky. And Roslyn says that she will never understand Thors and their hammers. Just as one war ends, another begins. And the War of Thors comes to a close, but it does mark the beginning of the War of the Realms. The forces of Vanaheim, Niflheim, and Heaven will stand ready to fight their battles as rocks on Cinder and Meliketh all execute their attacks at the same time. It's time for us to come to the end of Jane Foster. As the past is shown to him, Odin's son sees himself in his former glory during a time when he once held Mjolnir. Carnilla, the queen of the Norns, asks what does he see? And Odin's son says that what he sees is something that pains him to the very depths of his soul. Carnilla tells him that he gazes upon the golden sap of Yggdrasil, the lifeblood of the world tree itself. Such visions are not for the faint of heart or the unworthy. Odin's son looks away and he states that it is not for him to see them, but he did not come here to be humiliated. He came here because someone needed help. She says that it is not her who needs help, but someone that she is bound to protect. The Norns are in the greatest of danger. Someone seeks to slay the fates themselves. If the Norns, the twiners of fate, were to fall, then destiny dies with them. Meliketh and his dark cabal would be free to forge their own futures, no matter the consequences. Yulik and his trolls have already tried, and her soldiers have managed to repel them. Odinson tells her that no harm shall befall the Norns while the Thunder God has blood pumping through his chest. But just as he says that, the warning horn can be heard, and Carnilla says that that is the sentry's horn. They are facing another attack. Odinson grabs Jolnbjorn and yells to have the guards get the Norns to safety. He'll deal with the trolls. Carnilla tells him that it is not just the trolls this time. Their time grows short, and if today they must bleed, then let them do so as Norns. I, the Norns, bleed stories. Meanwhile, in Asgard, Volstag awaits to be tried for what he did while wielding the Warhammer. As everyone wonders if Volstag was even capable of hurting a fly, there's a rumble of thunder that fills the halls. Everyone tries to figure out what it is, and Volstag tells them that they should all run. Then something comes crashing down through the ceiling and before Volstag. The ultimate Thor's Mjolnir sits there, pulsing with lightning, and Volstag reaches forward as everyone tries to pull him away. As a single finger touches that war hammer, the War Thor, god of the blood storm, is once again born. Back at the Norn Keep, Odinson fights back the forces with all of the strength that he has while allowing Carnilla and her Norns to escape. As Carnilla looks at the threads of fate, she tells her guards that they should leave here before their lives are claimed. The guards ask what about her, and Carnilla tells them that she is the queen of the Norns. It is time that she controlled her own fate for once, and then takes a dagger cutting the threads. Outside, while Meliketh's forces push closer to her chambers, green threads start reaching out, grabbing the attackers and strangling them. She tells them that there is only one Norn and Norn keep today, and she now holds all of their fates in her hands. She sees where the threads led them, and all of the realms. For all of the gods, and for all of the Thors. The two giants hack away at the support for her chambers, and she continues stating that the war of the realms, the battle for the stones, the final host, the Mangok. Gods help them. Death. She sees the most horrible of deaths coming for them. But before she can finish, the roots give way, and Norn Keep comes crashing down. Odinson rushes over to move the stone and the debris aside, calling out to Carnilla, asking if she's okay. And as he reaches for her, he sees her body broken. She tells him that she saw all of the threads of fate, all of them, and she saw death. She saw the death that is coming for her. She did her best to twine the tale. She bled like a norn, and her death is not a death that he should fear. It is the death of Jane. Don't let Jane. But back across the cosmos, the Warhammer flies Volstagg towards the ruins of old Asgard. And he asks why is it taking him here? They must go to Mesfelheim or Sletulfarheim, not here. But just then Volstagg is hit by a flying goat and he's shot down to the ruins with a force so great it levels the grounds. He gets back up looking at Tooth Nasher, asking Odin's son if he left him to guard the hammer. However, he cannot put the hammer back down. It wants him to end this war and he wants to. He never asked for this. He never asked to be a Thor. But just as Volstagg finishes, there's a second explosion and Tooth Nasher growls, charging toward whatever landed. As he gets closer, a hand reaches out, grabbing Tooth Nasher by the neck, pulling him into the smoke. Volstagg says by the gods it can't be, and a voice asks, You call yourself Thor. You are no Thor that I have ever seen. 
Through the smoke, Mangog walks out holding Tooth Nasher's body, telling Fullstack, At long last, Mangog has returned to Asgard. With the strength of a billion beings, a rage unquenchable. Which means the time for the ultimate judgment has come. As Mangog lunges for Fullstack, he tells them, And we shall start with you. But rest assured, you will not be the last. As Mangog starts to run, Volstagg takes his hammer and he throws it, but the massive fist of Mangog punches into it, sending it flying back into Volstagg's gut. As Volstagg finds his footing and he holds steady, Mangog stops before him, telling him, I do not know you, but you smell of an Asgardian. You are a god and that is all I need to know. Mangog then grabs Volstagg by the neck, throwing him across the ruins towards the nearby buildings. He starts to pick himself back up, telling him, I am not just a god. I am the Warthor, the god of the Bloodstorm. Have at thee. Lightning begins to strike the ground, creating a storm, but through it, Mangog walks. As he gets to Volstagg, he punches into Volstagg's head, and the storms stop. As Mangog punches over and over, he says that this is what happens to people who send their prayers to the ether. The gods don't answer. While devout men die, while these gods do nothing, the Mangog rises. And when divine gardeners neglect their orchards, an entire worlds wither and die. The Mangog rages. When they sin and call it holy, I swell with power. And then I cumber them with some sins of my own. As Mangog grabs Volstagg again, Volstagg takes his hammer, cracking it across Mangog's face, telling him, You are no match for the Warhammer. Mangog steps back, spitting out a broken tooth on a Volstagg's head, telling him, Mangog does not fear hammers or the cowardly gods who hide behind them. As Mangog jumps forward, Volstagg thrusts his hammer into Mangog's mouth, telling him, Then you can taste the rage of an entire dead universe. The lightning comes crashing down, letting all of Asgard, and even then, Mangog smacks Volstagg away. He begins to laugh, bloated from all of the lightning in his stomach, and he tells him, Tastes like another dead god. And he releases the power back at to Volstagg. The blast burns everything around it, and Volstagg starts to get back up, telling him, this is impossible. Mangog walks up, hitting Volstagg back into the ground, telling him, I eat the impossible. I feed with the hunger of a billion beings, and yet I still hunger. With all of that rage, Mangog beats Volstagg over and over again, punch after brutal punch, breaking and spilling the blood of the war Thor. Mangog then howls in triumph, and Volstagg reaches for his hammer as it slowly slides towards him. He grabs his hands around the handle, and Mangog grabs him, telling him, You may fight with the power of an entire murdered universe, but my rage comes from the inside, while Thor's come from this. Mangog will never break, but the same could not be said. For hammers! He lifts up both Volstagg and the hammer in his hands, and he squeezes down, crushing both the hammer and Volstagg's arm. As he lets go, pieces of the Warhammer crumble before him, and Mangog tells him, No more hammer. No more Thor. And with one last punch, he launches Volstagg to the edges of Asgard. Volstagg barely manages to grab onto the ledge before falling off into space. And Mangog walks up to him, asking him, Where are they? Where are the Asgardians? Volstagg tells him that they're all gone. And Mangog steps down onto Volstagg's remaining hands, telling him, You still have a few bones I can break. Now tell me. Volstagg screams in pain as Mangog steps down, and then a voice says, It's called Asgardia. Mangog looks back, and Meliketh tells him, They're all there, all of your favorites, including the Allfather Odin himself, all waiting for you. Mangog turns, asking, Is he? And Meliketh smiles, stating, Not a god, thus not of your concern. Mangog grunts, telling him, Then you shall not get in my way. And he leaps off as Meliketh says, I wouldn't dream of it. But once he leaves, Volstagg calls out for help, and Meliketh looks over the ledge to see Volstagg returning to his normal self. Meliketh laughs, telling him, Ha <laughs> ha, hello, Warthor. Is it war that you are looking for? And he holds out a knife over Volstagg's hand. After dropping the knife into Volstagg's hand, Meliketh watches as Volstagg's body drifts off into space, and he says, Godspeed, Mangog, and goodbye, mighty Thor. Now back on Midgard, Jane begins to think about all the good that she is doing. And the forests of Vanaheim, protecting it from the hulked out rocks on super soldiers. And Jotunheim, fighting back to Storm and Mountain Giants, so many other things. But instead, she is sitting on Midgard, arm wrestling Hercules of Olympus. Herc asks if she's ready to surrender, and Jane tells him that she is ready to tear his little arm from his stubborn torso. For lives depend on it. The two begin, and Jean Bion is thrown between them, and Odison then asks, 
Please do not get Hercules started on his labors. He can go on for centuries about those. We do not have the time. There is no point in measuring egos against Hercules, believe me. Jane tells him that this isn't about egos. This is about Olympus doing the right thing. Herc says that trying to convince Zeus to join their cause will not be an easy task. Skyfather Zeus is just as stubborn as the one-eyed all-father of Asgard. Herc then grabs Jane's hand and kisses it, stating that there will be at least one god of Olympus. There, fighting by her side, his name is Hercules, Prince of Power. Later in the healing ward of Asgard, on the bedside of the healing Volstagg, Odin's son tells Jane that she found him like this after becoming Warthor again. Jane then asks, you're telling me that something did this to Volstagg while he was empowered as Warthor? And Odin's son says, aye. It's the same thing that had the power to rend his hammer to pieces and to tear Tooth Nasher's head from his body. The thing that we face is something that Carnilla spoke of with her dying words. So tell me, have you heard of Mangog? Jane says that it's something that she's only heard of in whispers. She knows that it's something that even the gods fear. Odin's son tells her, aye, and with good reason. On previous bouts, it has defeated the armies of Asgard all by itself, and it almost brought about Ragnarok through the sheer force of its will. Even the all-seeing Heimdall can't find it, but the Mangog is coming. The gods must be ready. Jane says that when it comes, they will face it together. But until then, there is a war raging across the realms, and Odin's son stops her, stating, Not for you, there isn't. The only war that you should be facing is the one raging inside of you. Jane tells him that he shall unhand her, or he will lose his only hand. Odin's son then says that he fights for the life of his mortal friend Jane Foster. Does the goddess of thunder still remember her? Last time I saw her, she was in desperate need of medical care. Jane looks down at Mjolnir, and after a moment of hesitation, says that there's no time to be sick. This is why the hammer has chosen her. Odin's son tells her that it doesn't mean that she has to let it kill her. You may not be afraid to die, but you must not be afraid to live. One god with a hammer will not defeat Meliketh's army, not alone. The world needs a Thor, I, and you have been one hell of a Thor. You have faced every threat possible. The world needs more than just a Thor. It needs you as Jane Foster. Jane looks at her hammer and tells him, I, and she throws the hammer into space. She then says that he is right. Jane Foster does have something left to do. A few moments later, in front of Odin's chamber, Jane is beating on the giant doors calling for him. She knows that he can hear her in there. It is time that he does something about the war that they are facing, and if he won't face it, it is time that they had a new Allfather. Or better yet, All-Mother. The War of Realms is not just a war for the elves or the giants, it is a war that affects all of them. As the crowd starts to form, a voice from behind yells to Jane that she and all of these people are under arrest for sedition. Jane tells Cole that it is not sedition. It is common sense, something which too bad he is not the god of. Cole tells her that she is not a senator anymore, she is just a half-dead mortal who does not belong here. Now leave before she is treated as an enemy of Asgard. As the crowd becomes unruly, arguing back against Cole, the doors to Odin's chambers slam open, and he shouts, ENOUGH! Odin steps out asking, Are you gods or petulant children? Either way, seashell retchling mewling. For the old father Odin has returned. Returning long enough to deal with the mess that my brother has made of Asgardia. A god who cannot deal with one troublesome mortal does not deserve to be a god. Jane tells him that she is not the trouble here. His stubbornness will doom every god in. But Odin speaks over her, telling her, I should never have sent my son into Midgard. I thought stripping him of his powers and leaving him to wallow among the humans would humble him. But the humans are just arrogant. And you are the most arrogant of all. Then a voice calls out from the chamber stating that Jane Foster speaks true. The realms deserve better gods. They are all unworthy. Everyone stops to see Lady Freya weakly walking out and she continues stating that Jane Foster's words have stirred something inside of her. Now is not the time for slumber. For the war of realms has begun. They must prove themselves worthy to be called gods. They must be worthy of her, of the bold and valiant Lady Jane of Midgard. Come stand beside her so that they might. But as everyone looks back, they see Jane has collapsed to the floor. Outside of the Golden Gate, Heimsdall says that so it begins. Over the eons, these all-seeing eyes have watched worlds crumble and galaxies burn. But what comes next will be difficult to watch. Suddenly there's a loud THOOM and Mangog lands before him, stating, Asgard at last! Tell all of the gods in heaven that Mangog has arrived to send them to hell! A short while after the arrival of Mangog, Jane begins to wake back up and she asks, where is she? She looks around, seeing herself in a hospital bed, and Odin's son tells her that she is not on Asgard anymore. She is where she belongs. Jane asks what happened, and Odin's son says that she collapsed. He had alerted Senator Solomon, and Rosalind tells her that she called in everyone that she could. Jane turns and sees Sam Wilson and Stephen Strange, and Sam tells her that she needs to listen to what they have to say. Doctor Strange tells her that she should consider this an intervention. On behalf of the people who love and respect her, they refuse to watch her murder herself. Odin's son then says that he knows that it is difficult to let go of being Thor. In the name of all the gods, does he know that? But that 
is what must happen here today. Jane asks what of Asgard, and Rosalind stops her stating that it is not of her concern. Kicking Cancer's ass is all that she needs to worry about. Believe her when she says that Asgard will be fine without her. Meanwhile, back at the Rainbow Bridge, Heimdall thrusts his sword into Mangog's chest, telling him, Mangog will be stopped. So swears Heimdall, the all-seeing. Mangog grabs Heimdall, slamming him into the ground, breaking his sword in half. He then picks him back up, and part of the sword is still sticking out of his chest as he tells Heimdall, you see very little for an all-seeing god. Tell me, mighty Heimdall, did you foresee this? Mangog pushes Heimdall's head against the broken blade. Also at this time, Cole runs out with his guards, shouting to trigger the Bifrost and send the beast somewhere. Mangog begins punching into the bridge, asking, Did you think that you could just send me away? Mangog isn't going anywhere, and neither are you. With one last hit, the bridge begins to shatter. Back on Earth, though. Doctor Strange begins to examine Jane and she tells him, remember, no magical cures. And Doctor Strange says that he understands. Once Doctor Strange is done, he says that when this all began a year ago, her initial cancer treatments were showing positivity. It was stage one breast cancer, but the treatments were removing the cancerous cells. And then something changed. Suddenly the treatments were ineffective and the cancer metastasized. It went from stage one to stage two and then to four. What changed is that she found a magic hammer on a moon. The more she saved the world as goddess of thunder, the more she was killing herself. The magical transformation purges the chemotherapy from her system while leaving behind the actual cancer itself. If she was to transform even one more time, Dr. Foster, are you even listening? Jane's eyes begin to stare at the hammer, which is floating in the room with them. Otisun shouts at the hammer, telling it to go away. Can't you see that you're killing her? And Jane, while looking at the hammer, quietly says that she can hear it. The Mangog has come. Back on Asgard, Freya watches the destruction, stating that no matter how many soldiers they throw at it, the Mangog will keep coming. They must release their greatest weapon. They must release the Destroyer. Moments later, back at the gate, Mangog walks through yelling for Odin to stop hiding behind his pathetic armies and face your demise. Freya, through the Destroyer, tells him, the All-Father isn't listening. It's the All-Mother who will be his Destroyer today. With that, she releases the Destroyer's destructive blast right into his chest. But while the fight for Asgard continues, Jane gets up from her bed, walking over to the hammer. Doctor Strange tells her that if she is to change even one more time, there will be no coming back. Jane Foster will die. Sam yells that they have to keep the hammer away from her, and Rosalind says no. It's her life. Jane's the one who will make the decision to live or die. Back on Asgard, the fire spreads as the Destroyer tries to defeat Mangog. But then he grabs a hold of the Destroyer, stating that he can see the weakness in this. The goddess who controls it is weary. Recovering from a great illness, you should have stayed in bed. He bites down on the head of the Destroyer, ripping it off of its own shoulders. Mangog then throws the Destroyer's body into the building, shouting to Odin that he is coming for him. He will come at him just as he came to slew the race that gave birth to him. He will slay every god on Asgard and drown them in their own blood. Back in the hospital, though, Jane reaches for the hammer and then stops. She looks at Odin's son, telling him that they are all soldiers now, soldiers in the War of the Realms. Make sure that their side doesn't lose. Odin, however, sits on his throne, imagining what the sight will look like the moment that Mangog makes his way in. He thinks even gods don't live forever. Even all fathers die. If today is that day, then so be it, though I have one regret. I wish at long last that I could have told my son, my heir, what he truly but Odin's son stops him, telling him, That'll have to wait, old man. Right now we have a realm to preserve. Gods to save and man god to kill. We'll do so with all of the thunder blood in our bodies and all of the boar damned hell that we can muster. Mangog begins to claw his way into the throne room, yelling, At last! Now falls Asgard! Now death comes for the gods! Mangog quickly grabs Odin's son, slamming him into the ground, and then he punches Odin away as he tries to stab into him. Odin's son then brings down his axe, and as he gets close, Mangog smacks him so hard that he is launched into space. Odin gets back up, and as he looks up, he sees Mangog holding his broken throne over his head, telling him, Your kingdom lies in ruins, and now so will you. Mangog throws the throne down onto Odin's body, and then Odin's son, riding Toothgrinder, flies back in, shouting for his father. Toothgrinder rams into Mangog, sending him down into the lower levels. But back up top, Odin begins to rise. He says that Mangog doesn't hit as hard as he remembers. Barely felt that. He was a fool to give in to fear. If death comes to Asgard, so be it. And what a glorious death it shall be. As Odin and his son battle against Mangog, all Freya can do is watch as the walls of their once great city fall. Freya talks to herself, stating that there must be something that can be done, something that can stop Mangog. But a voice tells her that all she can do is run. Nothing will stop him. Mother. 
Freya turns back to see Loki and he says that he's here to help with that. He is the Sorcerer Supreme of Midgard now. He can send her far enough away from Mangog. And without saying a word, Freya slaps him across the face, stating, how dare you show your face around here? Come to bury another poisoned dagger into my back? Loki looks at her. Mother. And Freya yells, you lost all rights to call me that. He sincerely looks at Freya, asking, if I wanted that dagger to kill you, do you think that you would be standing here instead of Valhalla? Meliketh wanted Asgard in the hands of Odin, not you. He knew that the Allfather would keep it isolated and out of his war of realms. Meliketh and his cabal were determined to see you dead. I knew that you would never make that choice willingly, so I made it for you. But if you don't wish for my help, I understand. No god in all of the heavens can do anything to stop Mangog. Not the Allfather, not the Odin son, and not you. There are some things that you just can't save. Goodbye, Lady Freya. Over in the control room, both Odin and Odin's son are thrown into it, and Mangog lands stating, You aren't the Thor that I remember, or the Allfather for that, but you both are still rather stubborn when it comes to dying. Odin's son tells him that they killed him once before, and they'll do it again. Mangog laughs, grabbing the control panel for Asgard, and begins to rip it apart, causing the floating city to start speeding towards the sun. Mangog asks, Can you hear that? The screams of the poor damned souls calling out across the cosmos. Mangog then grabs Odin and Odin's son in his hands, and Freya with his tail, telling them, I will answer your prayers, though. Your prayers for death! Back on Earth, Jane begins to walk around the hospital and overhears Rosalind speaking to Alpha Flight. Rosalind tells him, yeah, yeah, I know my security clearance expired when S.H.I.E.L.D. went under, but think of this as an anonymous tip. You should be able to locate Asgard, right? Well, you need to look. Odinson left like a goat out of hell, and I can't call the Bifrost. Yeah, it's out near Saturn, a big golden city floating out in space. You can't miss it. What do you mean it's not there? Of course it's there. It's passing Mars? Why would it? Wait, it's on a course for what? Pass me through to the Avengers. Jane doesn't say a word as she heads to her room and begins to look through her paperwork. She looks at her hand and says that she should have beaten this cancer. And then she looks out the window to see her hammer floating there. She waits, and then she grabs it by the handle, and she sees everything that is happening to Asgard. She hears Mangog stating the death of a god, and there is nothing in the cosmos like that feeling. Tell him, do you feel it too? Or should he? There's suddenly a booming crackoon as Jane appears before Mangard, and she tells him, you should take your filthy hands off those gods and get ready to face the fury of Thor. After a few exchanges of blows, Jane hits Mangog with a thunderous crack in his mouth. The force from her blow sends Mangog crashing into the golden statue of Odin, and as he hits it, Jane calls down the lightning to melt the statue over him. She lands, breathing heavy from the hit, and says that she fought the Destroyer. She fought the Allfather himself, and she has never felt such rage. Odin gets up stating that it won't stop him for long. Nothing can stop the Mangog. Not even death. Not even our deaths. Jane tells him that it'll hold him long enough. Asgard is flying into the sun. He and the others need to evacuate at once. Freya then walks up, stating, and leave you to face Mangog alone? Nay. Jane looks around and the warriors of Asgard are routed. The rainbow bridge is shattered. The Allfather is leaking like a one-eyed sieve. And Thor is their only hope. But that's when Odin shuns out, No! You shouldn't be here! What did you do? You've killed yourself! And Odin then asks, What is he going on about? But at that moment, Mangog breaks free of the melted gold, and Jane yells that they must leave now. The world needs more than just one Thor. They need gods that they can believe in. Tell the gods that it is time to earn the gift that they've all been given. As Jane finishes, Mangog lunges and tackling her through the ground, telling Jane that she fights for the gods, but she herself isn't entirely a god, is she? Jane struggles to push him off, stating that she may not be a god, but he is entirely a monster. Mangog picks her up, throwing her into a wall, stating that she has hated them. Deep down in your heart, you know that they deserve this. After being punched into the air, Mangog tells her, Why not just let me kill them? It is why I exist, now stand aside. Jane rockets back, shouting, She cannot allow that! And as she gets close, Mangog takes a slab of stone, slamming it down onto Jane, pinning her to the ground. Mangog then asks, Why throw your life away? You would sacrifice yourself a thousand times, and things would still never change. Why would you die for the gods? Jane thinks about all the things in her life, and she bursts out from underneath the slab, punching into Mangog, telling him that she dies not for them, but for love. He would die not, but hate. That is why he will always lose. With all of the strength that Jane can muster, she throws Mangog headfirst into the sun. Everyone watches, and Freya says that she's done it. They are saved. The gods, they bless Thor. Odin's son quietly says that they have no idea what she's done. She's doomed herself. They have to. But before he could finish, Mangog rockets back towards Jane, screaming and asking, You yearn to be a god! Very well. You can die like one. 
Jane tries to free her arm, telling him, That was the plan, but she will not die alone. And she punches Mangog's face. Odessa leaps out, cutting off his tail, yelling, I, nor slay alone either. Jane yells that he needs to get out of here. They're getting close to the sun. And Mangog roars, shouting that nothing can stop Mangog. No gods in heaven or hells. No all fathers or all mothers. No magic, no thunder, no Thor. Mangog knocks Jane back down to the ground, and as she gets back up, she grabs a chain wrapping it around Mjolnir. She takes that chain, and she throws it around Mangog, stating, These chains are forged by dwarves to bind the monster wolf Fenris. Let's see how they fit a Mangog. He tries to struggle through the chains, yelling that he is the only thing that can save this universe from divine ruin. And Jane tells him that in the end, it was not a god. T'was a mortal named Jane. A woman who gave up everything in order to stop him Remember that. Fly true, my friend. Fly like the mighty storm that you are. Jane then takes the hammer and throws it into the sky, and the hammer shoots off into the sun's core. Odesun shouts, asking, What did you just do? You threw the hammer into the sun. You're killing Mjolnir. You just killed... You just killed yourself. She begins to take off her helmet, telling him she knows. She knows she won't survive another transformation. She knows exactly what she has done. Odinson says that they could still get her to the healers. We could still save you. And Jane stops him, telling him that there isn't time for that. Not that it would matter. Let them not waste what little time they have. And Odinson says he doesn't know what to say. Jane holds his face and tells him, Say goodbye. As they begin to kiss, Jane's body begins to revert back to its original form. And as she does, Asgard begins to burn and fall apart. Just then, Asgard explodes for all to see. With Freya stepping forward, tears running down her face. She says perhaps there is still a chance. A chance that they could have made it out. Odin hangs his head, telling her that she feels the same as he does. The chill of death. And then there's a loud thoom hitting the moon's surface. As the dust settles, Odin's son sits there, holding Jane's lifeless body. As traces of Mangog fade, the gods begin to gather around the woman. The woman who was their Thor, Jane. Freya shouts that this is not how it ends. Where are the boar damned healers? As Odin's son runs over to her, Odin stares out for a moment before scoffing and walking off to disappear. Sif asks Heimdall if he is truly, and Heimdall tells her that even blindfolded he can see the truth. He's afraid that it is too late, dear sister, she has gone. The goddess of thunder is dead. May she find a way without haste to the halls of the honored slain. Meanwhile, at the gates of Valhalla, a younger, healthier Jane wanders through the fog asking if anyone's there. As she looks up at the gates, she says that this is Valhalla. That means that she's... But before she could even finish the sentence, Odin shouts, You! It was you all along! You're the one who stole the hammer, robbing my son of his birthright, his very name. You've also been the source of all of my troubles for months, turned all of Asgard against me. Jane tells him actually he did that all by himself. And without even acknowledging it, Odin continues shouting that she dared lay her hands and hammer against him. The Holy Allfather in personal combat. And you even defeated Mangog when no one else in the heavens could stand his wrath you fought on. So much so that it cost you your life. Everyone that I know and love would be dead if it was not for you. My wife, my son, even I myself. You fought until your very last breath to save the gods of Asgard. It was a glorious death. That is why you, Jane Foster of Midgard, have earned your place among the most venerated of the fallen warriors. Your eternal reward awaits. Welcome to Valhalla, mighty Thor. As the gates of Valhalla open, she looks in and sees the beautiful scene of peace. But rather than walk towards it, she stands there. Odin asks why she hesitates. A great feast is about to begin in your honor. Be not afraid. You have nothing more to fear from me or anyone else ever again. As Odin places his hand on Jane, she looks at him and says that she wasn't ready. She wasn't ready to die. Back on the moon, the healers surround Jane's body, stating that it is of no use. There is still no pulse. Their spells have no effect on her. Sif looks up and at the gathering storm and says that she's never quite seen a stellar squall like this. Heimdall tells her that even when he had eyes, he never beheld such a storm, but he has heard tell of one. The God Tempest, the Mother's Storm, which means the legends must be true. The ancient superstorm truly was the heart of Mjolnir. With the hammer now gone, the tempest has been unleashed, and it would appear to be angry. And tis not the only one. Across him, Odin's son slams his axe into the ground, shouting in anger, calling down to the mother storm, telling it to show him why they call her the god Tempest. Freya runs up and tells him to calm thyself. She knows what he is trying to do. He cannot channel such a storm. It is too strong. It would. But before she could finish, there's a loud crackoom as Odin's son is struck by lightning. 
He shouts to everyone to get away from Jane. She cannot be dead. She was the mighty Thor. She has thunder in her veins. Using the power of the Mother Storm, Odinson begins to try and channel its power into Jane to bring her back. And back at the gates of Valhalla, Odin asks Jane why is she waiting? You have never tasted meals as what awaits you, and believe me, it's worth whatever agonies you have suffered. Jane stares through the gate, stating that she knows that she should want to. But there's something holding her back, almost like... But before she could say another word, she screams out in pain. Back on the moon, Odinson continues pouring the power of the Mother Storm into Jane, telling everyone to stand back. He will bring her back. And as Odinson gives another pulse of lightning, Jane screams out in pain again. Odin then asks, how is she under attack in the land of the dead? Who is responsible for this blasphemy? As Jane rolls over, Odin says that he sees it now, even from across the void. It's the god Tempest that clings to you. Over on the moon, Odinson is pumping another pulse of energy, and the healers tell him that there is still no pulse. She is simply, but Odinson yells to get away from her. The healer then states that he must stop this. His arm is melting. Not even he can control such power. Odinson weakly tells them to get back, but then a hand reaches out to Odinson, telling him that they speak the truth. Odin tells him that he cannot control the powers of the god Tempest. No god ever could, but luckily for Lady Jane, there is more than one of them. Back at the gates, Jane looks through, debating what she should do, and over on the moon, Odin and Odin's son together gather their strength, channeling it into Jane. Odin's son asks if she's truly gone, and Odin tells him that she is standing at the gates of Valhalla, refusing to cross over. She's convinced her story hasn't ended, so let us see if she is right. In the name of Asgard, in the name of Thor, with one final stroke of lightning, there is a comb, and the entire side of the moon lights up as the smoke begins to clear. Everyone watches and they see a small crackle of lightning from Jane's eyes. Just then they open and she gasps for air. And a few days later, on old Asgard, Odinson asks what she thinks. Jane looks around at the people rebuilding the land, stating that it is pretty broken. It's a perfect home for them. Odinson tells her nay, not for her. This is a land where he was born, but for her. She's going back to Midgard, to the hospital where she belongs. Jane laughs, telling him to relax. This is just a visit. Believe it or not, she's finally being a good patient. As the two look up at the sun, Odin's son says that it's a worthy death for Mjolnir. It's a worthy death for mighty Thor. Jane looks at him and says that Thors can't die, son of Odin. Not now. Not ever. That's why I came. Odin's son sighs and tells her, without Mjolnir, no more. Will he ever be the unworthy prince of Asgard? The age of Thor has ended. Jane then tells Odin's son to hold out his hand, and as he does, he feels something heavy hit it, and he asks what? He looks and sees a small fragment of the hammer, and as he struggles to hold it back up, he says that it is such a small piece that tells him that he could never lift the hammer. He is still not. But Jane stops him and tells him that the hammer made her the Thunderer, but not him. He did it all by himself, and though she was honored to carry the mantle, it is time for him to reclaim it. There must always be a Thor, now and once again, and it must be him. She showed everyone what she could do with the hammer in her hand, and now it's time for him to show everyone what he can do without it. Odinson looks at the fragment and says that he has a few ideas. Gods, it would be great to fly again. He hugs Jane, telling her that he loves her, and that she is more than a god than he could ever be. Jane hugs him back, stating that he has gotten more humanity than most humans. Odinson turns back, shouting, Where are those dwarves? Where are those blacksmiths? She smiles and walks to the edge of old Asgard, and says, Thor's and their hammers. She gets it now. She's gonna miss flying too. Though the skies themselves aren't going anywhere. And neither is she. What are the Ten Realms? The Ten Realms make up the world tree in Norse mythology and are considered different planes of reality or planets. It gets a little hazy the way Marvel does it in the Marvel Universe. Each realm is generally home to different creatures of myth from the Norse myths. They are as follows. Midgard, this is Earth, home to the humans and the mightiest heroes around. This is the last realm to be attacked during the war, and now that the war has come, it is up to the many heroes of Earth to defend it and take back the other realms. Asgard. Once home to the gods, Asgard was actually destroyed at the end of Jason Aaron's Mighty Thor run, when it was attacked by Mangok. Meliketh realized that the Asgardians were the only ones capable of stopping him, and he released a Mangog against them. While Jane Foster Thor sacrificed herself, don't worry, she's okay, to defeat Mangog, the city was destroyed and the Asgardians were forced to relocate to Earth. The Bifrost, which is the Asgardians' way to travel to other realms, was also destroyed, thus making it impossible for Thor to fight against Meliketh and his forces. Here's where the name butchering's gonna start. Svartalheim 
home of the Dark Elves and the birthplace of Meliketh. You will get to him in a minute. Jotunheim, home of the Frost Giants and the birthplace of Loki, the adopted brother of Thor. Elfheim, the home of the Light Elves. Vanaheim, home of such heroes as Hogan, Sif, and Heimdall. Nidavellr, home of the Doors. Niflheim, realm of the dead. Musvalheim, home of the fire demons and heaven. The recently discovered 10th realm is the place of warrior angels that have also sided with Meliketh in his war. This realm was actually introduced by Jason Aaron during his Thor run and was shown to be the home of Angela, the long lost daughter of Odin and sister to Thor and Loki. When it was believed that the angels had killed his daughter, Odin actually severed it from the world tree and erased all knowledge of heaven from history. Okay, so we just said a bunch of weird names and hopefully Dylan put them on the screen so you can see how they're actually spelled and this may have confused people. We apologize, let's move on. Who is Meliketh? Now, the War of the Realms was started by the dark elf Meliketh. Meliketh was originally created by Walt Simonson and first appeared in Thor number 344 in 1984. He is a powerful sorcerer who has plagued Thor throughout his history and was eventually locked up in the realm of the dead. That is until Thor God of Thunder number 13 by Jason Aaron, when the evil being was freed from his prison. Thor, working alongside warriors from the other realms, tried to stop Meliketh and end his reign of terror. Yet despite his best efforts, Meliketh was able to walk free due to his political schemings. This allowed him to conquer his home world. Then he set his sights on the entirety of the Ten Realms, and quickly began to ally himself with the Frost Giants and the Fire Demons. Further allies would appear in the form of Dario Agar, head of Roxxon Corporation on Earth, who has sided with Meliketh due to the financial gain of war for his company, as well as the Enchantress and Loki, who as always seems to be playing both sides against each other. The war began across all ten realms in Mighty Thor number one, just after Jane Foster had become worthy and began to protect Earth in the other realms as Thor, the Goddess of Thunder. Despite the best efforts of Jane Foster and the Council of Worlds, sort of like the Ten Realms version of the UN, Meliketh's war continued to wage across all of the realms, except for Earth. Throughout Jason Aaron's run on Thor, in various forms, the War of the Realms has been a constant background plot. Meliketh has become the ruler of the Light Elves due to his magic and political schemings, and invasions against the Dwarves and the Realm of the Dead have also taken place. To make matters worse, Thor is now considerably weaker, with Mjolnir having actually been destroyed during the battle for Asgard against Mangog. Now Thor must rely on new hammers that have been created by the few remaining doors, yet these new hammers do not have the strength or the power of his old weapon. It is only now that the war has arrived at the last realm, Midgard, Earth, and let the battle begin. Asgard, once home of the ancient Norse gods, now floats throughout the cosmos, broken and destroyed. The Bifrost sitting cracked, unable to link the floating city to the rest of the Ten Realms. In his throne room amidst the ruins and destruction left behind by the Mangog attack, sits Odin. By my own blessed eye, I sure picked a hell of a time to stop drinking, he mutters sadly. The realm eternal is quiet for Odin. The city is like a tomb since the rest of the gods have fled to Midgard with his wife Freya. Suddenly the shadows of the throne room shift and someone approaches. Hey Thor, is that you boy? Come into the light, Odin calls, leaning forward in his seat. At the shadows harden, not on the image of Odin's son, but on an armored dark elf. No Thor, no light. But gifts we bring, the Dark Elf says from behind its creepy mask, pulling a blade from its sheath. Others begin to appear from the corners of the room, slipping from the shadows behind the throne. Odin stands, energy launching from his hands, sweeping the elves away. Assassins! How dare you defile the halls of the gods! He cries, vowing to paint the walls with their bitter black blood. But one slips through, plunging his blade into the king of the gods' gut. The King of Altelheim bids you the goodest of knights, Odin, a one eye. The elf cackles, and the rest of the group pile on the mighty king. Sounds of their blades piercing his flesh, filling the once hollowed halls. Meanwhile, on Midgard, Thor stands in the deck of his humble houseboat, staring into the setting sun, his hellhound Thori standing behind him, concern on his face as he asks if he can get his master a beer, or a troll to smite. Suddenly, the boat quakes as something falls from the sky, crashing into the deck. 
Loki? The Thunder God shouts in surprise, blood covering the fallen trickster god as he bleeds from the knife wound in his stomach. It's too late, brother. The War of the Realms cannot be stopped. He coughs, with Thor leaning over his brother, demanding to know who did this to him. Loki struggles, explaining that Meliketh knew that he would betray him. So, he betrayed him first. Fear fills Loki's eyes as he stares behind Thor, where a group of dark elf assassins appear behind him. Thor of Thunder, Meliketh, sends his warmest, wettest regards. They crow. Thor merely smiles, extending his hand. Tell your craven master, Thor has regards of his own. The hammers twist and spiral, destroying the boat, sending the Dark Elves careening away. Now armed with multiple hammers, the Thunder God turns back to his brother. Get up, Loki. It's time we finish this. Take me to Meliketh, he orders. Thor sniffs the fallen god, looking up at his master with concern. Master, Thor, think. But the Hound's words are cut off as Thori lifts his brother repeating his words. Finally, the magic begins to swirl around them and the two disappear. But master, wait! That not! Thori's words are lost on Thor though, and the Hound merely looks in sadness at the place where his master once stood. Snowy peaks of Jotunheim swirl around them. Blast your lies, Loki! I told you to bring me to Malekath! Thor curses, turning back to his brother. Yet now Loki seems stronger, walking away, pulling the blades free of his stomach. And he merely laughs. <laughs> For in this instance, he has told him the truth. The image of the trickster god begins to shift and suddenly, Melikath the Accursed stands before him. Melikath! Thor curses, whirling on the sorcerer as the frost giants begin to surround them, pointing their massive spears at Odin's son. The blades sink into the ground, blocking Thor from his enemy. You think a few measly frost giants are going to stop me from bludgeoning you into oblivion, Melikath? This war ends here. Yet, at the god's words, Meliketh merely smiles. I assure you, for so many of your friends, my war has just begun. Meanwhile, back at Midgard, in the city known as New York, Spider-Man is swinging throughout it. I just realized it's been a whole day since someone tried to kill me. Jonah had laryngitis. That old lady I saved from the muggers gave me a coupon for a burrito. I haven't even talked to myself in hours. The friendly neighborhood web slinger is saying out loud, Yep. It's been a pretty good day for Spider-Man, which definitely means, wait for it. Suddenly his spider sense begins to go crazy and he swings down onto a rooftop where he sees a woman surrounded by dark armored foes. Come at me, you devils. We'll see how deep I can bury my regards into your gullet. Freya cries, swinging her sword at the dark elf assassins. Oh man, was tonight the LARPing meetup? I totally left my wizard staff at home. Spider-Man quips as he lands among the group. The elves order his death, letting Spidey know who the true bad guys are. Thanks, someone usually shouting to kill me is the sign that you're webbing the right people, as his webbing flies while he flips through the air. You must be the man of spiders. My son has told me so much about you over the years. Freya says, driving her sword into another dark elf. Swords, stabbing elves, funny way of talking. You're Thor's mom, huh? I'm practically BFFs with your son. Suddenly the door to the rooftop bursts open, revealing Sif, Hildegard, and Jane Foster. Swords at the ready. Hildegard turns to Spider-Man, brandishing her axe. Quickly, the warriors fill Freya in on the attack on old Asgard. It is the day that Freya has dreaded for a long time. But meanwhile, over at Greenwich Village, Dr. Stephen Strange is greeted by a crystal ball that begins to scream as a warning. He quickly begins to cast his spells. Over in Hell's Kitchen, Daredevil, the man without fear, hears every extra dimensional warning going off on Yancey Street. Over in the bar at Westchester, Wolverine orders one last beer as his adamantium bones start to ache. Punisher is aiming his pistol at criminals' heads as they kneel before him, energy crackling behind him. And he turns. The war has come to Midgard. Frost giants, fire demons, trolls, dark elves, and war angels. All manner of creatures of myth and magic suddenly fill the streets of New York. People begin to run and scream as the death and destruction reaches our world in a matter of seconds. Frank Castle squeezes the trigger on the criminal as a frost giant stops turning its massive head to stare at him. And then it swings its mace. Ah, oh, wish I'd brought a bigger gun. Frank snarls as he leaps off the rooftop, his pistol firing as he sails through the air. People run as trolls destroy cars and dark elves fire into the civilians. Drop your knives, boys. If you plan on leaving 47th Street with all your bones in working order, Daredevil orders as he leaps into the fight. The war angels begin to rip the helicopters out of the sky, yet suddenly Iron Man and Captain Marvel are amongst them. Greetings, pretty ladies. I'm sure this is just a big misunderstanding. Let's talk about it back at my place over some bubbly and birdseed. 
Tony remarks as he flies in. Stop flirting, Stark, and put them down! Carol Danvers orders, yet Tony can't help it. Flirting is one of his superpowers. The two heroes fly into battle with the angels, but back on the ground, Daredevil turns to Black Panther, who has just arrived on the scene. Please tell me you brought backup. Panther nods. He brought the Avengers. Daredevil turns to see the unlikely group of heroes coming out of the smoke and destruction. Thor bites another dark elf as Blade stalks forward, drawing his swords, and behind him, She-Hulk rushes in to get the civilians out of harm's way. Uh, those are the Avengers? Daredevil remarks, and Captain America runs forward. I think you'll find that we're quite accomplished, Daredevil. The dogs knew, though. Suddenly, Freya fights through the carnage, the blood of the Dark Elves dripping from her blade. If Thori is with you, then where is Thor? Where in all of the realms is my son? Spider-Man swings back overhead as Captain America and Freya begin to fight back to back. I'm afraid I don't know where Thor is. His talking dog says that he disappeared with someone who seemed to be Loki but wasn't. She-Hulk rams into a large swamp mammoth, knocking it to the ground. I think I'm in love. One of the attacking trolls whispers, his friend turning back to him. I saw her first. Freya turns to fight, explaining to Captain America that Meliketh has brought the army of the Ten Realms to Midgard. We have to find my son, she begins to say, yet suddenly a black portal opens before them, and from the black magic comes Meliketh and his generals. All you're going to need is a sturdy stick and a white flag to surrender to the new lords of Midgard. He cackles, motioning to his allies. The Enchantress, Dario Agar, Ulick the Troll, the Cursed, and the Queen of Heaven. Meliketh orders them to surrender Midgard peacefully. Yet his words are cut off as Captain America's shield bounces off his head. Avengers, assemble! He cries as the heroes prepare to hold the line. But the group is scattered as a massive club lands amongst them. Oh, you tiny scraps of meat still think this is a war. Lofry, king of the frost giants, crows, reaching out to the fallen Freya. The giant lifts the all-mother, preparing to kill her as she readies her sword. I say the hell nay! A voice cries as a magical blade severs Lawfrey's hand! The king of the frost giants! Sending it and Freya back to the ground! Lawfrey looks up, shocked to find his son Loki standing before him. Yet Meliketh is suddenly there, taking the trickster god up into the air on his bog tiger. The two launch magical attacks at each other, yet both are interrupted by Doctor Strange. I'm going to have to ask you both to please leave this dimensional plane, he asks politely as he launches into his own attack. On the ground, Loki struggles to his feet as his mother stalks towards him. Loki, you are determined not to be welcomed in any realm, are you? Anger covering her face, but there isn't time. Loki quickly explains that Thor is trapped on Jotunheim and that they need him to defeat Meliketh. Freya merely glares at her son. After everything that he has done, why should she believe him? Because of this, mother. Loki looks at his mother's sadness in his eyes as Lofri picks up his son. The frost giant glares, calling him his one great shame. Opening his mouth, the blood sprays as he devours Loki in one bite. Ugh, I think I might throw up, Ghost Rider says from the ground. And while Spider-Man is telling him to aim the flaming vomit at the enemy, the heroes of Midgard look up at the continuing wave of Meliketh's forces. You know, just when I thought we could really use a Thor, we go from like eight of them to not one in sight, Iron Man states as they launch another attack. So where is Thor? Well, back on Jotunheim, lightning crackles as the thunder rumbles overhead. The icy blue blood of the frost giants begins to spray as Thor continues to swing his hammers in deadly arcs. Is that all you've got, Meliketh? Send more giants! The god of thunder will be the doom of you all! Flashing lights of emergency vehicles can be seen throughout the city, and the sounds of battle surround them as Eddie and his son rush down into the deserted alleyway. Where are we going? Dylan asks, his legs pumping to keep up with the much larger Eddie Brock. Just keep it cool. I'll take us somewhere safe, he whispers, slowly allowing the young boy to catch up. The two stop, staring up at the glowing blue portal in the sky, fear crossing Dylan's face while Eddie just sets his mouth in a grim line. They stop as around the corner, a massive fire creature stops in the street, listening for the sound of prey. Its head moves from side to side, and luckily it heads away from the two of them. With the danger having momentarily passed, Eddie and Dylan press forward, finally arriving at a large warehouse. Eddie is trying to keep Dylan calm, telling him that the safe house should be close by. When suddenly they hear a frightened scream. They turn, seeing three people running from the dark elves that stalk them. Listen to that! There's no sweeter sound in all of the realms! The elves cackle as they give chase. Eddie motions for the boy to get behind cover. He's going to help. What can you do? You're not Venom anymore! Dylan hisses. Yeah, but I'm ten kinds of stupid. 
The family cowers in fear as the dark elves move forward, their blades drawn. Hey! Eddie calls from behind, forcing the elves to turn. Leave them alone! This doesn't have to end messy, he warns, yet Eddie can't even finish his tough guy speech before the elves are surrounding him. Oh, look, brothers, a hero! Oh, he might be one of the mighty Avengers we've heard so much about. So fearsome, maybe we should flee. Eddie doesn't hesitate. His fist quickly connects with an elven face, but there's still two more and a blade slices across his back. A second pierces his side as the elves move quickly, and Eddie falls to his knees. Heroes die painfully. It's sad, though. The blood drips from Eddie's mouth as the elf leans forward, taunting him. Your kind isn't cut out for heroism, yet you long to embrace it. The elves turn, seeing the family escaping through the warehouse. Leave the sack of flesh. A hero should know what it is to die hearing a lullaby of shrieks. Elsewhere, Dylan leans out from behind his hiding spot, worried for Eddie's safety. What have we here? The dark elf sneers as his blade gets dangerously close to Dylan's face. He quickly throws up his hands, telling the elf that he surrenders yet. A evil grin spreads wider across the elf's face. Poor boy, I'm afraid we don't take prisoners. Good to know, Eddie growls as his arms wrap around the sneering elf's neck, twisting hard and sharp. The sound of snapping bones begin to fill the warehouse. Neither do I. Dylan is shocked as Eddie stumbles across the wall, weak from his blood loss. The small boy tries to support the big man as they continue forward, trying to reach their safe house, but unknown to them, they are being watched from above by three shriveled elves. Now that's interesting, one of the war witches mutters. A warrior, a would-be warrior, full of purpose and full of rage, yet without weapon or armor. The others warn her, now is not the time for games of corruption. Dylan and Eddie press onward, leaving a trail of blood splatters on the floor, smearing it onto the walls. And finally they arrive, moving into the room packed with guns and equipment. Whoa, that's a lot of guns, Dylan breathes. You don't think earthly weapons will help you, do you? The voice calls from the gloom of the shadows, the two turn greeted by the sight of one of Meliketh's ancient war witches. You must know that your situation is more dire than that. Eddie pushes Dylan away, preparing to attack the witch as he draws a pistol from one of the cases. Dark magic swirling around the room as he aims, and suddenly the pistol is melting in his hands. It's not a firearm that you want, is it, Eddie? The witch grins as she watches him with darkness in her empty eye sockets. Floating above her hand, a dark crystal suddenly glows. A rock? I'd rather have a gun, Eddie growls, but the witch simply grins wider. A dreamstone, highly prized among my people. They give life to dreams, desires, and dreams. This one is specific. Weapons. Sweat begins to pour down Eddie's face. His wounds are horrible. I know this weapon you desire. Take the stone and you shall have it. I shall give you purpose with which to wield it. Eddie's hand stretches out with the stone shifting as he gets closer. Suddenly it melts and tendrils of power begin to wrap around his body. He stands ready, clad in a new symbiote with arcane ruins. This is different. Same, but different. He growls. Dylan looks on worried as he asks if Eddie is still in there. It's me, Eddie. I'm all right. He answers. The war witch moves forward. She has given Eddie what he desires. She has given him new armor, new symbiote powers. Within, he can heal. She has given him strength. Now you shall use these gifts for Meliketh's crusade. Her words are cut off as Eddie uses his new teeth to sever her arm at the elbow. Purple dark elf blood splattering the room, dripping from his jaws. Nah. The elf falls to her knees, clutching her wound. Why did I not foresee this? She crows, dark magic swirling, and the witch disappears into her portal. Eddie looks over his shoulder to see Dylan staring at him with fear in his eyes. Don't look at me like that. Only way to fight a monster is with a monster. He crosses the room, handing Dylan a weapon. You're, you're, you're leaving me? The boy timidly asks. I can't sit this one out. I'm supposed to protect people. You'll be all right, Dylan. He tells him as he exits the room, but before Dylan could stop him, Eddie hits the button to seal the doors to the safe room, locking Dylan within. In the city, fire and smoke rage around the group of dark elves as they play with the family that they captured. Shoot him between the eyes and I'll commit my next three murders in your name! One calls to his companions, aiming his bow at a struggling man, his family watching on in fear. Didn't I tell you, you don't want the kind of trouble a guy like me could bring. The elves quickly react to Eddie's entrance, but not quick enough. 
The first head is severed as the comrades leap away, firing arrows against the intruder. Yet their leaves don't take them far enough. Tendrils lash out of the new symbiote, piercing the warriors. Eddie turns, catching a fallen sword, slashing across their stomachs and through their armor. The war cry reaches him, and he turns to see a massive troll leaping towards him, war axe at the ready. The symbiote lashes out, ripping the head off of the troll's body. The voice in Eddie's head tells him to kill, destroy. It scares him. The symbiote stands amongst the bodies of its fallen enemies, roaring into the night. Who are you? One of the saved civilians asks. I am Venom, Eddie says. Elsewhere in the city, the war witch has materialized within a small apartment, still clutching her wounded arm. She should have seen that Venom was too unpredictable. To have seen his betrayal, she cannot let her sisters know of her failure. Who are you? What are you doing in my apartment? A voice asks. I can give you a gift, the witch offers, turning to the occupant. She offers another dreamstone, offers it to the man so that he may help her turn and kill Venom. If you aid me in destroying Venom, I will make all of your dreams come true. And stepping out of the shadows, Jack O'Lantern reaches for the stone. Don't mind if I do. In the safe house, Dylan opens the bags of MREs, staring at the wheat snack bread that he finds within. His face becomes a look of disgust. I'm supposed to eat this? In the city, Venom lifts a tank over his head, giving the civilians nearby time to run. His new suit, it's different. It feeds off anger and rage, and the tank belongs to Roxxon, who are aiding the forces of Melikath. Anger pulses through Eddie, and the symbiont becomes stronger, throwing the massive war machine to the ground. The soldier driving the tank crawls away, screaming for help. Tendrils lash out, pulling a war axe to Venom's hand. With one mighty swing, he cuts the tank in two, and the soldier struggles to his feet, starting to run. Yet the symbiote is holding on to some of the Dark Elf arrows. With blinding speed, the tendrils launch the arrows forward, embedding them into the soldier's back. The soldier still crawls, but Venom stalks forward, anger still pulsing through his body as he ends the fight with a swing of the axe. Suddenly, a blast of fire hits him from behind, and he roars with rage. Let me get this straight. You use an elven artifact to give you the suit of your dreams, and you still made it vulnerable to fire? Jack O'Lantern laughs as he flies by, riding on the back of a fiery goblin. Venom stares at the villain with rage in his eyes. Miss me? The two launch into battle with Venom swinging his massive troll war axe, yet he is stopped as Jack breathes fire into his face. Lashing out blindly, Venom knocks Jack away, but before he can recover, the villain sets his dogs on him. Hellhounds leap from the destruction around them, barking and growling. Eddie likes dogs, but the suit wants battle. It wants death! The axe severs one as the other is pierced by the sharp tendrils. Not wasting any time, he leaps after Jack, clawing his way up a building. He turns, looking for his prey, only to be smashed against the side of the building by a giant mace. Be-fi-fo-fum! I know three heroes who are going to squish Venom! The giant laughs as Jack-o'-lantern flies around them. Venom tries to launch away, avoiding another swing, only to be slashed by Jack. He roars in pain and anger. He's too small to fight the giant, and he doesn't have a big enough axe. And he begins to think back at his life, his childhood, his time as a hero and a villain, his rage and his anger. Anger floods the symbiote, filling it with power, and it grows. Venom's roar echoes throughout the city as he grows massive with the anger that lives within Eddie Brock. He turns now the size of the giants, biting down, sinking his jaws into the cold flesh of its neck, rearing back and tearing away the flesh in a fountain of purple giant's blood. The second falls as the axe cleaves its head from its body. The third tries to stop him, tries to wrap its massive arm around his neck from behind. Yet the symbiote is a weapon. Spikes suddenly jut out of its back, piercing the giant's body, killing him instantly. Didn't forget about little old me, did you, big fella? Jack asks as he rains fire down upon the massive venom, and he tries to attack. But now Jack is small and quick, raining painful fire from above. The fire burns, coursing around venom, and he falls to his knees, shrinking once more to his original size. And he struggles from the fire as the symbiote burns and heals itself. He stands, the suit now torn and ragged. It changes and morphs, trying to protect him. Now it's armor. Shaped as a memory from the past, it's no longer a living suit. It is a Venom as guardian armor. Jack doesn't have time to finish Venom. He has a job to do. And the armored warrior watches from the ground as he flies away. Elsewhere, the war witch cackles. The more Venom fights, the more a warrior of Malekith he becomes. She orders Jack to finish the task. The villain launches forward his fiery glider, growing in size until it's practically a dragon. The beast breathes fire into the streets of New York. 
Venom's eyes grow big as he sees the civilians burn. He hears their screams. His eyes glow red as the rage begins to take over, and he launches himself upward, watching the destruction on a rooftop, clad in his Asgardian armor. The symbiote slides down, wrapping around the war axe that he carries, and he starts to swing it. He throws the weapon, sending it spinning towards its target, and the blade slashes across Jack's ribs, bringing forth a cry of pain and a gush of blood. And he smiles as he calls the weapon back, so unlike his old symbiote, yet so different. Jack hurls his own scythe, yet Eddie easily leaps away. But Jack has been transformed by the witch's magic too. The scythe begins to morph before Eddie's eyes, and suddenly standing before Eddie is a jack-o'-lantern golem, powered by magic. The Dreamstone says I can do anything, says the guy who can't shake the Halloween costume. Eddie roars as he leaps forward, the axe meeting the scythe with a hard metal clash. Eddie is strong, the axe is snapping his enemy's weapon, yet Jack uses the magic and the broken shards to suddenly pierce through Eddie's flesh. How do you like these pumpkins? The villain cackles, blood dripping out of Eddie's mouth, yet it simply reforms into a hardened shell of the symbiote. With a roar, Venom punches his fist through the golem Jack, ripping him apart in a spurt of dying flames. The real Jack is behind him now, riding his fiery creature. There you are. The real you want a shot at the title now? Venom turns, readying his weapon, yet it is slow and blasted from the roof in a wave of fire. He lands in the alley below, his suit smoking, tendrils writhing in pain. The suit begins to change again, not waiting for Eddie. He stands, turning to see the people hiding behind the dumpster, pleading with him to stop fighting, just let the villains move away. The mortal has left sacrifices, offerings to the verdict throne. Eddie turns to see the fire goblins stalking down the alleyway towards them, their bodies the outlines of creatures in pure flame. Run! Get clear! I'll hold them back! Eddie yells to the people, turning to face his new threat. He moves to meet the demons toppling beneath their strength. The suit burns, twisting as he holds the creatures at bay. He manages to throw them away, yet their blast of heat holds him there. He remembers the, remembers the sun that he left behind, that he needs to protect. And once again, the armor surges with strength and tendrils lashing outward, marked with powerful ruins. His claws are now crystal sharp, cutting through the demon flesh of the goblins, molten blood dripping from his fingertips. One tries to escape with the armor taking over again, launching razor blades at the fleeing goblins. Eddie moves back into the street and he can see Jack-o'-lantern burning the people around him and then he realizes the armor can do anything. The dreamstone that powers it can do anything that he can imagine. So it peels off his body, becoming smaller bits and pieces. Eddie falls as the last drop drips away, which counted on my anger. But I'm done being used, he breathes. The tendrils and pieces of the armor move forward, finding those that need protection, those in danger. A woman cries out in startled fear, yet the armor is not hurting her. It's protecting her. Now she stands ready, clad in her own suit of Asgardian symbiote armor, and the symbiote finds others wrapping them in protection. Suddenly, a squad of Venom warriors stand ready in defense. Eddie stares down. The symbiote hasn't even fully left him yet, and his armored hand grips a powerful axe. The Venoms stand ready, fighting against the fiery demons of Nesselheim. The creatures then fall. Seeing the defeat below him, Jack bellows in rage. You can't get away from me. I'm a living nightmare. Eddie looks up, holding his axe in the air and dreams of the only Asgardian that he actually knows. Rain begins to pelt downward and lightning cracks from the sky, striking Jack and throwing him. The Dreamstone bounces away only to shattered human lies in the pavement. And from the range strides Eddie Brock. Hiya, Jack. The villain tries to crawl away. He's a nobody, nothing. And Eddie agrees, turning away. The rain continues to fall, and the symbiote armor disappears. Returning to the safe house, Eddie forces his way in with a crowbar, finding the barrel of a rifle staring in his face. You're back in your, uh, not Venom, Dylan notes. Eddie tells the young kid what happened. As long as they keep their heads down, they should be safe. Meanwhile, back on the streets, the rain continues to fall on the pulsing dreamstone, and a hand reaches for it. Nigeria. The jeep speeds through the grasslands with Spider-Man at the wheel, the rest of the League of Realms riding in the back. Titania, the giant, running alongside them, smoke curling off the bodies of animals as they pass, leaving the smell of charred flesh in the air. Hmm, smells good, Ood the troll remarks. Spider-Man knows that this is awful, yet the League are no strangers to war. Spider-Man turns to the person riding shotgun. Hey, I'm sorry, uh, what's your name again? I've met a lot of new people in the last few days. Once again, the wood wizard of Vanaheim, known as Roe Bloodroot, introduces himself. Of course, 
How could I forget? Spider-Man notes before asking how long their stealth spell should last. Bloodroot confirms that the spell should allow them to enter the city undetected, provided the angels do not have counter spells. Spider-Man has a task force, and he is on a mission. We don't need to hide from these angels! Let them see us! Ood screams from the back, waving his battle axe maniacally. What is the plan again? Honey shot the light up, asks offhandedly. Spider-Man just steps in the gas. A work in progress, he confirms, once again questioning why Thor put him in charge of this strange party earlier. I don't get it, why me? Spidey says, looking up at the big god of thunder. Thor explains that the League of Realms has always been made up of members of each realm. And with the war now being on Midgard, they need someone from Midgard to lead them. And you're the most Midgardian man that I know, he says with a smile. Ha, huh, thanks. Spider-Man is still unsure though. He's not a warrior, he's just a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Yet Thor smiles broader. That is why you're perfect, Spider-Man. Now we go back to the present. With the jeep passing another encampment, Roe points out that the city of Lagos is ahead. The plan is simple. They sneak into the city, rescue any captives, and find the angel in charge. Her name is... Spider-Man shuffles through the name Rolodex in his mind, trying to remember. Fernandi, Roe offers. Right, Fernandi! Spider-Man speaks over his shoulder, giving everyone their assignments. Elfman! My name is Sir Ivory Honeyshot of Elfheim. Honeyshot, you're the dwarf person. It's Grobeard of Nidovar, son of no ears, son of a wound. Spidey just keeps going while Screwbeard runs through his whole family tree. Troll guy! Ood. Excuse me? My name is Ood. Ood, you're with Giant Lady. Within the city of Lagos, Fernandi, the leader of the Angel Warriors, sits within her crumbling church. Her wings stretch behind her as she cries gently into her hands, memories of her argument with the queen flashing through her mind. She begged the queen, begged her! to take her place. The Queen of the Angels spreads her wings in anger. Melekath has destroyed Asgard for them, has offered them wealth untold from his war on Midgard. Fernandi bows her head. She knows the rewards will be great, but this price is too high. It's not fair. The warrior's thoughts are interrupted as a voice calls out to her and she stalks forward to her soldier, who reports that a vehicle approaches the city walls. Is there an old god? Fernandi questions, and the warrior nods. Fernandi knows that the League will think that they are cloaked. Let them think that their trick worked. Let them into the city, and when we have them surrounded, RIP OUT THEIR HEARTS! Spidey looks around as the jeep creeps slowly through the bombed out city. Titania's bow held at ready behind them. The quiet is unsettling, he remarks, and Screwbeard frowns in the back seat. It is annoying. Above them, the angels stand guard, merely floating in the air like silent sentinels. Yet Ro looks up, knowing that something isn't right and is surprised to find the angels are watching them. They can see us, he cries, and with these words, the battle begins as the angels swoop in for the attack. As the rest of the league leap out of the jeep for the fight, Spider-Man floors the pedal. Retreat if you must, Spider-Man, but we will stay and do the fighting for you. Ood cries as he swings his axe. Realizing his team isn't leaving with him, Spider-Man hits the brakes, leaping into the fight. He lands back to back with Honey Shot, firing his webbing at the angels to bring them down. The white licorice that you fire from your wrist doesn't seem to be killing any of them, Spider-Man. The light elf notes offhandedly. Yeah, I know, I'm not trying to kill them. Suddenly, Screwbeard's blunderbuss is pushed into Spider-Man's face as he calls him a traitor. Spider-Man pushes the barrel aside. No, I just, I don't kill people. The rest of the League continue to fight, and they begin to question why Spider-Man is even there. Spidey watches as Screwbeard launches his grenades at the angels, missing and blowing up a building behind them. Fear and anger fill him as he launches himself at the building, knowing that there must be people inside. He crashes through the window, calling out for anyone, and a young boy peeks his head from behind the door frame until his family calls for him. Spider-Man jumps in the door, though, and he finds the family hiding. I'm here to help, he explains. He has to get them out of there. He also needs to find the leader of the angels, and he asks if they know where she is. The little boy points out the window, indicating the church. Of course, the leader of the angels, the church. Why didn't I think of that? Within the church, Fernandi stands, watching the explosions, seeing the bloody feathers of her sisters falling. Hey, Big Bird! Spider-Man calls in the window as he lands in front of the warrior. Yet Fernandi launches forward, grabbing the hero by his head. She launches through the air, smashing him hard against the wall, throwing him back down to the ground. She is a high angel of the army. She is the embodiment of death. She raises her glowing sword, ready to end Spider-Man. I cannot be stopped, she growls. I'm so sorry, Spidey tells her as he stares up at her blade. The angel pauses, stunned. I am sorry. Do you ever wish you could stop? Spider-Man asks her. He does sometimes. How? The warrior asks, peering at him suspiciously. Spider-Man extends his hand to her. 
The first step is helping me up. The battle continues to rage on outside when suddenly the order to stand down rings from the top of the church. These creatures are not our enemies. The League stares up at Spider-Man standing beside the leader of the angels. What is going on? Diplomacy. I don't like it. Ood remarks alongside his comrades. Standing amongst her warriors and those that she once called their enemies, Fernandi tells her story. The angels are forbidden to fall in love and that is when she met Anemone. But when she met Anemone, she could not help herself. Then Meliketh came. He made a deal with the Queen of the Angels that he would destroy Asgard for them if they would help him finish his war on Midgard. Meliketh wanted only one thing for the bargain to be struck. He had never killed an angel. He wished to know what it felt like. The warrior was chosen at random, and it was Anemon. Fernandi pleaded with the queen, begging her to take her lover's place, but it was too late. She watched as Anemon's body slumped to the ground, and all Meliketh did was shrug and walk away. Fernandi stands before the League of the Realms now and explains that Spider-Man is the one who broke her out of her blood-stained sadness and showed her a different way. So what? You're one of the good guys now? Honeyshot asks. And Fernandi declares that she owes Spider-Man and her angels will find a different path. Yet, the rest of the League still doesn't trust her or her warriors. Spider-Man tries to reason with his teammates to explain, yet his arguments fall on deaf ears. Do not talking and angel nonsense. We shall head north where the Dark Elves run wild. Screwbeard cries as he, Ood, and Honeyshot turn to leave. The only two who decide to stay are Titania and Roe Bloodshot. Thor made you our leader for a reason. Fernandi stands with the web slinger, questioning why he let his soldiers leave. I can't convince them to stay right now. There's not enough time to debate on the merits of winning hearts and minds. We'll join them later, after we release the prisoners that you have taken. Spider-Man and the Angels cross through the broken and destroyed city, finally arriving at the gates of the detention center that the Angels have erected. He moves forward, preparing to set the people free when a warning from Bloodshot splits through the air. Incoming! The ground explodes around them and everyone is forced to get to cover when suddenly there's a sharp crack as gunfire fills the streets. Oh good, bullets! Fernandi peers through the broken shards of the wall around them, and it's a human army seeing that their defenses have been lowered. She prepares to attack, offering to silence their weapons, but Spider-Man stays her hand with a quick snap of his webbing. No, we won't hurt them. Just keep them busy for a moment, he orders. The web swinger turns to Roe, asking for a distraction while he orders Titania to join him on door duty. Green magic begins to flow from Roe Bloodroot, and he flows into the air in a ocean blue bubble. The military turns their weapons at this new threat, firing hastily. The rounds have no effect, and suddenly the bubble bursts and the water flows down on the enemy, sweeping them away with the current. The rest of the military prepares to continue firing when the officer calls for them to stop. Look, it's the prisoners, they're free, the soldier calls out. The soldier is confused when suddenly Spider-Man stands before him. All right, I can explain. Spider-Man stands before the commanding officer and he quickly explains how the angels have switched sides. The officer leans in very close. They invaded our city. They took control of it and imprisoned our people, he growls. Spider-Man understands, but now the angels are going to work alongside them to defend the city. Fernandi steps forward. That's right, General. My soldiers are now your soldiers, she explains. The warrior angel turns to the wall crawler, pledging to join him in his fight against the Dark Elves. That is, if you would have me in your League of Realms. Vatican City. Ood swings his axe, cleaving through the bodies of several Dark Elves. Screwbeard fires his grenades, blowing up the small crowds while Honeyshot leaps and flips, firing his pistol into those who stand in his way. The group turns, seeing the teeming mass of Dark Elven army before them. There are so many! Where did they all come from? Yet Ood just smiles. It doesn't matter. We know where we'll be sending them. Suddenly the army turns and retreats, leaving the three warriors standing slightly confused. Of course they did! They smelled the stench of the comrades' viscera staining the walls. Ood claims raising his fist in victory, yet Honeyshot turns, staring at the massive warrior behind them. Or not. Ood and Screwbeard rush into the fight, but are knocked aside with little effort. Ood falls smashing into the ground, while Screwbeard tries to rescue his friend he's thrown clear across the courtyard. Curse raises her gaze upon the light elf. Now, now, perhaps we can talk about this. Honeyshot offers his hands, hovering over the pistols at his hips. But you really don't seem like the talkative type. He draws fast, the pistol bucking in his hand as he fires. The rounds bounce harmlessly off of Curse's armor. She grabs his hand, crushing it with her weapon, and he fires with his right to the same effect. Suddenly, Curse leans in very close. Somebody kill me. Memories of her time fighting alongside the League of the Realms fills her mind when she was known as Wazira. She had agreed to be Meleket's proxy in Nastrand prison, hoping that it would reunite her with her fractured people. Soon though, Meleket started his war and freed her. She could still feel the sting of his magic piercing her back, transforming her into curse. 
She stands over the fallen honey shot, repeating her request, kill me. And Ood's axe clashes with her armor from behind. Gladly! He cries, yet she whirls, her fist connecting with his face, throwing him aside again. Honeyshot struggles up, watching his comrades get beaten. We need to regroup. And suddenly he backs into someone behind him. Looking over his shoulder, Spider-Man stands there with the rest of the League at his side. What are you doing here? Saving the day, obviously. Now, what is that? Spider-Man responds, pointing to the armor-wearing warrior tearing through them. Honeyshot quickly explains the League's history with Curse, catching Spider-Man up to speed. Yet before they can act, the retreating Dark Elven army has suddenly returned, and the warriors prepare themselves. Spider-Man gives everyone their orders, but Titania will wake up Ood the Troll and help Ivory Honeyshot take care of the Dark Elves. Rowan Fernandi will help him with Curse, yet Fernandi stands fast. I will deal with the Dark Elves. I yearn for their blood into my hands. Spider-Man nods, and Honeyshot offers his assistance with Curse, when suddenly Spider-Man pauses. Where's Screwbeard? The dwarf comes sailing through the air, firing his grenade launcher rapidly at the armored cursed. Die a thousand deaths, you infected ghost rectum! Never mind, I see him! With this distraction, the League leaps into battle, with Roe beginning to probe Curse's magic armor, leaving only Honeyshot and Spider-Man to deal with the menace. That still doesn't mean we should go easy on her. Spider-Man jokes as he swings into action with Honeyshot firing his pistols through the rain. The rest of the League launch into the fight with the Dark Elves, magic and steel biting deep into their flesh. Bullets bounce off Curse's armor as Spidey leaps in for a kick. Why is she making this so hard? Before you showed up, she asked me to kill her. Honeyshot asks, firing again and again, and Curse's massive fist flies towards Spider-Man's back. But Honeyshot is there to push him out of the way, and the blow catches him in the spin, throwing him away. The elf lays on the ground, unable to move, as Spider-Man leaps to defend him. Bro, anything? He calls to the wizard. He could feel something beneath the armor fighting back, and the image begins to form in front of him. The one of a soul trapped within. Honeyshot looks up as the face of a dark elf forms, and his eyes widen and shut. It can't be. Wazira? The elf stammers as he sees his old comrade. Spider-Man seems confused, but suddenly is snagged by curse, his body being crushed. He's saved, though, by Fernandi, as she comes charging from the battle, grabbing Curse, plowing her through a building. The rest of the League begins to reform, with Roe believing that there might be a way to magically pull Wazira out. And they charge into the building after their new friend. Curse rains blow after blow into Fernandi's face, slamming her heart into the wall. And the angel begs for this, begs for death! Fight back! Curse stammers, but Fernandi refuses! Kill me! Both warrior women beg at the same time. And suddenly a web shoots out, pulling Fernandi back outside, with Spider-Man standing over her, demanding to know what she is doing. She knows now, no matter how many dark elves she kills, the scales will never be balanced. She will never get her love back. What's the point? Spider-Man gets it. He knows what it's like to lose someone pointlessly. He knows what she's feeling right now, but their moment is interrupted as the building begins to crash down around them. Curse stands before them again, yet her body begins to glow as Roe finds cracks in the armor's magic and begins to apply pressure. Curse screams in pain as Spider-Man tells Roe to keep it up. He's knocked aside by another blow and Fernandi is pulled close to Curse. She begins to scream again as Roe continues to work. He screams for them to get clear, for the explosion will be powerful. Fernandi closes her eyes, prepared for it to end. Suddenly, she's yanked free as Titania grabs her and runs clear, with Curse exploding in a ball of bright, magical energy. And standing in the enemy's place is the Dark Elf Wazira. I'm free, she stammers. Spider-Man and Rogue grab her before she falls, as the words of thanks pass through her lips. Inside the church, Fernandi looks at the female giant while Titania clutches her in her arms. Why did you do that? She asks. Titania looks down at the female warrior in her hands and finally speaks. We all lose people important to us, but we keep fighting. Not to kill what is ugly, but to save what is beautiful. Wazira staggers free of Spider-Man and Rose arms. She doesn't need to rest. She needs to help the rest of the League. And outside, Ood and Screwbeard ready their weapons as an army of Dark Elves surround them. Honeyshot, still unable to walk, leans his weight on the dwarf's leg and cocks his pistol. I must say, gentlemen, it's been an honor fighting alongside you, the Light Elf tells his friends. Don't say your goodbyes yet, Honeyshot. The League of Realms is just getting started, Wazira cries. And with the League whole once again, they launch into battle against the vast enemy. Loki suddenly sits up, last remembering his own death. But the smell of death and blood are now around him. His head pounding, confusion filling him as he looks around. The bodies of dead trolls and elves surrounding him in the smoky battlefield. I hope I didn't do this, he mutters, staring at the carnage. You didn't. 
A voice calls her behind him, forcing him to turn. I did. The ancient Loki smiles. He's larger than Loki can remember, being his body is covered in armor, and he's carrying a great club. Oh, bloody hell, he mutters. It's gonna be a worse morning than he thought, the trickster god cursing as his younger self steps forward. What do you want, you cheap Viking conjurer? Yet his younger self merely laughs, commenting how Loki hates to be confronted by his true self. The two stand amongst the carnage of war, with Loki asking his younger self if he was responsible. Aye, not bad for an afternoon's work. It certainly did the job. <laughs> it made me smile. He grins at the sight of the older Loki's disgust, and Loki stares down into the blade of a sword, piercing a man's eye. All of this for his own amusement, all to take his mind off the troubles of Thor. Suddenly, he turns at the sound of a cart being pushed behind him. Look out! Corpse burner at work! The young voice calls. Turning, he sees a young dark elf pushing his cart towards a roaring fire, hearing the words of the master calling to a young Meliketh. Loki is stunned to hear the name of the accursed one, and he turns to his younger self. Who gives a dorse fart what his name is? He'll just be some dark elf war slave. He'll likely be dead before the end of the day. The younger trickster snorts, seemingly not caring who this Meliketh is. Yet, Loki knew that he wouldn't. He watches the young elf turn his cart over, tossing another body onto the fire. He knew that he would live a long life of horror and hardship, a life that would leave him frightfully strong and scarred, forever accursed, and eventually, the man who started the War of the Realms, the man who has invaded Earth. Horror fills Loki's face as he realizes that Meliketh will never forget the fruits of a war that he grew up with. A war that he started. By the gods. It's my fault I created Meliketh. Loki finally realizes, looking at this former self, this past of his. He runs forward, calling out to the young boy. He can stop this all from happening. He can be taken away from all of this. And upon reaching the young elf, Loki merely passes through him, tripping and stumbling on a rock, turning to himself. What did you do to me? He demands, yet the true question is, what did Loki do to them? Don't you remember? You got us killed! Young Loki snorts, and images of being devoured by his father, Lofri, fill his mind. The feeling of the teeth grinding into him suddenly overpower him. I was eaten by Lofri, he remembers. I'm dead, I'm in hell! You are my hell! He mutters, turning to his younger self, but his younger self once again snorts. <laughs> this isn't hell! Although you might wish it was before your visits are through. Anger fills Loki and he demands that his younger self end this, launching at him with magic flowing from his hands, but the younger Loki merely waves his hand, launching the older one away. Loki now stands in Jotunheim, watching as his father, Lofi, rages and shouts about someone leaving flowers at his doorstep. His axe slices through the head of another ice giant, with icy blood raining down as the head bounces to a stop in front of Loki. I suppose the ice of roses were a poor choice, but in my defense, I never celebrated Father's Day before. He mutters at the decapitated head. Loki watches as his father continues to rage, killing more of their giant brethren. This happened weeks ago, and there's nothing he could do to stop it. I wouldn't feel bad if I were you. They're frost giants. It's sort of their way of life. The child version of himself calls out from behind. Loki just glares at himself. He's already met the ancient Viking version of himself, and now he's dealing with the present, or at least the present that should have been. The child Loki shrugs, but Loki continues to glare. He didn't want this. He didn't want to be the villain again. He did what he had to do to save Lady Freya. He stabbed her in the back to save her. The images of him slicing his mother in the back with his poisoned dagger fill Loki's mind, and he stares in shock at his own hands. Finally, he turns back to child Loki, glaring at him again. And I would do it again! He snarls, but the child simply shrugs. I have to hand it to you, Loki. When you tell a lie, you sure stick with it. They stand now in his room, surrounded by a pile of useless things. Loki traded him away, traded the child Loki for a mouse hole in his father's castle. Tell me this isn't the biggest blunder you've ever made. The child turns, angrily glaring at the older version of himself. Loki doesn't answer, instead staring down at a photo of Lady Freya. His mother. They say the Norns are dead, but our fates are up to us, he whispers. And it doesn't feel that way. It never felt that way to me. He turns back to himself, ordering himself to take him away from this place. Let him die in peace! Child Loki merely shrugs and sneers. You think you're here because of me? 
You're here because of you. You're here because even in death, you can't help but admire yourself. And with a smile, the child waves his hand and casts Loki away. He sees himself now, his eyes blackened by dark power as he pierces Ego, the living planet. Behold Loki, the Necro God, the All Butcher. He screams out, with Loki floating off in the distance, watching himself. This can't be real. I'm already dying. This is a lie. This must be. But the dark Loki, the necro god Loki, turns, an evil grin twisting on his face, floating at Loki, smiling. Lie? Why would I tell a lie? There's no one left to listen. <laughs> but Loki pushes him away, trying to lash out with his magics. He won't let it end this way. I will not be the greatest monster who ever lived. But the black tendrils lash out, wrapping around his limbs, and the dark Loki leans in. He wants to know. You're not the ultimate Loki. I am. He launches Loki away as he flies through space to find his brother, and he spins in the void, fear washing over him. This cannot be real. I'm dying. I was eaten by my father. I can stop this. All of this. He shouts, closing his eyes, concentrating. He can end this. Then he opens his eyes, and a scream escapes his lips. He floats in the acids of Lofi's stomach are burning through his skin, his arms floating by his face, and he screams again, realizing, Why am I alive? Please, by all the gods, Loki must die! Next, we bring you the Asgardians of the Galaxy, number 18, the continued tie-in series, to this story. Shards of the Bifrost, the rainbow bridge of the gods, float through space, drifting gently away from the floating tomb of Asgard. A portal opens emitting a large spaceship that lands on the former home of the gods. With a steaming hiss, the ramp lowers, revealing Angela, Scourge, Thunderstrike, Throg, Urzul, the Dwarf, and Annabelle, the Asgardians of the galaxy. Quickly, the team begins to move through the destruction of the former city. Uh, Angela, does the home of the gods always look like this? Thunderstrike asks, looking at the ruins. The Warrior of Heaven reveals that Asgard is but a shadow of its former glory. Ready your mace, Thunderstrike, she warns him, and they continue to move forward until Angela looks at their dwarf, questioning whether the Naglfar beacon is safe aboard the ship. Urzel waves his hand dismissively. It's locked aboard the ship, sealed in a vault, warded by fire and ice and a few mystic traps. Do not put your faith in your traps, dwarf. A powerful voice calls from behind them, and the team turns to see Heimdall stepping from beneath the shadows of the ship, carrying both the beacon and the fragment of the rainbow bridge that they use to power their ship. The Nagofar beacon is a powerful weapon that can aid us in the battles to come, the god nods. And I'm gathering all of the shards of the rainbow bridge. Heimdall informs Angela of Meliket's army, of his forces marching on the final realm, marching on Earth. We need your sword, Odin's daughter, he tells her. Annabelle steps forward, concerned on her face. Final realm? He's talking about Earth! She cries, and Thunderstrike steps forward, determination on his face. He has family and friends on Earth. Heimdall tells them of the battle, how the heroes of Earth fight to hold back the new lords of Midgard. I have gathered enough energy from the Rainbow Bridge to send you all back. And Angela extends her hand, motioning to the beacon, taking it from Heimdall's hands. It was crafted as a weapon of war. Give it to me and we will put it to use. Finally, Heimdall turns his unseeing eyes towards Annabelle Riggs, the Valkyrie. He begins to give her a warning of the future, yet she stops him. No offense, but I got friends on Earth who need my help, so maybe save the doom and gloom prophecies for later? Multicolored energy begins to surround them and the team vanishes, leaving Heimdall alone in the Tomb of the Gods. In Manhattan, the battle has already begun, with the team quickly spreading among the other heroes, fighting against the forces of legend and myth. Spider-Man swings over the teams as Scourge and Urzel open fire on the Dark Elves. Thunderstrike swinging his mace, casting lightning while Captain America fights giants. The shield bearer stops briefly, turning to the young Thunderstrike. I knew your father, young man. I think he'd be proud of you joining us today. Kevin appreciates the words, but he's still worried about the rest of his family. And that's when Spider-Man swings by. Hey, we're evacuating people as fast as we can, kid. Is that a frog in a Thor costume? The battle rages on, yet there seems to be no end in sight for Melikov's forces. Annabelle drops in, using the power of her Nova helmet to save the people who can't escape. But the power dims and fades, and she is forced to run. As the giant chases them, the energy begins to crackle around her as her image alters and changes. Valkyrie has joined the fight! The Angels of Heaven join the battle, and Angela clashes swords against their leader, cursing her for joining forces with Meliketh as the battle rages on around them. Scourge struggles to his feet, arrows sticking from his back. You gonna live? Punisher grunts, and the Executioner nods, so Frank Castle tosses him a rifle. 
Then take a gun. The two stand together, firing into an army of Dark Elves. Above the battle, Throg, seeing a plume of fire rising from Central Park, leaps into the air, heading to the home of his people. Lightning cracks as he lands in the park, seeing the charred bodies of his former brothers, staring in sadness as the park burns around him. The fire imps come from a tree, screaming for death and pain. His small hand tightens on the hilt of his hammer, and the rings begin to fall. Surprise begins to fill the imps' faces as they look up, just in time to see the lightning strike them. And with that, the battle continues. Stand together, Asgardians! Do not falter! Angela cries, launching herself in a bog mammoth. No matter how many of Meliketh's forces fall, though, there always seems to be more. Valkyrie flies in on her Pegasus, her sword slashing through the invading force. Yet she begins to shift as she feels Annabelle taking over again. I'm sorry, Valkyrie, but I know you'll never leave the fight and there's something I have to do. The young woman apologizes as she points the winged horse away from the battle. Knowing that his friend may need help, Thunderstrike rushes to her aid, with Scourge calling for him to crush any Elves that you see along the way! The remaining warriors turn as more enemies begin to converge upon them. We might be down half our team, but the enemy forces don't seem interested in letting us regroup. Urzel comments, loading his weapon. A few blocks away, Annabelle flies in, seeing her lover Ren twirling around a group of dark elves, her dancing ribbon slashing them to pieces. The flying horse bowls through the rest of the elves, scattering them. Quickly, the young woman dismounts, rushing over to embrace her love. But before the two of them can kiss, Annabelle begins to disappear, drifting away as if on a breeze. Thunderstrike arrives just in time to see her go and hear Ren call her name. Annabelle now stands before a collection of Valkyrie warriors, armor shining, swords drawn. One points the tip of her blade at her. Where is your counterpart, Brunhilde? Leader of the Valkyrie, she demands. Now we bring you the War of the Realms, issue two. Greenridge Village, a large crowd has gathered outside of the Sanctum Sanctorum as the battle rages elsewhere in the city. Everyone stares slightly confused at the glowing green spectral Basset Hound that floats before them. Right this way, New York! You know the evacuation protocols, no pushing! He yells to the crowd as they begin to enter the Sanctorum. Don't worry, there's plenty of space for everybody. The safe room can hold a couple million full-grown humans, he continues. Move along, no staring at the ghost dog, just follow the talking snakes! The young woman next to him tries to help. Hey, girl! What up, you evacuate here often? One of the snakes asks a passerby. But as the people begin to push inside, Jane Foster steps out. The ghost dog floats to her, questioning whether the Asgardians have been evacuated. Yes, Bats, but there's still another longboat coming from the Bronx, she informs him. The dog nods and continues to talk, yet Jane isn't listening anymore. She can feel something, something calling to her from the battlefield. Elsewhere, the bodies begin to litter the ground around a familiar van, and a group of dark elves stumble and fall away. He's just one man! Why can't you useless mongrels bring him down? The leader screams, stepping forward, yet the answer is simple. The dark elves have a natural weakness to iron, and the Punisher has an endless supply. Frank begins to open fire, shooting a burst shot into the dark elves as another tries to sneak up behind him. But the elf merely gurgles as the three adamantium claws pierce his chest. Wolverine, heard you were dead. Nah, just really drunk for a long time. How have things been, Frank? I'm reloaded. Frank nods. Good catching up. Frank aims his weapon and he opens fire as Wolverine charges into the fight. Meanwhile, Captain America dashes up the stairs of an apartment building, ordering the civilians to get to their evacuation points as he charges past them. Knowing that he's high enough, he leaps through a window, smashing into the Frost Giant's head, shield first. The massive enemy stumbles and falls, shaking the ground around them, with Cap landing, rolling back on his feet. Somebody find me another giant! I'm going back up! Above the city, Iron Man careens through the endless valleys of steel, concrete, and glass as the warriors of heaven chase him. T'Challa! Could we use the teleporter at Avengers Mountain to get out of here? He asks. Sif launches herself at a swamp mammoth, and the Black Panther doesn't even slow his attack against the Fire Imps as he informs Stark there's something crashing all the global networks. I can't raise the mountain. Elsewhere, amongst all of the destruction, Dario Agar, head of Roxxon, laughs, congratulating his employees over the phone as he drinks coffee. I have a spell, but it comes at a heavy price, Doctor Strange calls, as Curse wraps his hands around his throat. Still, I would have done it in five minutes, but I'm having some performance issues right now! Elsewhere in the battle, the rest of the heroes continue to fight on. Okay, big and fiery. You must be from hell, right? Spider-Man quips as he leaps and flips from Cinder. I'm the Queen of Muspelheim! Hold still now, she bellows. <laughs> I'm so confused. Is there a map around here somewhere? And he leaps again. Yulik collides with She-Hulk, complaining about how he has to fight the green half-wit. At least yours has meat on its bones, Enchantress states, looking bored as she casts spells at Ghost Rider. Robbie Reyes tries to block her attacks with his hellfire, and simply responds, Keep it up, lady! You're gonna piss off my car, and you wouldn't like it when my car's pissed off! 
Suddenly, the Enchantress is knocked away as a Viking longship rams into her, with Jane Foster leaping clear of it, a sword in her hand as she surveys the battle. What in God's name are you doing here? Lady Freya cries as she rushes over. The two dodge clear of a rushing ice giant as the battle continues on. The air is suddenly filled with the sound of a rolling horn, echoing throughout the battle and the city, giving everyone pause. The two warriors look to the skies as an army of Valkyrie riding upon winged horses pour forth from a rainbow portal. At the head of the charge flies Odin, armed with his spear riding a black stallion, fire snorting from its nostrils. Sound the horn so that the whole damned realm can know that the god of gods has arrived and that hell comes with him. Odin rides forward, his body glowing with the Odin force as he pierces straight through a frost giant's chest, bursting out the other side covered in gore. If Meliket wants a war, buy my beard, we'll give it to him. Brunhilde rides forth, her blade slashing giants as she comes, with Jane rushing to her, sliding on the back of her pegasus. You're strangely familiar, mortal. Do I know you? She questions. Jane nods, telling her to picture her with a hammer in her hand and it'll come. Now take me to Melikath! Odin pushes back the lords of Midgard, finally floating down to his wife. You look like hell, husband. She informs him. The king shrugs off the comment. I'm as strong as a build snipe! Freya hangs her head, sadness filling her as she tells Odin of... Loki's death. In that moment, the king of the frost giants pushes through the smoke and the flames of destruction, and anger fills Odin as he wheels his horse, energy crackling around him. Yet he is slow, and the giant smashes him hard into a wall. Brunhilde and Jane ride through battle, their swords cutting through the forces of heaven quickly. Realization dawns on the Valkyrie that she rides with the former goddess of thunder. I thought you'd be more blonde. They see Meliketh riding his bog tiger in the distance, yet Jane will not be the one to end him. The Pegasus tilts, throwing Jane onto a rooftop. You've already fought enough battles to last a lifetime, Jane Foster. Go and enjoy life. You've earned it. She orders her swooping away. Jane turns, though, shocked at the sight of the vampire hunter Blade, locked in combat with three war witches. She rushes forward, her blade clipping one of the witches long enough to throw off their spell. Elsewhere in the battle, though, Doctor Strange can feel the magical interference lift. His eyes glow as he lifts from the ground and he begins to cast his spell. By the beard of Vashante, let the purple veil be rent asunder. I, Doctor Strange, will pay the soul toll for all who pass. A massive portal opens. Blue tendrils begin to snake outward into the city. Meliketh and his forces converge on the portal, wishing for no one to escape the war. Yet Brunhilde swoops in, crying for aid. Valkyries, protect the portal at all costs! She orders as she rides straight for the Dark Elf. Meliketh, meet Dragon Fang. Meet your doom, Dark Elf. She hisses as their blades lock. Yet Meliketh merely smiles. All I see is a dead woman on a horse. Throughout the city, the tendrils snake out, pulling all of the heroes and civilians alike into the portal. Steven, your spell is too strong, Captain America cries as he's being dragged in, when suddenly all of the heroes stand in the war room of the Avengers Tower. We have to go back. The fight isn't over, Jane calls as she rushes forward, but Freya disagrees as she drags her wounded husband into the room. Meliketh's forces are too strong. They need her son. They need Thor. They need to stop Meliketh's black Bifrost in Svratrheim. They need to end Roxxon interference with the global networks. Captain Marvel steps forward. This is war. She will fight it in the trenches with every soldier that she can find. I can think of no better captain for the job, Captain America tells her. They will need to reach the other realms, yet Heimdall still cannot see. He won't know where to send them if they can't open up the Rainbow Bridge. Freya steps forward. They all have a mission. In her absence, she names Jane Foster all mother of Asgard. Yet, Jane is not listening. Tears fill her eyes as she looks up at the war room monitors. The news shows the massacre of New York. The bodies of the fallen Valkyrie are scattering. Pegasus blood is filling the streets as the Dark Elves continue to wrestle with them. Yet the battle is not over. On a pile of bodies, blood flowing from dozens of dark elf daggers sticking from her body, Brunhilde fights on. Is that all you elves got? My blade is far from dry. She screams. She turns, glaring at the sea of her enemies. Meliketh, stop hiding behind your magics and... But her words, they are cut off as shock fills her face, falling to her knees, finally staring down at the glowing blade that is piercing her chest. Meliketh stands behind her, a smile pulling his lips to his ears as he rears back with his blade, and he swings.
All Mother Freya walks into the Avengers Mountain Armory, with the walls covered in all manner of weaponry befitting the various members of the team. If it is true that Meliketh has created a Black Bifrost in Valtelheim, then shutting it down is the only way to halt the flow of his troops. She explains that she is crossing the room, heading to Thor's vast arsenal of magical weapons. The goddess lifts one of Thor's oldest weapons, the axe known as Yonborn, the weapon that wounded even Apocalypse. The All Mother stares at the axe, knowing that with Odin wounded, she is the only one who can lead the mission against the Black Bifrost. She turns, offering the weapon. Which means I must ask a great favor of you, she says, offering it to Captain America. I need you to go to Jotunheim, find my son, and bring him home. Cap takes the axe in his hand, nodding in his acceptance. When do we leave? At the gate of the Bifrost, Daredevil stands with Heimdall, the former guardian of the Rainbow Bridge. Heimdall warns him that by taking up the sword, he will see all and tread where only gods have before him. Well, if there's one thing that I've learned, I'm not a very good Catholic. Murdoch states as he grasps the hilt. Pulling it free, the bridge is once again activated. And throughout Avengers Mountain, the different strike teams are sent on their missions. Behind Daredevil, Jane Foster enters the chamber, armed with Odin's staff and the Destroyer at her side. Malekith will know the Bifrost is active and he will come for us. We're the only warriors Asgard has left, so get ready to hold the bridge. The All-Mother orders it. We now move into the Strike Force Land of the Giants book. Spider-Man sits on a frozen hill overlooking Avengers Mountain, thinking back on the strange event of his day. Suddenly, the snow crunches behind him and startled, he finds Captain America standing before him, dressed for the cold, wielding a very large axe. We need to save the world, he simply says. Peter nods. He was just thinking that. And he points out Cap's new weaponry. This was Thor's axe when he was young, Cap explains. Ah, I had a stuffed bear. It was called Fluffles McGee. Probably not as significant. Cap turns, motioning for Peter to follow him, yet Spider-Man is startled when he sees how Captain America got to the top of the mountain. The wings of a golden armored Pegasus beat in the air, pushing the wind around them. Cap mounts the animal and calls for Spider-Man to join him downstairs. Sure, I mean, I could swing down, but... Spider-Man's cries of joy echo throughout the mountains as the two of them swoop off of the mountaintop, riding the back of a Pegasus, something Spider-Man never thought he'd be able to do. And inside of the Avengers War Table, Cap explains their mission to save Thor to his strike team. Wolverine, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, and Spider-Man will be on this mission with Cap. That's not really a mission. Something this epic should be called a quest, Danny Rand notes with a smile on his face. Quickly, the heroes agree to accompany Cap and the team move down to the armory. Feel free to choose whatever Asgardian weapon you would like. They're surprisingly well labeled. Cap motions. So Iron Fist chooses the twin swords of Sprag, whose edge all Jotunheim fears. Luke chooses the hammer of rock, which cracks giants like eggs. I'm good. Logan notes, popping his claws. Only Peter seems hesitant. He's not really a weapons and smiting kind of guy. Cap nods and hands him a golden shield. They can be useful, he says with a large smile on his face. And from behind, Logan slaps a helmet on Spidey's head. Magic helm, he says with an even bigger grin than Cap's. With the team fully armed, Cap suddenly turns. Daredevil, can you hear me? I hear you, Steve. I hear everything. The voice fills Roger's mind and the team stands ready. Captain America orders him to open up the Bifrost. At his station, Daredevil twists the ancient sword that acts as a key to the Rainbow Bridge and the ever watchful Heimdall is over his shoulder. In the armory, the bridge opens with the cold winds whipping the room into a storm. Everyone get ready. Cap orders, confusing Luke Cage. Yet the Valkyrie's Pegasus were bred for war, and though their riders have fallen, they are still prepared to fight. I am so into this! Spider-Man cries as the five heroes ride the flying horses on the beginning of their quest. Ah, uh, we need a name! Danny comments as he turns to Logan. No, we don't. How about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, or the four horsemen who all punched apocalypse? He asks. No. Iron Fist turns to his friend Luke, who is merely shaking his head. There's five of us. You forgot to count yourself, didn't you? Luke asks. I forgot to count myself. Suddenly, the rainbow portal opens up and the team is flying over the frozen wastes of Jotunheim. A river the color of purple flows through the valley. Do you think we can find Thor? Cap asks, turning in his saddle to Wolverine, who merely nods. I say we just follow the river of giant's blood. The heroes swoop low, flying over the vast purple river of blood. Shh, easy, buttercup, Spider-Man says, leaning in, patting the neck of his steed. You named your horse? Logan asks, raising an eyebrow. You didn't? My horse is called Horse. Spider-Sense kicks in a moment too late as a massive arrow sails through the air, piercing Luke's Pegasus, knocking the hero free. 
More arrows begin to fly from the ambushing frost giant archers, piercing Logan's horse next. With a growl of anger, he sails through the air, popping his claws, colliding with a giant, burying the blades deep into his chest. Luke sails in next, dropping another with his mighty hammer. You are not hurting Buttercup! Spidey cries, blocking the arrow with his shield before swinging in to crunch the frost giant in the nose. The giants stumble in fear as they see the fearsome weapons that our heroes hold. And seeing this, Peter turns to Logan. Hey, what does the helmet do? Wolverine continues to slash at the downed giant, telling him, I don't know. It was the most ridiculous helmet I saw in there. I mean, it has a little shade to cover your neck and we're on a dark ice planet. <laughs> Wolverine simply grins, still slashing. Spider-Man looks embarrassed at the ground. You know, I preferred it when you were dead, Logan. The battle is quickly over, yet all but Spider-Man's Pegasus have fallen. The heroes turn to see the final Pegasus bowing before her fallen comrades. Logan turns, motioning for the rest of the heroes to do likewise. You want us to bow to horses? Danny questions, yet Logan merely glares, ordering them to bow again. The heroes do, paying honor to the fallen warriors. Are we just gonna leave them here? Questions Peter. Surprisingly, a voice answers. No, they will not be left here. Peter springs away from the voice of Buttercup. Whoa, you're a talking horse? The Pegasus explains that all horses are talking horses, yet it seems that Spider-Man's helmet is allowing them to understand each other. I am Queen Arcturus. She introduces herself. That's a nice name. Buttercup was also nice. The rest of the team look on as the strange horse noises keep coming out of Spider-Man. Finally, the queen orders the heroes forward, for the God of Thunder needs them. She will say the words to usher the fallen kin's souls to the sky. The team pushes forward, pushing through the land of ice and snow, following the river of blood, and once that river ends, it turns into a mountain of bodies. Thunder rumbles as lightning flashes, and standing amongst those bodies, blood dripping from dozens of wounds, stands the God of Thunder. He stands with one arm missing, while the other clutching a hammer that has been broken over his enemy's heads. More giants! Send me more Odin damned giants! Send them all! He cries out. Wolverine has seen this. It's a berserker rage, and he has been there before. For Luke Cage, it was one time in Harlem. For Iron Fist, he once raged fighting a group of ninjas. I had a particularly bad day with Hitler. Captain America nods solemnly. The group then turns to Spider-Man to see what his rage was. Uh, yeah, there was this one time on a Black Friday sale. It's all a bit of a blur. Next thing I know, I bought a microwave. The heroes know that the fight will not end until Thor's enemies are defeated and from behind, the queen arrives. Peter tries to explain that this isn't her fight. We are of the Ten Realms. If the realms fall, stallions, mares, foils will all be enslaved, she explains as Peter gets on her back and her wings unfold. You fight for your kin and I will fight for mine. Let us fight together, noble jester warrior. With these words, the two fly into battle and our heroes charge, fighting the frost giants. Captain swung his ax. Luke Cage's hammer fell over and over again and a blow from a massive club sends him flying. Yet he struggles to get back on his feet. Come on! He cries in anger as he readies his fists. The battle raged for hours, days maybe. But finally, the frost giants fell. Captain America struggled to stand, yet Thor was there, hand outstretched. On your feet, Captain! The helmet! Fight me the damned helmet! Spider-Man screams into the wind as he kneels over the body of the Queen, pierced by a massive arrow. Sadly, Logan tosses Peter the magical item. He struggles to hear her words over the blizzards of Jotunheim. She does not wish to be buried in this frozen land. Take me home, noble gesture warrior. The Queen's final words echo in his head. Peter did his best at burying the queen in the sky so that her soul could soar within the clouds. The heroes take a knee for their fallen comrade. For war, we'll just have to wait a moment. After her conversation with Captain America, which sent him off to Jotunheim to try and save Thor, Freya moved on to her next task. Captain America suggested that I speak with you. He doesn't like you, but he respects you. She says, turning to speak with Frank Castle, the Punisher. With his black bifrost, Meliketh seeks to corrupt every part of the earth. Meliketh is ink in clear waters. To touch him is to become him. Frank just grunts. What you become is your choice. Can't put that on someone else. Briefly, Freya stares at the Punisher, evaluating him with her cold blue eyes. For a man surrounded by majesty and terror, you are remarkably simple, Frank Castle. Frank merely nods. Frank is one of the simplest things. Point and shoot. Meliketh is from her world. He's your problem to solve. Do what it takes to solve it. Yet Freya knows that this is easier said than done. She needs mortals to aid her in her task. Those who are burdened by anger. Frank nods. 
I could list them off, but you're gonna have to convince them yourselves. So Frank gives her names. She-Hulk, Ghost Rider, Blade. He tells her not to think of them as people, but as weapons. It is later that Freya explains the mission to the group of heroes, with Jennifer Walters cutting right to the point. Don't lie to me. Is what you're asking possible, long shot or not? Can we even succeed? This is a warrior's chance, Miss Walters. The all-mother nods, and the group look at each other. Ghost Rider merely wanting to know if the creatures deserve the pain that they are going to bring, while Blade hesitates to have to clean up the god's mess. Frank just turns. Bullets don't work on these things. Bullets work everywhere. Mankind's one enduring achievement, she nods. The goddess then raises her hand. Time is of the essence. Do I have your commitment? Jennifer has her reservations. The team is a group of madmen and murderers. They all raise their hands. Looks like we're yours, she says. Freya smiles in Asgard. They don't believe only tales of legends. She needs to see the heroes fight, to know that they have what it takes to complete the mission. Magic begins to glow through her and the room is bathed in light. Ancient power, I call upon you. Test them with their fears. Show me their darkness, she cries. Jennifer Walters stands before a judge, her cousin Bruce Banner. She always thought he was weaker, that he let the monster win, rage filling the Hulk as he launches himself at her. She struggles briefly before the monster within takes over, and She-Hulk meets her cousin in the battle as her true nature takes over. She will never be as civilized as she wants to be. Ghost Rider, in his dream, is standing in the crumbled remains of New York. From the ruins steps out Johnny Blaze, the king of hell, his chain of hellfire lashing out, the will of vengeance mocking him. You are no rider. Yet our new Ghost Rider breaks free of the chains. He is not afraid of penance. He has mastered his fears, his rage. Blade stands before an ancient gothic castle. The door falls inward at a strike from his boot and before him sitting on the throne of human bones sits the king of vampires himself. You will stop protecting mankind. You will stop hunting our blood. You will accept your destiny. I am your future. The old Blade intones in anger. Blade lashes out, sword striking the darkness. Blade knows that his greatest enemy will always be himself. One by one, the heroes realize that what they are seeing isn't real and Frank Castle kneels in a dark room, a smoking pistol in his hand, and the bodies of his comrades littered around him. Lady Freya, the others have figured it out. I think they passed your test. One by one, the heroes defeat their worst fears, and one by one, they pass the test. They break free, striking out against the one who put them in this place. And that's when Freya meets them in battle. The Void dissipates and the team stands once again in the war room. She turns, bidding the group to ready themselves for the toils that lay ahead. Later, the team has arrived at Svetelheim, disguised as the members of Melikath's black forces. The plan is suicide. We should just start stabbing everyone, Blade hisses from beneath his dark elven armor. Yet Freya tells the Daywalker to keep his sword in its sheath, for she will do the talking. Suddenly, one of the guards steps forward. What in slimy hell are those? He questions, indicating She-Hulk and the poorly disguised Ghost Rider. Freya steps forward, noting that they are a troll and a fire goblin, ready to be sent to Midgard to join the glorious battle. Ugh. Ain't Meliketh great? Ghost Rider tries to help in the ruse. That is the ugliest troll I have ever seen, another Dark Elf laughs. She-Hulk growls with anger and takes a step forward, yet notes how large the other two Dark Elves are questioning their clans. Having given up on the plan, Frank shifts aside his mossy cloak, bringing up his submachine gun and opening fire. So much for the plan. If you squint, they look like vampires. Blade cries, throwing his disguise away, drawing his sword. Freya's blade bites into the dark elven flesh as she turns to her team. Rider, no point in hiding. Call forth your steed. And the Hell Charger appears, with the team riding forward on the blaze of Hellfire. Traveling across Vettelheim, the team quickly arrives at the Black Bifrost. Frank opens fire as Blade's sword slices through the Dark Elves guarding the Black Gate. Blade notes that they are going to need explosives for the gate, which they didn't bring. A wire the car to blow. Frank offers over the sound of gunfire. I don't recommend touching the ride, Punisher. Ghost Rider notes, yet Freya knows that they have all of the explosives that they need. Don't we, my Lady Hulk? In response, Hulk slams her fist down, building up enough gamma energy within her. The battle continues to rage on as the Hulk's energy builds, and finally she has enough, readying to destroy the Black Gate. While everything else is going on, the heroes continue their various missions throughout the Ten Realms, and the war continues on Earth. Deadpool dives away, his pistol blazing at fiery sharks that are following him. I swear to God, if you guys ruined Shark Week for me! Then he realizes that his bullets are having no effect, so the merc with the mouth turns and runs into the woods. You do you! He cries before turning around, drawing his swords, slashing back through the beasts. 
Nobody likes something that can take six bullets to the head and keep coming. He then stops, staring down at the melted katanas in his hands. And that is speaking from experience. The creatures turn back towards him, and Deadpool is forced to jump off of a cliff towards the ocean below. Okay, okay, you win! Stop chasing me! He twirls in the air, lifting his mask, blowing a raspberry back at the sharks as they plummet towards the fire-extinguishing water below. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how you dispense of a school of lava-fueled nightmare fish! He turns and sees the creatures still coming at him, though. Their fire burning through him fast. Deadpool tries to swim, but suddenly the jaws chomp down upon him. Darkness surrounds the murk as he finally opens up his eyes. It's surprisingly dark as that of a fire shark. Light fills his eyes again as the shark is suddenly slashed open and the king of the sea stands before him. Explain yourself, Namor demands. <laughs> well, I'm Deadpool, sort of like Spider-Man with guns crossing the moral and ubiquity of an early Wolverine, the Merc over explains. Like many heroes, Namor does not find Deadpool very funny, and he demands to know why he was in the stomach of a fire shark. Quickly, Deadpool fills the king in on the events on the surface, the entire War of the Realms. And so now a bunch of D&D weirdos have turned up on Earth in an episode of Game of Thrones. One of the late season mind blowers. Lots of CGI, Namor. Angrily, Namor motions to the massive window behind them, blaming Deadpool for bringing Asgard's problems to him as they stare out at the Mer people battling against the horde of fire sharks. I mean, that's not what I was trying to do, but hey, look, Captain Marvel. Carol Danvers comes roaring into the battle with Lady Sif at her side. The two quickly defeat the rest of the sharks with Captain Marvel stepping into Namor's throne room. Permission to enter, your majesty. Permission denied, Namor simply states. Yet Carol meant it as more of a courtesy and continues onward anyway. The captain came to propose a truce, hoping that Namor would aid the planet in its war with Meliketh. Yet Namor declines, as always believing the surface's problems are their own. Meanwhile, Deadpool stands over the corpse of a shark, introducing himself to Lady Sif. Was it you that brought the fire sharks under sea? She questions with an upraised brow. Seemed like a good idea at the time, Asgard lady. It's Sif. Good work. Lowering their body temperature makes them easier to kill. In disgust, Carol turns away from the Submariner, telling him to save himself. I always do. Namor growls. As Captain Marvel stalks away, Deadpool calls out to her again. Hey! Are you guys putting a team together? Cause I'm like totes down to save the world. Meanwhile, back at the Avengers Mountain, Carol overlooks the view screens that show her images of the Earth. While the strike teams all set out against Meliketh, Punisher and Ghost Rider's team going to the Dark Elf Realm, and Captain America and Spider-Man's team going to Jotunheim, the land of the giants to try and recover Thor, it was her job to protect the Earth. How's it going? Questions Deadpool. Well, nobody's dead yet, so better than expected. Your optimism is positively contagious. The Merc turns away as Lady Sif, standing over the war map of the planet, orders him to leave Carol alone. Standing over the table, Sif pushes these small markers to indicate where the enemy forces are supposed to be, while Deadpool continues to make his jokes. Suddenly, he jumps as Weapon H is standing over his shoulder. Did you guys get your own Hulk? He gets interrupted again as Venom is now behind him. Okay, okay, I'm getting the military theme here, but that's not soldier Venom, that's tentacle tongue 90s Venom. Carol explains that it's all hands on deck. This is war. Their job isn't to win, it's to lose slowly, to hold the line. By standing in the way of an enemy spear, the soldiers behind you can break through. Haha, <laughs> grim, Deadpool notes. Ice covers the landscape in Arizona as the Frost Giants patrol, and inside a Stan weapons facility, Winter Soldier and Black Widow sneak quickly through the security systems, moving deeper inside. With some quick leaps and twirls, the two go through the lasers, finally arriving at the armory. The two spies then gather what they need and they begin loading it onto a military aircraft, when suddenly the roof caves inward as a massive blue foot stomps into the room. I'm telling you, something is skittering down below! The frost giant booms above them. The head leans in next, seeing the two tiny humans. The spies dodge as a hand reaches to grasp them. Natasha, fire in the hole! Bucky yells as he tosses a grenade. The explosion blows up the giant's hand, forcing it to rear backwards. The aircraft flies out of the building, banking against the giants to only be yanked out of the sky. The engines begin to whine as they continue to try and push forward. Back to Frosty, Carol cries as a blast from her energy smacks the giant in the face. The Quinjet opens fire as well, banking past the massive head. Still weirds me out that you know how to fly a Quinjet, Sif. I have flown a Randy Pegasus into a battle against many centaurs. This iron box is child's play. 
More Frost Giants join the battle. Open the doors, we'll do the hitting. Weapon H calls as he and Venom launch themselves into the fight. One giant falls immediately as Weapon H snaps his spine. Venom's tentacle blades slash the limbs off another rapidly. Yet another giant slams the symbiote into the ground. Surprise fills its eyes though as the symbiote slithers and crawls its way back up the limbs of the Frost Giant, stabbing it through the brain and ending its life. Later, the battles continue across the Earth, and in Sweden, Deadpool and Black Widow fight the Dark Elves in battle mechs. You gotta take a selfie, Natasha. If the world sees you fighting evil in one of these battle suits, they are so gonna finally make that Black Widow movie. Despite Sif's blade and Bucky's guns, the Dark Elf forces continue to overwhelm our heroes, and Black Widow and Deadpool are forced to abandon those suits, allowing them to detonate and take out as many Dark Elves as possible. Yet despite their efforts, the heroes are still backed into a corner, surrounded by their enemies. Quickly, Carol speaks into a medallion. Captain Britain, we need an exit. She calls, and a portal opens up in the wall behind them. The bearded superhero leans his head out. You rang! Quickly, the team passes through the portal, and they arrive at a well-kept green lawn. Welcome to Brattic Academy, the proving grounds for wizards and kings alike. Captain Britain explains. Wait, 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 wait. We had a magical portal to buff Dumbledore's doorstep. Why have I been getting my butt numb in the Quinjet for the last week? Deadpool demands, yet Carol explains that Captain Britain owed her a favor. This was a one-time deal. Captain Britain's goal is to keep the children of his school safe. I will not involve them in the deadly war, he explains. Deadpool turns and begins to rant about how everyone keeps telling him about what his team can't do. Well, what would you have us do, Wade? I don't know, anything, everything, win one battle, then another, and so on. But they don't have an army, and they don't know where Meliketh is. When suddenly Captain Britain leans in, informing them that Black Knight and his team have been battling Meliketh in London as early as this morning. Let's go get the goofball, Deadpool cries. Concerned excitement fills Carol's eyes. Maybe they can do this, maybe they can end the war right here. Meanwhile, in London, Spitfire sinks her teeth into a Dark Elf's neck, spitting out the flesh. These things taste awful, she growls, and the rest of the team finish their fight within the pub, with Black Knight pulling free his ebony blade from a fallen elf. Union Jack, do you think that that was the last of them? Believe so, the hero answers as he puts two more bullets into his last foe. The Black Knight orders everyone to take a breath while they can, and Union Jack obliges by pouring a pint. Suddenly, the wall explodes inwards as a swamp mammoth charges in. Well, what do we have here? All cozied up in the alehouse. Hard to blame you. I suppose one last drink before the end. The grinning face of Meliketh, the accursed crows. Union Jack chugs his beer. Meanwhile, back in the War of the Realms, issue 3, page 12. Our heroes fall quickly to Meliketh and his forces. And finally, the accursed one stands over the Black Knight. Ebony blade in his hands. This is quite the extraordinary sword, admiring the dark metal. So lovingly cursed, so beautifully bloodthirsty. The Dark Elf turns to see his forces rampaging through the destruction of London. You once called this Europe. It will now be the new Svletherheim, he explains, lowering the point of the sword to Black Knight's throat. Suddenly, the Quinjet streaks through the sky with Carol and her war Avengers joining the battle. Get ready to eat that sword, you bastard! She cries out, ordering her team into the fight. Yet Cursed launches herself, blocking Carol's assault on Meliketh. Venom roars as he attacks the Dark Elf. My, my! Aren't you all a pretty sight? Back at the Bifrost, Daredevil can see everything, and he can see that Meliketh holds the ebony blade. He can see that Midgard is slipping away. Not if I have anything to say about it, Jane Foster says from behind him. Suddenly, a dark portal opens up behind them, and they see the chamber is filled with dark elves hell-bent on destroying the Bifrost. Jane, Heimdall, and the Destroyer launch themselves into the fight, protecting the bridge and their forces throughout the realm. Daredevil, now a god, draws the Bifrost blade and leaps into battle as well. And the war continues. Back in Avengers Mountain, Tony Stark and Shuri work alongside the dwarf, Screwbeard, to build a new weapon. He would think that the two of them are dwarves, except for the fact that Tony doesn't drink and Shuri's a vegan. Elsewhere in the base, Black Panther prepares the defense as Meliketh's horde has reached their doorstep. And on the other side of the world, Raz Solomon, an agent of Wakanda, is fighting against the forces of the Roxxon Corporation to restore the world's communications array. She screams over the radio that Roxxon has taken control of Antarctica as she banks hard away from the helicopters that are chasing her. In the dark oceans, Namor continues to fight against the fire sharks that are threatening his kingdom. And back in London, Venom launches himself at Meliketh, his blow sending the Dark Elf straight through a bus. You're one of Thor's greatest enemies! We ain't impressed! The symbiote snarls, but the elf merely dusts himself off, the ebony blade glowing in his hands. Oh, I'm sorry, has our fight begun? The elf laughs. He has been talking to the symbiote, 
learning of its dark history. Venom attacks again, though, realizing the sorcerer's plan too late. And with an evil smile, Maleketh stabs the ebony blade deep into Venom. One can never have too many weapons. The blow causes the shockwave, and suddenly Venom and the elf are gone. Back at the Bifrost, Daredevil could hear Meliketh laughing, Thor screaming. The Bifrost blade bites deep into another dark elf as the fight continues, and suddenly he stumbles and falls. It's too much. There's too much noise in the universe. One of the elves sees his chance slipping through the warriors, a bomb in hand. Look out! That one's getting past! Jane yells as the Odin spear stabs another enemy, and with a bright light, the bridge explodes into a shard of rainbow colors, cutting off the heroes across the realms. Meanwhile, back at the end of Strike Force, Dark Elf Realm. Wait! Freya cries. Something has happened. She could feel it across the realms. The Asgardian Bifrost has been destroyed, and if we destroy this one, we are trapped forever. The goddess turns to the Black Kate, her team standing amongst the hundreds of bodies of their fallen enemies. I will hold the bridge. The rest of you take the Bifrost and get back to the front lines. Freya stands forward. She knows the only way to hold the Black Kate is to claim the power for herself, so she grasps the sword, drawing it forth, filling her body with the dark energy. Dark eyes glowing from a black energy turn, staring out into the next wave of the dark army as they rush for the bridge. Manhattan. All is calm within the storefront of a music shop as a young student plucks away at the piano. The teacher leans closer to him. Hold your hands together a bit further apart. You have to get used to the stretching, he tells him. The door then crashes open hard, startling the man and his student with the light blocked by the man who enters. You there, music teacher. Frank Castle grunts as he stalks across the room, fear gripping the man and he begins to stammer. Oh God, I got, I, I brought back some weed from Colorado. It's legal there, but I should have known something like this would have happened. Frank Castle stands over the man, murder in his eyes. I need piano wire. He states simply. The man leans back in his chair, surprise on his face. Sir, what piano do you have? Frank just stares. Sweat pops up on the man's head again, and he quickly gets Frank a spool, offering it to him on the house. Frank turns, runs back out, calling over his shoulder for the man to barricade his store and not come back out. The War of the Realms has reached Midgard, and Frank's, well, Frank's busy. He runs, tying the wire to a street lamp. Turning, he quickly pulls his pistol, firing at the dark elf poised over a woman with a sword about to drop. The woman screams as the elf slumps dead at her feet. He doesn't even slow down, running to the other end with the piano wire across the street. His trap is set and he draws his weapons. The dark elves come running down the street, riding the backs of hellhounds. The city belongs to the dark elves now, kneel or die, their leader cries too late as he sees the wire. He doesn't even have time to slow down as that wire slices through his neck, severing his head in a spurt of purple blood. Frank turns, holding a weapon at each hand, and he continues to fire. Stay out of New York, he growls, firing his submachine gun through the skull of a hellhound and into its rider. The enemy drops, and Frank takes a second to reload. Suddenly, the ground quakes and cracks around him, and he remembers that he's sick of this Avengers crap. The frost giant stands over him, swinging a carriage that luckily is missing its horse and rider. Frank leaps away, avoiding being squished flat. He then turns, pulling the pins on two grenades, tossing them at the giant's feet. The Punisher runs for it, feeling the heat of the explosions, hearing the screams of pain from the giant behind him. A little man hurt Kasklaka! The giant screams, his prey ducking underneath a gas truck. Oh, I'm gonna do worse than that. He growls at himself as he cuts the fuel line on the truck. He rolls out, leaving his lighter behind. The giant seems confused as he lifts the truck and doesn't find the little man. The flame licks the fuel as it drips from the cut lines, creating an inferno that engulfs the mythical creature's head. No, 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 no! The giant screams, hopping up and down in pain. It turns, looking at the tiny human that hurt him. A car careens towards the giant, its driver lost in fear. The family within screaming as they are lifted from the ground. Put them down! Frank orders, his hands clenched in fists. I'm right here! Come get me! He screams, trying to get the giant's attention. But it doesn't work and the car is heaved across the street. Frank jumps, managing to get clear of the explosion. Thinking that his foe is dead, the giant turns, lumbering off into the city. And watching it leave, Frank manages to tear himself away from his urge to follow the monster. And he turns to the burning car. 
he doesn't hear any screaming, and that's a bad sign. So he pushes through the flames, feeling the heat searing his skin. The father is still alive, crying for Frank to save his family, but the man doesn't realize that his wife and his son are already dead. Broken bones sticking through the flesh in his leg as he's dragged free. Yet, he can't feel the pain and he still calls for his family. I'm sorry, they're gone, Frank tells him, hoisting him on his shoulder, carrying him away. Breathe into the pain, I'll get you help. A few blocks away, the two come upon the Silvari Memorial Hospital. The scene is in chaos. Doctors and nurses trying to stabilize patients in the streets as the hospital burns behind them. Frank puts the man down, calling out for help. Before he could turn away, though, the man pulls him in close. I know who you are. Find that monster, avenge my family, he whispers. There's no place in this universe that is safe for him now. Frank nods when finally one of the doctors comes running over. She tells him to take the man somewhere else. They're evacuating into New Jersey through the Lincoln Tunnel. Sounds like a suicide mission. Through the perfect place of an ambush, Frank notes quickly. The doctor stares at him for a second before turning away. They have no choice. They are a low-income hospital that no one cares about. Frank stands amongst the chaos, watching the doctor leave. A few streets over, a prison bus is stopped amidst the traffic. Yo, man, you gotta get us out of here! One of the prisoners calls, but the guards know that they aren't going anywhere. The windshield shatters inward, startling everyone as a massive fire spear impales the driver. Oh, meat! <laughs> the fire goblin cries as the prisoners scream. A grenade then impacts into its head from the side as Frank dashes along the crowded cars. He reloads and fires again. The creature, well, it falls dead. Frank calmly picks up his weapons and he steps aboard the bus. Fear crosses everyone's face as they realize the Punisher just saved them. The remaining guard tries to step forward, but Frank drops him with the taser. And then the Punisher stares at the men before him. Killers, thieves, and rapists. All of them. He drops a bag of swords and axes. Normally I'd kill you all and go get a sandwich. But you've seen what is happening out there. I need a few bad men to help some good people. Everyone stares at him in silence. We're gonna help a hospital evacuate through the Lincoln Tunnel. I'm your warden now. One of the men in the back jumps up, running forward, calling for the others to rush the Punisher with him. No one does. Frank raises a pistol, stopping the man at his tracks. He looks around to see if anyone plans on joining him, and no one does. Frank fires. In the Lincoln Tunnel, the hospital workers are preparing to enter when suddenly a fire drake comes flying out. The dark elves leap out of the shadows, their blades glinting in the sunlight. The elf is impaled, though, falling in a pool of its own blood. The doctor turns to find Frank and his prisoner standing behind her. You were wrong, Doc. I care about innocent lives. Frank turns to the rest of the workers, giving them orders. Stay 20 yards behind us and I'll get you through this. A short time passes and the hospital staff and patients are pushing through the darkness of the tunnel. Around them, the tunnel is a darkened nest of destroyed and abandoned cars. The sounds of strange beasts and metal clashing with flesh can be heard up ahead, where Frank and the prisoners are fighting. Suddenly, the doctor and a patient scream as something comes out of the darkness. Following a little too close, Frank growls, waving his hand for her to stop as he turns back to the troll that they're fighting. The creature throws the prisoner aside with a mighty yell, grasping one in his massive hand. But before anyone can come to the man's aid, the troll bites down at his arm, tearing it away. I hate Earth! Food is terrible! The troll laughs as he spits out the arm and tossing the man aside. One of the prisoners steps into Frank's line of sight, screaming for him to shoot the beast. I'm not even supposed to be here! He cries out. No, you're not. Frank hisses as he fires into the prisoner, dropping him. The creature roars as it rushes them, and Frank fires again, piercing its eye. I'll kill you! The monster roars in pain, but Frank fires again, taking out its other eye. The troll falls, now blinded, and it tries to crawl away. The rest of the prisoners look to Frank, but he merely puts his finger to his lips, motioning for them to be quiet. The troll's cry of pain is bringing its allies here. Growls from further up the tunnel can be heard, so Frank draws a grenade. Pulling the pin, he sticks the weapon into the troll's ear, moving away, allowing its head to explode behind them. The group moves forward in the dark, stopping briefly to steal some food off a vendor cart. They're only halfway through the tunnel now. Feels like we've been down here forever, one of the prisoners remarks. Frank stares at the sign, memories of trips spent with his family filling his mind. Of his children fighting in the back seat while they were stuck in traffic, but he has to shut it away. On your feet! We're moving out. 
he calls out. They stop letting the evacuees catch up to them, and the doctor thanks Frank for his hard work and turns to her employees. She orders everyone to take a rest. Frank turns back to his men. Up your gut. Check for survivors. The group moves forward, but suddenly the darkness is pierced by a strange fire ahead. What have we here? A voice calls out from the crackling of fire. The fire goblins attack, forcing Frank and his men to fight. So he fires, the gunshots echoing throughout the tunnel. The prisoners keep fighting with their swords, but they fall one by one. For every goblin that is dropped by the swing of a melee weapon, the fire goblins sink their teeth into the soft flesh of a few prisoners' throats. Hellhounds arrive, taking more of the men. So Frank turns as one of them chomps down on the prisoner. He douses the beast in kerosene, tossing his lighter and setting the monster ablaze. The screams from your herd then reach Frank's ears. Damn it, that's the doc. The prisoners keep fighting with one calling that they'll be holding the line while he checks it out. The mace smashing the head of the goblin that he's fighting. Before Frank can move though, he's cracked from across the head from behind. The mace hits him hard. He falls, his pistol clattering out of his hands. He struggles for it, but it's picked up before he can get to it. So I was thinking that now is a good time to discuss what happens when we get to Jersey, one of the prisoners says, pistol pointing at Frank's face. The man has others at his back and he leans in and close. We're almost in New Jersey, Frank. We helped get these people there. I think we're owed a promise of safe passage, he tells the Punisher. The evacuees start to catch back up and the man flips the pistol in his hand, offering it back to Frank. We know who you are, Castle. If you swear on your dead family's souls that you won't kill us when we get there, you can have the gun back. Frank stares over the man before pushing the pistol aside. I swear on my dead family's souls. He gets up and walks away. Anybody still alive when we get to Jersey gets their life back. The group pushes forward, stopping briefly as they see the light at the end of the tunnel. Frank turns, walking towards a semi-truck that is pulled to the side. Banging on the fuel tank gives a slight bong of a full tank. Good, he grunts, turning back to the doctor. He tells her to keep her people quiet while they give the all clear to the other side of the tunnel. He stops as sounds begin to come from the dark. An arrow flies as the troll comes screaming out of the shadows. Frank ducks, firing his weapon into the beast, and the beast falls and Frank is on it fast. How many do you got behind you? The troll refuses to answer, so Frank brings the butt of his weapon down. Once, twice, answer! I'm a scout for the 9th Troll Brigade. I've been ordered to seal any evacuation points in the city. The creature gurgles through its broken teeth and purple blood. Frank nods and fires. You failed. The prisoners turn as more of the creatures begin to move up, but suddenly one of them turns on the others, bashing its friend's heads in, reaching for the gun that Frank allowed him to keep. He spins, aiming for the Punisher, only to be dropped by a bullet. Frank whirls, bringing his submachine gun up to the others. Hey man, I'm aboard the plan! The prisoner stays holding his hands up. It doesn't matter though, as a flaming arrow pierces his neck, dropping him to the concrete. It's down to Frank and Ferenti. The two move fast, firing into the shadows as arrows whiz past them. Frank runs to the semi-truck, tossing Ferenti as lighter as he stuffs a wad of cloth into the gas tank. He pulls himself up into the cab, calling for the prisoner to light it up as he starts the engine. In the distance, the fire goblins pause as they see two globes of light piercing the tunnel. The semi plows through them, squishing the hot goblin blood from their veins as it squishes them under the tires. Frank barrels forward, throwing aside the creatures as he pushes for the exit. At the last second, he jumps clear, smashing the windshield of a car as he rolls to safety. The semi tips over and the air is suddenly filled with fire as the wind pushes against him. The explosion echoes through the tunnel behind him. Outside, the goblins are at full retreat, running and screaming from the tunnel. Frank and Ferenti come running out, weapons at the ready! And they find an almost calm city night. Come out! Ferenti calls over his shoulder. The hospital evacuees come out, finally breathing fresh air again. I can't believe you two did it. The doctor smiles, and she thanks them both, shaking Frank's hand. You don't have to thank me. Keep your people safe and get them to shelter, Frank grunts. Frank and Ferenti lean against a cop car for a few seconds until the Punisher finally turns and begins to rummage through it. Earlier today, I saw a monster crush a car. Killed a wife and kid. Father survived. He pulls out a shotgun slung under the dashboard and pops the trunk. I swore to the man that I'd find and kill the monster that took everything from him. In the trunk, he finds a med kit and some shells. Ferenti watches as the hospital patients begin to move away, with the sun coming up over the horizon. What do you want me to do, he asks. Frank grabs him from behind, bringing a pistol up into his back, and he pulls the trigger. Ferenti turns, shock on his face as his life bleeds out of his chest. The Punisher stares as he falls. The doctor comes back over sandwiches that she found in her hands. Shock subtly fills her face as she rushes to Ferenti's aid. How could you? She questions as he starts to try and administer CPR, but Frank reaches down for one of the discarded sandwiches. How could I not? He asks. 
He leans back, taking a bite as he watches the woman begin to pump the man's chest. I don't miss. She turns, tears in her eyes. You promised on your family's souls. Frank merely wipes the crumbs from his chin. You ever patch up a soul duck? You ever order a soul transfusion? Frank tosses the wrapper away. He needed the prisoners compliant until they got out of the tunnel. He loads the shotgun. I have a soul. This man has a soul. And I even believe you have a soul. She cries. Frank stares down at her. Had. She still cries. Sad that the man died even after they helped them escape from the war. Frank turns, loaded for the fight ahead. No, doctor. The war never ends. The frost giants look up into the dark, icy night air of Jotunheim as a purple mist streaks through the sky. The mist swirls, finally landing, and as that magic dissipates, the mist drifting away reveals Meliketh the Accursed. I smell elf. A voice hisses from the darkness, every word the sound of flames cracking over the roaring fire. Now why, after so many centuries of slumber, do I smell elf? A wide grin spreads over Meliketh's evil features as he stops before the dark cave entrance. It's Meliketh, Sadarang, conqueror of the Nine Realms. If I remember mortal manners, should you not be kneeling? The Dark Elf journeys deeper into the cave, greeted by the massive jaws of Sodorang. He wishes to implore the ancient dragon for a boon, for his aid in this war. Only one realm still remains free of the Dark Elves' grasp, and he would wish that Sodorang would take care of a single man for him. If this boil is so aggressively insignificant, why don't you lance it yourself? The dragon asks. He's clad in iron. Meliketh explains simply. Yet Sodorang merely chuckles at the elves' plight, for iron is the ancient weakness of the Dark Elves. Finally, Meliketh bows before the mighty beast. He has gold, mountains of it. The dragon's great eye finally flickers open as he peers into the dim light of the cave. Gold, you say? Very well. I shall see him crisped. The mighty dragon runs his claws around the bed of treasure that he sits upon before hearing back. Where is the golden knight you speak of? Earth, within the bowels of the forge in Stark Unlimited. Tony, what am I looking at? Rhodey asks as he stares at a massive green bot that Tony's drones keep flying around. Hulkbot? Gamma Droid? I'm still trying to think of a name that won't get me pummeled next time I see the real thing. Tony explains with a smirk. Rhodey just shakes his head. He knows what it is, but doesn't understand its purpose. Tony walks through the lab as his drones finish the final details on the bot, and he pulls the golden crown off of the Hulk bot trying to explain. I built this for Bruce, so that when he starts to rage, when his power starts to come out, it'll calm him. The crown is designed to control one's emotions. Are you sure you built this for Bruce, Tony? Rhodey asks, staring at his friend. The billionaire pauses for a single beat. Does it matter? The two friends begin to discuss the merits of the bot and of Tony's drones building more robots, but Tony thinks Rhodey should just lighten up. Suddenly, the Hulkbot comes to life, smashing everything around them. What am I? What am I? It screams as its massive fists tear apart everything around its existential rage. Shut it down, Tony screams. But the bot is suddenly overriding its own safety protocols, and the drones can't shut it down. Bring me a gauntlet, he yells at one of the drones, and the little bot floats off quickly. The Hulkbot wraps its massive hands around Tony, ripping him from the ground. Luckily, the drone is there, placing Tony's Iron Man gauntlet on his hand. The beam shoots out, destroying the Hulkbot's head, dropping it to the ground. The two friends pulled themselves free of the rubble around them, with Rhodey pointing out that that is why tech building tech is a bad idea. He's also worried that Tony is holding a crown that modifies behavior and won't put it down. Tony looks down at the piece of tech in his hands, and Rhodey knows that he had a drink in the virtual world during the Escape adventure. The videos you can find down below in the Tony Stark playlist. The one that he was trapped in and is looking for more dangerous fixes since he got back out into his own cloned body. Downstairs in the lobby, the security hologram activates asking for the name and purpose of the visitor who strolls in. A staff with a flaming tip in his hands. I am Sodorang, devourer of the flocks, lord of the wind and sky, and I am here to see your master. The ancient dragon, now in a human form, simply states, I am afraid that Mr. Stark is left for the day, Mr. Flocks. The hologram answers with a beaming smile. But Sodorang merely shrugs off the issue, asking where the man keeps his gold. One of the security guards comes walking over, telling the strange man to leave, but Sodorang lifts the man off his feet, choking him. I ask again, where does he keep his gold? He growls, his eyes flashing. I, I don't know, maybe Wall Street? The guard chokes out his answer. Meanwhile, Tony is flying across the city skyline in his car. 
Knowing that his friend is right, he needs someone to talk to, but Janet Van Dyne, his current girlfriend, doesn't answer her phone and it goes right to voicemail. Janet, it's me. I'm kind of having a rough day. Call me. He tells you before hanging up. The rest of the guards come rushing out with the guns trained on the strange man. Draw to your knees and put your hands over your head or we'll open fire! One of them yells. Soderang peers around at the weapons trained at him. My knees? How dare you! He growls, suddenly his body twisting and warping from the man to become the mighty dragon before them. Soderang bows for no man nor god! You wish my forbearance? You shall have none of it, nor my mercy! The dragon looms back, taking in a massive breath before roasting the guards in a blast of scolding fire. Rhodey runs into the security room, asking what the heck is going on to Bethany, the head of security. Three casualties so far, no Jocasta, no Stark on premises. She tells him as she orders the security details to back off at the dragon. Rhodey stares at the images on the cameras, finally turning to leave the room. He plans on fighting fire with fire and myth with myth. Is anyone gonna armor up? The head of security asks. The cat turns. Dr. Shapiro, reporting for duty, suit me up. Meanwhile, the dragon is crawling alongside the outside of the building, crying for House Stark. Bethany comes over, asking why the drones are defending the building. One of the tech points at their screen, and the computers run the drones, and the computers all suddenly speak Latin. The building groans and crumbles as Sotorang smashes it with his fist. I will burn your stronghold, Stark! Face me, you coward! Quit yelling, you old school guys, you freak! Rhodey yells as he zooms in with his manticore vehicle, firing weapons at the mighty dragon. The missiles impact Sotorang's head, stunning the creature briefly, yet he swoops his wing like a blade, knocking Rhodey out of the sky. The manticore crashes into the ground with Sotorang quickly following. May you gods find you unrecognizable for your journey to Valhalla. He cries as he swings in for the attack, but he's blasted out of the sky as Dr. Shapiro suddenly jumps into the battle in his cat armor. The cat fires, but Sotorang merely shrugs off the assault, breathing magic fire into the cat's armor. The heat pushes Dr. Shapiro back as the dragon presses his attack and suddenly he stops as a voice rings out behind him. Hey, Falcor! Hands off the pussycat! Tony yells as he roars in with his armor, punching the dragon in the side of the head. The blow knocks Soderang across the courtyard, causing the ground to shake as he tumbles. You're trespassing, Toothless! There's a hefty fine for that. He jokes as he slams the beast with another blow, adding strength to his armor, knocking Soderang around. The dragon swings its wing, knocking Tony away again. I will have your castle in your corpse! Tony struggles back to his feet as the dragon rushes forward, ready to die, mortal. Pass! Never repeat a good trick. I plan to kick your scaly rear like I did Fang Fang Foom a week ago. Tony mutters as he gets back to his feet. Hearing those words, Soderang suddenly stops short. Hold! You defeated a Foom? He asks, disbelief in his voice. He turns, seeing Tony's allies coming to his aid. I underestimated you, mortal, but I will return with the proper spells and leave you with the curse of wisdom. He breathes before taking to the air, flying away. Oh, and I didn't get you anything, Tony says as he watches the dragon fly away. The group finally arrives with Rhodey asking if he plans on following the villain. Let's kennel the lizard, Tony states, preparing to give chase. But he suddenly can't, and everyone is surprised as his armor suddenly begins to glow with magical energy. Later, Soderang stands at the street corner in his human disguise once again, his eyes watching Wall Street. He walks up to the building, stopped by an armed guard. Hold on a minute, sir. Can I help you? Soderang rears back fire, starting to break out of his hair and hands. Tell your masters that I am here for my 30 trillion dollars. Hurry, morsel, before I get hungry. Back at Stark Unlimited, the group is staring at Tony's armor. Cracks have begun to form and strange magical energy is leaking out. Bethany tries to help her boss, telling him that they think that the dragon infected the AI with magic, which is directly linked to my armor. Tony finishes for her. He looks at his instruments and his entire hut is glowing purple, filled with arcane symbols. Believe it or not, it's actually worse than the inside, he jokes. Suddenly, everyone stares in wonder as the armor begins to shift and morph. Oh, for the love of Dumbledore! Tony cusses as he's suddenly standing in medieval armor, his repulsors glowing with arcane symbols. Rhodey keeps looking at his friend. Tony, we gotta track Sotorang. Can you still function? Stark shifts, trying to get a feel for how the armor has changed. Magic is just a system, right? It has to have coating. So he turns, raising his gauntlet, trying to shoot a repulsor beam. The air sizzles around them, and suddenly frogs are raining from the sky. I think you missed a line of the program, Stark, Bethany says as she brushes frogs out of her hair. It's raining frogs, Rhodey points out. I could see that. Thank you, Team Obvious. Tony lifts the visor on his armor as Rhodey tells him that he should stay behind. If he can't control his wardrobe, he's nothing more than a liability. But Tony turns to see the EMTs picking up one of the falling guards from Soderang's attack. No. Hex or tech, I'm caging that beast for good, he says. The visor snaps closed and Tony lifts into the air on a magical current. 
Energy wings sprout out of his back as he swoops into the air. He tries to call his girlfriend, Janet, again, but he gets her voicemail again. Janet, sweetie, I could really use your moral compass right now, he says as he flies to the city. But within Wall Street, the brokers all stare in confusion as the screens suddenly flicker and change. Strange words and Latin phrases begin to play across them. Suddenly, the building quakes as the mighty soldering crashes through the wall. I've come from the frozen caves to take the king's gold, and I will burn every living thing until I may slumber atop it. Every coin and crystal. He bellows as the brokers all run screaming from the danger. Outside, Tony sees the destruction of running people, landing quickly to face the dragon. The building is dark before him. Um, Illuminatus Gigantus, he asks the armor. And suddenly, the center light of his chest beams brighter, illuminating his way. Okay, there's no way that that should have worked. He rushes forward to the building in his armor. Hey, Falcor! He cries, bringing Sauterang's attention around him. He leaps forward, screaming the one magic word that he knows. Shazam! And bolts of magical energy fall from the sky, striking the dragon in a dozen spots. The beast falls, momentarily stunned. So you are a wizard as well, Stark. He hisses, but a toss of his wing knocks Tony across the room, smashing him into a wall. Massive claws wrap around Tony, bringing him down to the ground. I know what you're thinking, Stark. You're thinking of the women you have betrayed and oaths you have broken. The claw smashes Tony back into the wall, cracking the concrete with force. A drunkard as well! Vow to abstain yet to have besotted yourself at the first possible opportunity. And the great Meliketh told me to fear you. Tony's hands begin to glow with energy again, and he raises them. You're not wrong, Sutterang. I do keep messing up, but I'm trying to do better, and my hands are free, puffin' stuff. The dragon begins to choke as his throat is suddenly filled with frogs. He reels back, releasing Tony, allowing him to fly away. Tony zips through the city, the bellows of Sutterang's curse fast behind him. He gets over the radio, telling Rody to be ready. His friend is confused. Ready for what? Stop! Stop the repairs! We need to take Stark Unlimited back to the Stone Age! He tells his friend. He patches through to Bethany, telling her to pull the plug and everything in the office. Go dark! Do you hear me? Go dark! Stark, I come for your flesh and soul! The dragon roars as he swoops through the city, his wings clipping the buildings as he passes. Tony lands next to Rhodey, ordering his friend to run before turning to the Hulkbot. Hulkbot, I need you to tear this armor off me without hurting the nice man who invented you. He tells the drone. So the Hulkbot gets to work, with Tony explaining that he needs to go low tech. The dragon is a magical virus. Just like a bug, Janet smiles as she flies in. Got your message, brought your compass, she tells her boyfriend. Tony hugs her and then looks up at the incoming dragon. I'm gonna need about four and a half minutes, he tells her. Wasp nods, giving Tony a kiss before swooping into the sky to meet Sodering in the fight. Tony doesn't hesitate. He runs towards Stark Unlimited. The wasp flies in and out around Sodering's head. What a matter of fairy folk does put yourself between the fire and the beast? He questions, but Janet smiles. You're so large and powerful, surely a tiny thing like me can't stop you. But Janet shoots one of her energy blasts into his eye, bringing forth a roar of pain. He makes a bite at her, but the hero is between his teeth and moves away quickly. Sodering flops to the ground, shooting forth a gust of breath to try and burn her. Why did you defend him, consort? You know his weakness, he bellows, and Janet keeps on the move as she knows that everyone has a weakness. Sodarang, let's pretend I pulled the sword from the stone, shall we? A voice calls out, causing the dragon to turn. Tony stands before him in the original armor, built to withstand anti-aircraft guns and rip apart tanks. Low tech, no AI. Tony comes in swinging, his fist connecting with the dragon's head, and he presses the attack, leaping up and cracking Sodorong in the chest. The beast breathes fire, but it doesn't phase the Mark I, and Tony pounds him back into the ground. Blow after blow, the dragon's teeth start to chip and crack, and suddenly Janet is there, pulling Tony off the almighty Sodorong. He's down. He's out cold, she tells him, trying to calm him down. With the danger over, the two quickly hug with Tony struggling to tell her what happened to him in the virtual world. But they're interrupted as Bethany comes running over. She's getting a message from the Avengers. Something is happening in New York. You wouldn't happen to have an elf buster armor, would you? Tony looks at her. This day just keeps getting better and better. The ruins of the once beautiful capital of the light elf realm crumbles around them, with the survivors moving amongst the ruins, with Sir Ivory Honeyshot trying to guard his queen. Sir Ivory, the queen says, turning at the energy that she senses. Get behind me, my queen, he orders, drawing his twin pistols. Yet she shakes her head, drawing her blade instead, ready to stand in defense of her people. Dark energy surges and a man steps through. Hold your fire. I'm no damn elf, Frank Castle growls. He stares down at the barrel of Honeyshot's pistol. He doesn't have time for this. Thor's mom sent me. 
He looks around at the small group of survivors, broken and defeated. He knows that they've lost everything at this war with Meliketh. You want payback? Follow me. I'll lead you right to the war. On the remains of Asgard, the defenders of the Bifrost have failed. Amongst the destruction that was the Rainbow Bridge, Daredevil fights alongside Jane Foster and Heimdall to defeat the remaining Dark Elves. When finally the last elf falls. Apologies, Heimdall. I've proven a poor guardian of the Rainbow Bridge. Daredevil states, his shoulders slumping. No worse than I, Lord Daredevil, the god states, knowing that the most important thing is that the strike teams have been dispatched. Yet Jane worries, because now there is no way to bring them home with the Rainbow Bridge destroyed. Over on Svlatelheim, Lady Freya stands over the fallen Bitterhand, the former guardian of Meliketh's Black Bifrost, the energies of the Black Gate Sword swirling around her. I have seen the last blackened breath of life withering in your lungs, bitter hand. She growls her words like living shadows. Her eyes glow with the power of the gate, and she sees every black horror throughout the Ten Realms, every wicked act of this diseased war. I see more Dark Elves dying here today. She turns as She-Hulk continues to fight the advancing elves, ordering her to leave with the rest of the team. Hulk not leave she got alone! She cries, her fist finding another skull. Freya dances amongst the elves, her dark blade biting through their flesh. She knows that the She-Hulk will not abandon her, and so she uses her new powers to send dark tendrils wrapping around the Hulk body, pulling her through the black Bifrost. Do me a favor and tell my son that his mother loved him like lightning loves thunder. The Dark Elves advance, seeing now that there is merely only one fighter. How many Dark Elves do you think that one goddess is worth? She asks, magic in her eyes. Hundreds, thousands, all of you, keep coming until you have an answer. In the Dark Realm, the Elves advance. Freya has sent her strike team to gather allies for war, with She-Hulk arriving in the realms of the dwarves, bringing tears to their eyes with her motivational speech. Blade traveled to Vanaheim, gathering the recluse of Vanir gods, leading them to the portal. Ghost Rider travels to the realm of the dead in his hell charger, leading a pack of giant angry spiders behind him. Just when I thought my life couldn't get more metal! Over on Jotunheim, Captain America and his strike team have found Thor, dragging his wounded body back through the swirling gate to Midgard. The team makes its way back to Avengers Mountain, yet the inside of the dead Celestial is deserted. Outside, T'Challa is fighting alongside Thori, and the pair leap over the Celestial's fingers as they do battle with the Fire Goblins. The Frost Giants scale the base, hoping to bring it down from above, but inside, Shuri stands before a massive computer system, preparing the base's defenses. The Black Panther orders her to open fire, and outside, energy beams erupt from the Celestial, turning the armies of Melody to Ash. Captain America turns to his team, ordering them to get Thor to the infirmary. Before he can figure out the status of the other teams, though, he is interrupted by the bellows of anger from the hall. Where is she? Where in the bloody hell is my wife? Blood dripping from Odin, the God King's body as he glares angrily with his one good eye. Freya is fighting on back at the Black Bifrost, though, with the bodies of fallen elves creating a mountain beneath her as the dark energy is swirling around her. But meanwhile, across the world, the War Avengers are fighting for it. The forces of Midgard are doing their best to defend their lands as fighter jets scorch past the Statue of Liberty with missiles firing at the Frost Giants. Elsewhere, Meliketh looks into the sky, smiling. All of Midgard is at war, all thanks to me. You're welcome. He grins, turning back to his prisoner, the symbiote known as Venom. The creature's form shifts as he tries to elude Meliketh's magic, yet it is held fast. Pain sears through its body as the Dark Elf hits it with even more magic. Meliketh knows that the symbiote is merely a weapon meant to kill gods. He laughs. Bitterhand, send me some more wine wenches while I tame this beast. His smile drops briefly as he looks up and receives no answer. Bitter hand? Odin, meanwhile, can barely stand, yet his voice is strong as he looks at the heroes of Midgard. Tell me this isn't true. Tell me my wife was not left alone in the very home of the Dark Elves. He growls, Frank Castle stepping forward. It was her mission, her orders, he tells him. But Captain America doesn't believe that she has lost. They can still go through the open portal and bring her back through. But Odin knows that they cannot pass through the portal if Freya does not want them to. Cap refuses to accept that. There has to be a way. I said a lot of you couldn't. 
Odin explains, turning back to the heroes with murder in his eyes. But none of you are the All Father. Someone bring me my spear. I've got something better than a spear, Tony Stark states as he walks into the room, Screwbeard the dwarf at his sign. Some of us built you an early Father's Day gift. Screwbeard did all the work. Human mostly talk about self, the dwarf adds. Enough talk, Stark. Whatever the hell this is, it better be good at slaying elves, the Allfather states. Freya, meanwhile, is screaming as she swings her blade, felling the final dark elf for the moment. The bodies of the fallen lay beneath her and the armies of Meliketh prepare for another assault. She can sense it though. The success of the strike teams and the return to Midgard. There's only one thing left to do, she says, turning her attention to the dark gate behind her. Destroy the Black Bifrost and end this. Raising her weapon, the Queen of the Gods prepares to strike when suddenly a dark blade slides through the portal, stabbing her in the chest. Did you really think it would be that easy? Meliketh asks as he steps through. You might hold that sword, but this is still my realm, he says with a sneer. Freya tries to stand to swing her sword into Meliketh, but the blade that pierces her is the weapon of a symbiote. It morphs, it shifts, it's slashing her over and over. Meliketh turns away bored and he orders his men to feed her to the dogs. Dark elves of Svetelheim! A voice booms from the black Bifrost. Get the hell away from my wife! Odin bellows, now clad in the new armor given to him by Tony Stark. Energy blasts come out of the gauntlets, cutting through the gathered elves. With Freya struggling to stand, the symbiote still piercing her, Odin orders her to leave, yet she will not. We are taking away Melika's greatest weapon, his black bifrost, she states firmly, despite her wounds. I was afraid you'd say that. The two gods stand back to back, energy blast punctuating every slash of Freya's blade. I'll see you in hell, Freya, and kiss you like you've never been kissed before. Odin cries to his wife, she then brings down her weapon with all of her power, splitting the stones of the Black Bifrost. Meliketh turns, his weapon reforming in his hands as fear and anger play across his face. Stop them! Stop them! Don't let them destroy the Bifrost! He orders. The stones crack as Freya drives her weapon deep, with Odin's energy blast covering her, doing as much damage as they can. When finally, the world crumbles around them and the two gods embrace. Freya pulls her husband in close as the dark energy begins to leave her. Forget hell. Kiss me now, you fool, she tells him. And with that, the Black Gate explodes. Back on Midgard, Frank Castle stands in the Avengers armory with a detachment of Light Elves. We want all of these that you can carry. The bigger, the better, he tells them, sweeping his arms to indicate all the guns on the wall. Stand aside, please. A voice struggles from behind them. Of course, my lord. The elves answer, stepping aside and bowing, as Thor jumps into the room. Sorry about your family, Frank tells him, and for a brief moment, an almost human emotion reflects in his eyes. Thor reaches out, grasping the arm of the destroyer. In the war room, Jane Foster stands on the table, laying out the battle plan. They are sick of this war, sick of these invaders. Jane offers that they should take the fight to them. With the Avengers in the lead, she starts, but is interrupted by a voice that now vibrates with strength. Nay! There is only one who will lead this fight, and his name is Thor, God of Thunder. He states as he enters the room now fully armed. Across Midgard, the rumble thunders. The hard and angry rain begins to fall, and soon will come the lightning, and the hammers will follow. Meanwhile, back with Daredevil, his eyes glow with his guardian magic. Once he could hear every scream within New York City. Now armed with the sword of the power of Heimdall, he can hear every scream in existence. Most of the seven billion people on Earth are screaming right now as the war rages on. Then we shouldn't be wasting any time. We need to get back to Midgard. Why did you drag me out here, Daredevil? Thor asks, pacing across the deck of the longboat as the sun crackles behind them. Daredevil looks over his shoulder at Thor, telling him that the screams of the people of Earth aren't the ones that they need to listen to. They aren't the ones that will end this war. There's another scream right here. Can't you hear it? He asks. Thor turns to answer, but is shocked as the longboat drifts towards the ancient tree that springs in the sun as if by magic. Yggdrasil, the world tree, a seedling that was growing on Asgardia when it was cast into the sun, it now grows. You seek an answer, God of Thunder. Some answers demand a price. Daredevil intones quietly. Thor joins the man without fear at the railing of the longboat, staring up, waiting for the answers on how to win this war. Finally, he hands off his ax. Take my axe, devil, but be prepared to hurl it with all your might and nail me to that tree. He orders him before slinging his hammer and flying into the sky. He asks only one more thing of his comrade. 
ignore my screams. Meanwhile, over at Wakanda Midgard, the warriors of Wakanda fight as the armies of heaven descend upon them. Damn these fleas! When will they learn to gravel before their queen? The queen of heaven curses as she watches her warriors dying. But Okoya stands before her, and the warriors Sif, Hildegard, and Angela at her back. There's no word for grovel in our language, yet there are 23 for fight, and you will learn them all. Welcome to Wakanda, she states as she drops into the battle stance. She leaps from the Asgardian longship spear first, launching towards the Queen of Heaven. Black Panther flies by in a Pegasus, clipping the wings of the angels as he broadcasts orders over the battlefield. Below them, Frank Castle looks up, a squad of heavily armed light elves with him. Don't aim for the wings. They can still fight without those but they can't do much without a head. Yet the Light Elves have been at war, and they have no need for lessons in how to make war. And they open fire. Above them, the lightning crackles in its sparks, bringing down the energy of the heavens, with storms lashing out across the world, aiding the great battle. And over on the coast of Uruguay, the lightning strikes, blasting away the risen dead. Enchantress stands, bored as her zombies pile atop the Ghost Rider. But his hellfire burns brighter, and he throws them away. Nearby, Doctor Strange and Balder lash out of the zombies while driving in the Hell Charger of Ghost Rider. Spider-Man swings into battle, leading his new army of Hell Spiders, who follow their new leader with glee. In Australia, Yulik the Troll staggers as another blow from the Hulk and her mighty hammer cracks him across the jaw. Now this is my idea of a Lady Thor, he crows. When I'm done conquering this beautiful and barren land, you will be my queen. Thunder Hulk no lady, stinking troll no king. The battle rages and Luke Cage, Iron Fist, Deadpool, and Daredevil fight amongst the trolls. And over in Antarctica, the war rages. Communications are restored as Roxxon is stopped. The Minotaur, Dario Agar, is brought down by Roz Solomon and Jane Foster with the two women piercing his chest with vibranium bullets in the Spear of Odin. Later on Asgard, Jane Foster lands and before her stands Heimdall. Even here, they can both hear the screams. It's Thor, isn't it, she asks. He's searching for answers inside of the sun, a way to beat Meliketh's challenge and defeat him. Heimdall turns, his all-seeing eyes following Jane as she crosses the field, knowing what she plans to do. Please do not do anything rash that would risk the health that you have fought so hard to regain. But Jane knows who fought hard, Brunhilde and the other Valkyries, all of those that have given their lives to this war. She stares down at the shattered remains of the hammer of the war Thor, the Thor from the dead multiverse. Meanwhile, over in Shanghai, Captain Marvel is fighting goblins in the sky while the other heroes fight in the streets. Welcome to the Warriors 3, Sir Wolverine! Hogan cries, turning to Logan as he lets out a scream of berserker rage, driving his claws through another goblin. Can we keep him? Fendrel asks. In Manhattan, Iron Man fights through the skies with his new squad of war machine doors at his back while the Fantastic Four do their part in the streets. In London, it's Captain America and Captain Britain fighting side by side. As the War of the Realms rages across Midgard and Melika's Great War Machine shudders, there's a great storm brewing above the skies of every battlefield and great cracks of lightning lash out from the heavens, aiding the heroes of Midgard. Thor is suddenly there, all lightning, blood, and Uru. He bellows and his words are like thunder. Melika, where is that bastard hiding? It was then that Meliketh gave forth his challenge, the symbiote curling around him as he issues his challenge to Thor, standing amongst the great Stonehenge. Only Thor can pass through the magical barrier that Meliketh has raised at Stonehenge. Odin cries out, trying to warn his son, but his words turn to pain as the dark elf lashes out with his symbiote. Do hurry, Thor. I swear I will write the last chapter of this war with you. It was this challenge that forced Thor to nail himself to the world tree, to seek a way to defeat Meliketh's challenge. The searing heat of the sun licks at his body. There must be a way! Thor mumbles before another scream of pain racks his body. But back on Asgard, Jane Foster reaches down for the shattered remains of the hammer of the war Thor. Because there must always be a Thor. Sometimes, there must be more than one, she says quietly as lightning crackles around her, and she screams as the power fills her. In Asgard, at the far end of time, the three daughters of King Thor continue to read from an ancient book, when suddenly they stop. Wait, it says that Thor's allies travel to the far future. You don't think that means? That's when the room is suddenly split by a glowing beam of light. 
Hey there, young ladies. Don't suppose you could point us to... Ben Grimm asks as he sticks his head through the time portal. Yet his words are interrupted as King Thor stalks into the chamber, clad in his armor, armed for war. I am here, he growls, staring at the faces that he has not seen in a long time. I've been waiting for this day for a millennia. All Father Thor is ready for war. Back in the present day, Thor sits among the ruins of Asgard, his body covered in burns, his lost eye covered. The challenge would seem impossible, yet Yggdrasil has given him the answer. If only Thor can save the day, then we simply need more Thors. He says, turning to all Father Thor from the future. The old man nods gruffly. By my beard, it worked once before. He responds, looking at the younger self with one good eye. The years have not been kind to you, boy. You look like hell. You look like me. Are any of you one-eyed geezers going to compare my ladies all morning, or is there an actual war to be fought here? Young Thor asks, entering the chamber with his axe over his shoulder. The god of Vikings did not come all this way to yammer. The oldest Thor stands, turning to his younger self. Ah, splendid! You brought the arrogant, unworthy one. Ah, Father Thor nods. What? Was the frog not available? The younger Thor smiles at his future. At least I've still got all my body parts, you half-crippled old troll fart. Yet Thor knows that they will need them all. There is power in this trinity of Thors, and they need all of their fists for this fight, whether they hold a hammer or not. I, my fists and hammer agree, Lady Thor states, as she comes strolling into the room, the hammer of War Thor in her hands. Great! Everyone has a hammer but me, young Thor sighs. Thor questions how Jane is even standing there as Thor, and she looks at him, explaining that the hammer of War Thor is trying to tear itself apart even now. We should move quickly, Thor, she tells him. Thor nods, so they shall. The war party of Thors shall move with all the rage and howling wrath of a storm. A storm for the Odin damned ages. The thunder sounds across the realms as the Thors fly across the air, lightning flashing like stars exploding. Rain falling from the fury of Amherst. Every eye lifts to the skies of fear and wonder to behold the coming storm of Thors. The battle wages across Midgard over the streets of New York City with Iron Man and Human Torch cutting through the Frost Giants as Frank Castle's voice directs the heroes over their comms. Frank, you are so in your element. It is adorable. Tony smirks over the radio. Frank doesn't even pause as he continues to fire his weapon at his enemies moving alongside his elven squad. War is war. Giants just take more bullets is all. He says before ordering his fighters to keep sweeping the streets. Captain America and Black Panther stand before the mighty Lofri, king of the frost giants. Stand down, Lofri. Your fight is lost, Cap orders. The queen of the angels is dead. Amara and Ulick are in chains. Your allies are falling, Black Panther adds, but the king of the giants merely smiles. Lofri never had allies, the giant tells them, holding up a casket in his massive hands. The king throws the casket into his mouth with his eyes suddenly beginning to glow. The great giant takes a massive breath, suddenly blowing a mighty blizzard through the streets of New York, throwing the heroes away, all except one. Daredevil, the god without fear, pushes through the blast of icy wind, the sword of Heimdall clutched in his hands. Have at thee, son of Jotunheim, he cries, leaping forward for Hell's Kitchen. The sky's alight with lightning and thunder echoing across Stonehenge as Meliketh looks up, his forces surrounding him. Do you hear that rumble? He's coming, he says to the Dark Elves, covered in the dark tendrils of the Venom Symbiote. Your war is lost, Meliketh. Run for your wretched life while you can. Freya spits from her chains. Yet the Dark Elf merely turns, tendrils of the Symbiote snaking over his face as his mouth turns into a malicious smile. The War of the Realms is such a thing of grisly beauty. Without a doubt, one of my proudest, most murderous moments. He grins, but killing Thor in front of his parents. <laughs> that will be my bloody masterpiece. Beaten and bloodied, Freya turns as much as she can to her husband hanging beside her. Tell me, husband, who do the gods pray to in times like this? She asks. Though beaten, Odin's voice is strong. Pray to Thor if you like, wife. Although something tells me he won't hear you over the thunder. Lightning suddenly cracks across the ground, and the mighty Thors are amongst their enemies. Malekith! I've come for my parents! Thor bellows. And for your head! Jane adds. Her own words the sound of booming thunder. Yet Meliketh laughs. He has more than Dark Elves at his side now. Venom has been engorged by his magics. Black wings spread from his back. 
as his own forces twitch amongst the dark tendrils. You may call me the Butcher of Thors! He cackles before turning to his men. Kill the parrots! The Thunderers belong to me. The Thors do not hesitate, throwing their hammers, calling their foes. Parrots, Jane states. Spider elves. All Father Thor growls. Melikath, Thor nods. Great, I guess I'll get the dogs. The young Thor pouts. Back in New York, though, Daredevil leaps, throwing his sword at Lofri as the blood turns to slush in his veins from the frost giant's attack. The sword bounces across his eyes, finally landing on his throat. Was that supposed to hurt? The king of the giants laughs as he swallows the blade whole. Your sword is nothing more than a snack for the mighty Lofri. The frost giant peers down at Daredevil, who now stands with nothing more than his fists. The giant takes another deep breath and begins to blow the blizzard that would turn Midgard into a barren wasteland of ice. Yet suddenly, all of Earth can hear the storm. It explodes from the very sun itself, and the star becomes an eye. A storm unparalleled, with winds that would raise a world. A storm to end all of time, or save it. By the gods, how could you be this slow? Young Thor laughs as his axe cleaves another the Hellhound's heads from its body. But all Father Thor keeps swinging his hammer, the Uru connected with another dark elf symbiote. How can you be so reckless? Watch your back, boy. If you get your full self killed, we all die. At what age did I become my father? Elsewhere, Lady Jade is fighting her way to the king and queen of the gods, bellowing her rage. Above them, Thor and Meliketh fight. The axe Yonborn swinging and taking a chunk out of the Dark Elf. Thor tries to follow up with a swing with his hammer, but the symbiote lashes out, throwing him to the earth. Remember when I lopped off your arm with your own axe? Meliketh hisses as his symbiote wraps around Thor's hammer, turning it into a dark mace. I wonder what damage I could do with this. <laughs> Thor reaches his hand out, trying to call upon his hammer, but the weapon doesn't respond, and it is the last hammer in all of Asgard. It is now lost to the enemy. Behold! The Black Hammer of the Accursed! The enemy howls as he launches towards Thor, swinging his new weapon. But Lady Jane is there, her own hammer blocking Meliketh's assault. Nay, we Thors are harder to kill than you can imagine, she cries. But Meliketh's tongue, sharpened by the symbiote, attempts to pierce her. She dodges, she shifts, crying out, Ka! Verily, that is disgusting! Meliketh is pushed back as the fist of Thor connects with his hammer. Congratulations, Thor! I see you finally gone mad! <laughs> But Thor merely presses his attack, screaming with rage. Behold, the berserker madness of Thor! He bellows. His fists connect again and again, yet Meliketh knocks him away. I will beat you to death with your own damned hammer! Thor tries to struggle to his feet, but the symbiote wraps around him, holding him down as Meliketh comes in for the final swing. But that's when Thor gets his hand up, and the black tendrils of the hammer pierce his flesh. The energy crackles around Thor, his eyes sparking with lightning. All I need to finish you, Meliketh, is a good, hard rain. Suddenly, the earth is enveloped by a rain of fire. And across the world, the heroes of the realm look up, seeing the storm swirling above their heads. Melika stares upwards, his smile briefly faltering as the flames begin to lick the symbiote. Is that all you've got? In Svetelheim, it rains fire every Thorn's day! He hisses, but Thor smiles. I know your symbiote's weakness. I haven't been wielding the God Tempest this entire time so that I can make it rain. He says, standing to his feet as the venom tendrils shrink away. From the storm comes something and it hits the earth with an explosion that shakes the very ground around them. The smoke clears, revealing a hammer. The Uru is held by a branch of the world tree, forming a handle that twists with power. On the metal is burned an inscription known throughout the realms. Whosoever wields this hammer, if they be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. I used it for forging. Hello, old friend. Thor smiles. His friends and family watch stunned as the bodies of their enemies lay around them. By the gods, he did it! Odin gasps. The fires burn around them as Thor walks forward with Meliketh keeping pace. 
You, you can't pick it up, you're not! But Thor reaches down, the energy cracking off the hammer and into his outstretched hand. What I truly am, Meliketh, now and forevermore. The hammer seems light, as if it never weighed anything at the time. The power of the storm and the fire swirl around him, and in the distance, the thunder rumbles once again. It's the god of the unworthy. Thor swings the hammer in one massive blow, the metal connecting with Meliketh's face, throwing him to the ground, ending the war. Defeated, the symbiote swirls away from the fallen elf, leaving him nothing more than broken on the ground. The hammer does not make the Thor. The Thor makes the hammer. Jane simply states, walking up behind Thor, her own hammer cracking further, not long for this world. They both stare at it. It should be good for one last hurl. In New York, the blizzard continues to blow as Lofri, the king of the giants, prepares to usher in the new age of giants. And suddenly, he's cracked on the side of the head by a massive hammer, blood gushing as his eyes fall loose. Who threw that? He bellows. Yet his words are cut short as a slice appears in his stomach. Purple blood begins to flow, and the wound erupts as the swirls of an endless winter blows from his open gut. His scream of pain echoes through the city as he falls, and from his stomach stands a blood-soaked Loki. The casket of an endless winter in one hand and the sword of the daredevil in the other. What's wrong, father? Was it something you ate? At Stonehenge, Meliketh tries to struggle to his feet, raising his black hammer once again, his screams lashing out as young Thor takes off his arm with Yornborn. The group of Thors surround him, but still he doesn't completely fall. You're finished, Meliketh. Your war has ended. Thor tells him, No! Belica screams, his voice becoming high-pitched. My armies may be lost, but I am still the lord of the wild hunt! He screams, ordering his dogs to kill the Thors. Thor tries to stop him, telling him that the beast can smell his fear. I have no fear! Meliketh bellows as the animals grow closer. He turns, with the monsters lashing out, their teeth sinking into his body. He screams, but this only drives them into a frenzy. They raise into the sky, tearing his limbs off. The war has ended. The heroes of Midgard cheer in the streets of New York. The hammer does return to Jane, but it begins to dissolve even as it grows closer. She knows it was worth it, worth it to feel the storm one last time. The hammer explodes, showering her with golden light and energy. And when it dissipates, she stands there with a golden arm brace. What the hell just happened? She questions. So, throughout the Ten Realms, the cheers of victory and an end to the war can be heard. Thor looks up into the coming dawn, with Mjolnir clasped once again in his hands. Odin stands before his son, stunning him as he falls to his knees. All hail the rightful Lord of Asgard, the Savior of Realms. All hail, All Father Thor. And there you have it. The video is over. I hope you guys enjoyed. That was one heck of a long one. But I also want to let you guys know my honest opinions on the movie. I thought it was okay, but I like this version of Thor much better than the movie version. Let me know in the comments down below what you preferred, the comic book version or the movie version. And what did you think about having all of these Thor stories back to back to back? Make sure you check the channel as we do have the current Thor storyline going on right now. And that's coming to a great conclusion real soon. So I hope you guys enjoy it. I'll see you next time.